Whole Story Quest Audiobooks presents Six by Robert White Narrated by Nicholas Cam Chapter One Henry Stott was first committed to a secure hospital aged seventeen. At his last sectioning hearing, just after his twenty-seventh birthday, he had been described by one psychiatrist as untreatable. This, however, was not the opinion of all professionals. Even though his predisposition for psychotic outbursts, sexual deviances and violence did pose a threat to the public, some considered him manageable. Others within the medical profession believed that if the correct doses of medication could be issued, and Henry could be relied upon to take them, Stott could be considered a case for discharge. Releasing Stott was akin to opening the gates of Hades and liberating the devil himself. Henry had grown up to be an unremarkable man. That in itself was not surprising, as he had been an unexceptional child. His school reports had delivered little to provide his widowed mother with anything to brag about when chatting with the neighbours. His IQ may have been off the scale, but Henry couldn't tie his shoelaces. He was, though, a good child. Henry never got into trouble and was always polite, well turned out and kind. He'd been stout. His mother had described him as big-boned. His peers called him porky. Henry's weirdness and bulk had ensured he had few friends at school, and that had held firm into his adult life. He had put his lack of solid acquaintances with boys down to the fact he was poor at sport. That was an understatement. Henry was truly awful, and walked with an unusual rolling gait. His deficiency in female associates, though, was due to his total lack of social skills. That, and his tendency to stare at pubescent girls and touch himself intimately. However, Henry was always clever enough to do this when the teachers were otherwise engaged. Yes, Henry was always described as a good child. He had moved to the two-up-two-down terrace off St. George's Road, Preston, one year and one month ago to the day. Henry liked his house, liked Preston, and loved his job with Pitt's funeral home. He knew that the troublesome kids that lived in his road had given him the name Dirty Henry, but this was uncalled for, as Henry was anything but. His house was as spick and span as anyone could wish for. Today was Friday, and every Friday Henry ensured that all the household chores were completed. His bed linen was changed, the dusting was done, and he hoovered all the carpets. When he'd finished ironing the last of his shirts, placed them all on hangers and buttoned them to the collar the way his mother had shown him, Henry ensured that no one would ever call him Porky again, and worked his muscles to exhaustion in the crude gym he had forged in the back room of his meagre dwelling. This special Friday, he showered, stood in front of his full-length mirror and admired his nakedness. As he assumed several poses he'd copied from Muscle Builder magazine, his erection grew. God, he felt as good as he looked. Once dressed in a plain white T-shirt and jeans, Henry walked into the rear bedroom. The room had been his mother's, and Henry had kept it exactly as she had left it on the day she died. The flowered curtains and bedspread were old-fashioned, but he didn't mind that. In fact, it pleased him. He then opened the wardrobe where his mother had kept many of her dresses, selected one and lay it out on the bed. Fridays were very important to Henry. Friday was payday, and Friday was the day when he always brought home company. This Friday, however was to be the most important of all the Fridays in Henry's thirty-year-old life. It was the day Henry posted the first package. Chapter Two Will Garrett was both misunderstood and underappreciated. Or at least that's how it felt to him. He was a detective constable. 
Well, a retired detective after tonight's little soiree at Lancashire Constabulary's headquarters club. The 1970s single-storey building nestled inside the grounds of the force's training school and hosted social functions for serving officers of all ranks. Garrett had no respect for rank. Never had, never would. Thirty-two years of service. That's how they'd put it to him. Service to Queen and Country. After nine years in the Queen's Lancashire Regiment and twenty-three as a copper, seemed all that remained was to celebrate those years of canine-like loyalty surrounded by suits he vaguely recognised. Garrett eyed them suspiciously. The suits, in turn, stood in preordained packs and order of seniority, laying off the booze in case further promotion depended on sobriety. Garrett watched with growing disdain as the officers sidled up to anyone who was the rank above them and stuck their tongues firmly in their backside. In general, the suits were not there to give him his send-off, merely to use the occasion as a sounding board or networking opportunity. Considering Garrett's dislike of seniority, their actual presence at his retirement party surprised him somewhat. After those thirty-two years of dealing with the dregs of humanity, the vile and the violent, nothing shocked the middle-aged detective too much. For these suits, the chance of Brown nosing themselves up the next rung was too good to miss. He just had to accept it and move on. However, there were a few, a select few, who would be genuinely sad to see him go. Sad to lose what Will had secretly cultivated all those years. And, if the price was right, could still deliver for them in their hour of need. Thirty-two years. He tripped over to the table where his retirement presents were neatly displayed. A gold watch took centre stage. Will picked it up and examined it. He had two far better examples sitting in his drawer at home. Fucking cheapskates. Born in Burnley and determined not to follow his father into the same factory job that killed him, he joined the army as an infantryman. On leaving the military, he'd married Doreen, a bright girl from a good family. Despite her fine intellect, she was a mousy woman with no imagination, especially in the bedroom. Will found her to be a mind-numbingly boring wine who constantly ignored his sexual advances. As the marriage dragged on, Doreen became withdrawn and swilled down her valium each night with a crisp chardonnay. Despite his lack of feelings towards his wife, Garrett had never considered divorcing the woman. Will could never bring himself to lose half of everything he had now, even if Doreen had contributed more than her fair share. He looked at his empty glass and decided he needed another. Garrett wasn't much of a drinker. However, from being a young detective, he'd harboured another far more salacious vice. Unknown to the majority of his peers, he was addicted to whores, the common prostitute. Garrett had always been unable to control his urges. He'd found the act of paying for sex, or better still, using his position as a cop and getting a whore for free, as a perfectly formed sexual fantasy. From knee-trembling couplings down stinking back alleys to the rush of taking his freebie on the back seat of his CID car, Garrett had done it all. Thousands of times. He'd visited the GUM clinic on more occasions than he could remember. He'd even paid for the odd abortion. Will knew some halls better than he knew his wife. And they knew Garrett only too well. They feared and loathed him. One or two had even loved him. As the years progressed, Will began to find extra business for some of the younger, prettier street girls. After all, youth was where the money was. He quickly discovered that the better off would pay handsomely for a skinny teen in their bed, especially those yet to reach the age of consent. Garrett's ability to find these fresh-faced creatures had always begun with controlling their whore mothers, something he'd perfected over the years. 
It never ceased to amaze him just how many daughters followed their mothers into the trade. Sometimes he found it necessary to cajole or groom the girls. A few nice presents, perfume, clothes, that kind of thing. But more often than not, the child would simply follow her mother into prostitution because it was all she knew. Will then matched these often underage girls up with cops, magistrates, lawyers and the like. This black market enterprise often netted Garrett more per month than his actual wage packet. As his career trundled along to its inevitable dreary conclusion, he considered that the seemingly bottomless pit of sexual perversion that had been at his disposal all those years should have been used to his advantage far more regularly. The suits, the ones that shared his passion for whoring, the ones that liked their meat young and tender, should have paid a far higher price for his services. It may have ensured his stripes, maybe even a pip or two. He'd only join the police because his pompous father-in-law thought he should get a proper career. He didn't want his daughter supporting a squaddy, as if nine years in the army hadn't counted for anything. Garrett had hated the officers in the army, just as he despised the senior ranks drinking to his so-called health now. Even on his retirement, with ninety grand in his back bin and a pension to add to his wife's handsome income, he abhorred those men and women just as much as he'd done the donkeys that had led his regiment. They thought they were special, but in reality... When it came down to it, they were not better than him. He knew their weaknesses, some intimately. Garrett considered that he delivered as a cop. He'd walked the beat, and it was the CID. He'd done most of it, except traffic. A bastard liked a traffic cop, not even the suits. His last two years had been spent in the serious and organised crime unit on the filed coast, a grand-sounding but paper-pushing job. Yet even in that plastic environment, designed to keep him away from operational matters, he still trawled the streets of Lancashire in search of his fix of cheap, paid sex. Just as importantly, and particularly since the days of illegal immigration and those seeking asylum on British soil, He'd still managed to discover peachy, fresh young things for his more discerning clientele. A heavy-set guy with a paunch and a drinker's nose walked over and put his arm around Garrett's shoulder. Alan Blunt had been his boss when he'd worked vice over in Blackpool and was one of the blokes who had definitely chipped in for the stupid gold watch. Garrett had provided girls to satisfy Blunt's sexual deviances for twenty years. The detective chief inspector was a regular contributor, a big spender. Blunt liked them young, preferably in their school uniform. The senior detective looked at Garrett's empty glass. You're ready for a beer, well? He nodded. Mine seems to have evaporated. Blunt smiled to reveal Smoker's teeth. Wine for the ditch, then. The two pushed through the crowd towards the bar, ignoring the withering glances of some. The DCI handed Will his new pint. You're not driving, are you? Will shook his head. Me? No. He checked his watch. Taxi for me, pal. And I got some company booked. He winked knowingly. The wife's up Newcastle at her mother's again. The old bat's on her last legs, I reckon. So I've got two little Thai birds coming. You know me, Alan. Always one for the bargain. But I won't get one free, eh? Garrett laughed lewdly at his own joke. Blunt sniggered and lowered his voice. You'll never change well. Can't keep it in your trousers, can you, eh? He looked about him, checking no one could hear wig. Thai, you say? How old? Will shrugged, even though he knew the sisters were both fifteen and just Blunt's cup of tea. I don't ask those questions, Alan. You know that. Blunt pushed for more information. He was sweating around his top lip, a sign of his growing interest in the subject matter. Come on, Will. 
What age? Still at school. Garrett knew the game. He played it for too many years. Reeled them in slow and easy. Now, look, as far as I know, they're of legal age. He leaned in the DCI's ear. But they are skinny little things, smooth as a baby's ass. Not a hair anywhere. Know what I mean? I can sort it for you if you like. Have them both at once. Proper threesome. The DCI wiped his lip with his fingers. A threesome, you see? Ah, uh, yeah, do that well, as soon as he... Drink me tomorrow. Will forced a smile. The Thai girls were actually Chinese illegal immigrants that hauled alongside their mother out of a Blackpool flop house. After visiting the rotting terrace on the pretext of an official complaint from local residents, Garrett had discovered the family's lack of visas. His threat to inform the immigration service of the whereabouts of the three prostitutes was enough to ensure they did his bidding. Within a week, Garrett had moved the mother and the girls to his own brothel, run by another of his paid sex workers, the Toya Aslam. The rooms were cleaner, even if the clientele were not. Will himself had sampled the delights of the teen sisters on several occasions since, but he knew the availability of such new, fresh, young talent needed to be utilised to its full potential. With the detectives' contacts, the two sisters had been working flat out, and with Al Blunt sweating like a pig at the mere thought of the two teens, Garrett was due another nice payday. He lay a hand on the DCI's shoulder and went for the big cell. Alan, I have to tell you, these little ones don't come cheap. Be on the pricey side. Seven hundred. Blunt blew out his cheeks and was about to complain, until Will opened a picture on his phone and handed it to the cop. Blunt's jaw dropped. Seven, you say? My word, Will, they're so... so... so young, yeah. I know. They're twins, too, eh? Every man's fantasy. Even put on a little lesbo show for you before. Well, before you join in. Garrett snatched the phone away and pocketed it. He knew he'd made the sale. Hundred each for the teens, fifty for the mother. Four and a half in his pocket. Tell you what, Al. Why don't you ring me, say, three o'clock tomorrow? I'll have it all sorted for you by then. Nice Sunday night's entertainment for you, eh? Garrett flopped into the back of his taxi. The driver viewed him with the usual suspicion. At fifty-seven, he still looked a handful, and despite the belly he had acquired from sitting on his ass for two years, he was a formidable adversary. His now salt and pepper hair was cut short, and the scar that ran from the corner of his left eye across his cheek to his chin gave him the appearance of a man of violence. The scar didn't lie. As the car twisted and turned along the narrow lanes that led to his substantial home, his head swam with the effects of the alcohol. He hated to feel so out of control and vowed to stick to his usual two beers in the future. Raindrops chased each other down the windows as the rare street lamps reflected off each droplet, and Garrett felt his eyes start to close, the first downward pull of sleep drawing him towards unconsciousness. "'Here, mate!' The taxi driver's voice shocked him awake, and he fumbled in his pockets for the fare. "'How much?' he slurred. Five pound fifty. Garrett pulled a ten-pound note from his pocket and threw it over the seat towards the driver. After tonight's events, he was feeling flush. "'Keep it,' he said. As the now officially retired detective stood on the pavement, the cabby drove off at speed, leaving him wobbling in almost total darkness. Garrett lit a Lambert and Butler and found his keys with his left hand. He pushed open the gate with his foot, the cool air and rain sobering him. Maybe it was the years of being a cop, or just a primal instinct. But Garrett sensed he was not alone. He peered into the darkness of his driveway. The skin on his back twitched as adrenaline did its job, and he balled his fists. 
ready for the conflict to come. "'Who's there?' he shouted to the shadows. There was a movement, a click of heels. Will wiped the rain from his face, and he peered into the gloom and drizzle. It couldn't be the sisters. They weren't due for another hour, at least. A woman appeared in the half-light, drenched from the summer deluge. Will wiped his eyes a second time. Ruby, like you. The woman stepped forward, dark hair, black mini, red shoes. She shook uncontrollably and clutched a brown envelope to her breast. Somehow, from somewhere, she managed to thrust the package forward. Her voice was barely audible. Her body shook so violently. You promised, she said. You promised? Chapter 3 Stryker was enjoying his Sunday morning. He'd risen at six to find the overnight rain had cleared and the July sunshine had returned. He pulled on his trusty U.S. Navy issue boots, black combats and black T-shirt, then jogged to his favourite gym in the centre of Leyland. Once there, he'd worked out with his long-time training partner Jim Woods. At 42, Jim was ten years his senior, yet the ex-SBS man put him to shame during every session. Stryker's muscles twitched with fatigue as he drank his protein shake in the foyer, waiting for his lift home. Woods dropped Stryker back at his modern three-storey house on Buckshaw Village, just before 9am. The brand new development had started with just a smattering of houses, but had grown into a modern village, complete with school, shops and its very own railway station. Stryker didn't care for the place, but it would do. It held no memories, and that suited him just fine. He strode along his pristine hall. Louis Armstrong, Oscar Levant, and Chet Baker adorned the walls. The stark black and white Richard Avedon images dominated the space, announcing Stryker's love of jazz. Dropping his gem bag in the kitchen, he set about making coffee. His Bosch espresso machine had set him back thirteen hundred pounds, but he figured it was worth it. As Stryker had never touched a drop of alcohol in his life, he considered he could treat himself to the best home coffee maker money could buy. Carrying his Italian brew to the first floor lounge, he lifted the stylus arm of his Lynn turntable onto Weather Report's black market and flopped into his favourite chair. The sash windows were open, and Stryker could hear the kids from next door playing in their back garden. Their laughter floated in on the warm summer breeze and mixed with the delicious bass lines of Jocko Pistorius. He let his head fall back and his eyes close. Moments later, Stryker's peace was disturbed by the sound of a car drawing up in the street outside. He felt the tell-tale hairs on his neck stand to attention and considered his day was about to change for the worse. Tripping downstairs, he peered through his kitchen window. A black Audi burbled outside. In the driver's seat sat a uniformed policeman. The car shone like a new pin, recently polished. Someone had taken great care to deliver it in such condition. Stryker considered that the polisher would not have been his visitor. Leaning against the boot of the car, his face raised to the warm sunshine, was Detective Chief Superintendent Errol Graham. Stryker walked to his front door, opened it, and stood on the step, examining the man. After successfully leading the investigation into the murders of Abdullah Hussein and Aisha Chowdhury, the same investigation that had led to the death of Constable Tag Westland and, ultimately, Stryker's resignation from the force, Graham had been promoted. The chief straightened his considerable frame with a groan. His wife had increased his food intake, along with his rank, and he rubbed his now considerable paunch as he walked towards the driveway. Stryker stepped forward and offered a huge hand. Graham took it. "'Nice day,' he said, his accent a heady mixture of Cockney and Caribbean. The DCS was a second-generation national, his parents sailing to the UK from Jamaica in search of a new life in the 1950s. Graham had fought his way through the ranks of the Met, slashing through red tape and racism in equal amounts. 
It even headed Operation Trident, a unit tasked with investigating gun crime and homicides in the Afro-Caribbean communities of the capital. Stryker liked and admired the man. He looked to the blue, cloudless sky and nodded. It is so, boss. Stryker hadn't set eyes on the senior detective since Tag's funeral, and the sight of him sent a pang of sorrow to his gut. Nice place you have here, said Graham. Quarter of a million. Stryker screwed up his face. I believe you know how I pay for it. The chief shrugged. Ah, yeah, I recall now. Your mother left you the money. A Belfast girl, wasn't she? Stryker let out his trademark sigh. The one he reserved for when his time was being wasted. As much as he liked Graham, time was a most precious commodity. Stryker's own background of Chicago sidewalks and Belfast pavements was ever present in his voice. His mid-Atlantic accent had often been the cause of mirth during his teens. I can't imagine you've driven out here to pass the time of day, talk about the weather, or discuss my dim and distant. So, shall we stop the bullshit? What do you want, sir? Graham had become used to strike his brash ways during the Hussein and Chowdhury inquiry. He let the big man's sharpness of tone go, reached into his jacket and removed an envelope. I want you to look at something. I resigned months ago, remember? The chief lowered his voice. This was not the time for confrontation. I remember. I remember all too well, Stryker. Tag was a good boy. It was a terrible day for the force. For all of us. He held up the envelope. But I need you to look at this. Can we go inside? Please, Ewan, this is like nothing I've ever seen before. Stryker held his gaze, then nodded slowly. You like espresso? Graham smiled. I do. The two men sat at a table made for six and sipped excellent coffee in silence. Finally, Graham pushed the envelope over to Stryker. I hope you didn't eat breakfast, he said flatly. The package seemed innocuous enough. Just a plain brown envelope. Stryker tapped the documents with a thick finger and inspected Graham's face. He noticed his black skin shining with perspiration and thought he detected a look of genuine concern in his eyes. Why me, Chief? Graham blinked once, twice. Because, he offered with a hint of reluctance, I know you're the best. We need you back, Ewan. Stryker let his head fall, his chin resting on his chest, eyes closed. A moment later, he blew out his cheeks and raised his eyes to the DCS. I allowed a young recruit with less than six months' service to walk to his death arrow. That ain't the best now, is it? Open it, said Graham. As Stryker lifted the flap of the envelope, he felt the skin tighten around his neck and shoulders. Masses of electrical impulses exploded in his brain. The uncanny bursts of cerebral perception that flooded into his head had been part of his life since childhood. Physically, these had always been minor occurrences. A feeling, pictures forming behind his eyes. His mother had called the manifestations a gift. Others called it pure intuition. But whatever they were, recently they had become more prevalent and the imagery far stronger. Rather than a gut feeling, the happenings now engulfed his brain almost to the point of overload. Stryker preferred not to consider that this had happened since the death of Tag Westland. Stryker pulled the first photograph. Jesus, Mary and Joseph. There were eight black and white shots in all. They had been taken in what appeared to be a faux BDSM dungeon, the kind Stryker had seen when he'd worked vice, busting seedy brothels as a young detective. They showed a girl of fifteen, maybe sixteen, blonde, dark roots. She was shackled to a sex swing that hung from the roof in the centre of the room. A single male had the starring role. He was muscular, white, late twenties or early thirties. He wore a rubber mask, 
black weightlifting gloves and a condom. He was not in charge of the camera. Stryker swallowed hard. This was a vicious torture, rape and murder, captured in intimate detail, frame by frame. He'd never seen such degradation, such total disregard for another human being. The last picture showed the child, dead, asphyxiated, eyes bulging, blood dripping down the inside of her pale thighs. Stryker said a prayer to his god. His hand shook. Where did you get this? The local CID got it late last night. There's video footage to go with it. It's even worse. Graham swallowed hard. The sounds, you and the cries. My God, I've never heard such pitiful sounds. Stryker curled his lip. What do you know? The chief rested his hands on the table and studied them. It was an obvious coping mechanism. The victim is... was, he corrected, Melissa Ward, fifteen years. She has been in the care of the local authority recently due to her truanting, reported as a misper by social services two weeks ago. Trouble was she'd been missing so often over the last eighteen months she didn't get any priority status. This shit was posted Friday. Local courier. Whoever sent the material used a Hermes drop box and paid for a Saturday delivery. Stryker was regaining his composure. Do we know which Hermes box? Graham shook his head. Not yet. Postage paid online? Again, Graham shrugged. Still, offered Stryker, that's good work to get the ID so soon. I take it you have the body then? Graham swallowed again, as if something had become lodged, stuck. He touched his throat as he spoke. No, no body as yet. We know the girl's identity, because the bastards who did this sent those pictures and the video to... to her mother. Stryker's eyes widened. He took a breath, still didn't walk to the window. He looked out into normality. He could hear his neighbour cutting the lawn. The kids were still out playing, laughing. He spoke almost to himself. The mom? Why would anyone do that? How? Where is she? Sedated. She's staying at a facility provided by victim support. And she brought this envelope to where? Just before midnight yesterday, she walked into Preston Inquiry Desk and handed it to the assistant. Prince? The original doctor at the lab, of course. We're waiting. Graham nodded towards the brown envelope. There's something else. Look inside. I looked. Look again, Ewan. Stryker sat, picked up the envelope and shook it. A small piece of paper fell to the table. He looked at the chief and raised both brows. The detective's voice wavered as he spoke. We copied it exactly as it was received, Stryker. Read it. Stryker dragged the slip towards him with a single finger. On the paper were two lines of handwritten script. Blue biro, shaky but neat. When I was one, I had just begun... Stryker felt the same tell-tale tingles. What the fuck does this mean? That's why I need you to find out, said Graham. Starting tomorrow. Chapter 4 Stryker followed Errol Graham out of the lift and along the carpeted passageway that led towards the Criminal Investigation Department offices. To Stryker's surprise, rather than step right, Graham turned left at the end of the corridor and stopped at an unmarked door. This is yours, he said, and grabbed the handle. Stryker strode into a small room, plain white walls, two windows that didn't open, four desks, three occupied. Graham followed him in and immediately addressed the group. 
The ladies and gents, this is acting Detective Inspector Stryker. He will be heading up this inquiry. The chief pointed towards each desk in turn. The first was occupied by an overweight woman with grey roots and a smoker's mouth. Detective Maureen Simons, the eye striker. Stryker nodded in her direction. Simons reciprocated by doing the same, but stayed silent. Next came a heavy set guy, pushing fifty. His shaved head hiding patterned baldness. Cauliflower ears. Detective Bob Higgins. Boss, he growled. Finally, Graham pointed to a twenty-something spiky blonde who was furiously typing into an iPad and ignoring the introductions. She wore tortoise-shelled glasses that partially hid sparkling blue eyes. And this, he said, is Detective Felicity Abbott. Stryker didn't wait for the woman to speak. He turned on his heels. You're office chief. Now. Chapter 5 What the hell is going on here, Graham? And who the fuck are those three misfits upstairs? You know I work alone. That's what we agreed. Stryker was pacing Detective Chief Superintendent Errol Graham's office like a wounded rhino. Keep your voice down, Stryker, hissed the chief. They're all good detectives, all three, specialists in their fields. Stryker guffawed, his Northern Irish twang overcoming his Chicago drawl as his temper rose another notch. Ah, specialist, my arse. Specialist in what? From what I can see, I've got a gone-to-see rugby player, a walking lung cancer patient, and a fucking typist. I don't need any of them. I told you, I don't want the responsibility. The chief waited a beat until Stryker calmed. Look, Ewan, you can't run this inquiry alone. It just isn't possible. The chief... Fuck the chief, bellowed Stryker. You have me here under false pretenses. We agreed. I know what we agreed, Ewan, but it isn't possible. Despite the secrecy, this is a major inquiry, for God's sake. Stryker leaned in. And so far, sir, you have failed to mention why we are keeping the investigation a secret from our own people. I'd tell you if I could, Ewan, you know that. But at the moment, it's impossible. It came from the very top. Graham sat back and ran his fingers through what was left of his hair. He took a very deep breath. You have a great set of officers up there, handpicked for very good reasons. A fantastic little team. Bob Higgins has been a cop for 28 years, 24 as a detective. He's worked on 11 major murder inquiries. He's a steady guy, brave as they come, and will walk through walls for you. Maureen Simons has 14 years' experience in vice and seven working in the rape crisis unit. She's invaluable on this kind of inquiry. She may not be easy to get along with, but she knows her stuff. And what about the typist? Graham managed to smile at that. Felicity is not only a fabulous researcher and collator, but she's the force's best psychological profiler. She may not have a ton of operational or street experience, but she's at the top of her game. If the answers you seek are inside a computer or someone's head, she'll find them. Now, come on, Ewan. I'm depending on you here. Please, go back up there. Let's get this show started. Stryker stepped back into the small office, muttering to himself. The three members of his team were still in place, but another man was present, a man who was sitting in the only available seat. Stryker's seat. Felicity Abbott was sticking pictures of the murder scene up onto a large whiteboard that had been hurriedly fastened to the back wall. The man sitting in Stryker's chair was taking a keen interest in each image. The detective sergeant felt his hackles rise. "'And who might you be?' he asked. The man turned. He was heavy set, sporting a drinker's paunch, his striped shirt tight across his belly, sleeves rolled, tie pulled from the collar. The man looked up for a beat, but stayed put. DCI Blunt, he said, his attention seemingly drawn back to the naked body of Melissa Ward. Next office. 
Finally, Blunt managed to draw his gaze away from the horrific display and turned to Stryker. And you, son, who the fuck are you? Stryker clenched his fists and thought better of punching a senior officer on his first day back in the job. I'm Detective Sergeant Stryker, Chief Inspector, and you are in my seat. For a moment the two men eyed each other like a pair of prize fighters at a weigh-in. It wouldn't have been much of a match. Stryker was five inches taller, five stone heavier, and twenty years fitter. Finally, Blunt stood, pulling a pained face. Once straightened, he managed a thin smile. Sore back, he said. A bit too much exercise last night. He winked as if sharing a secret before offering a weak hand. I was just calling in to say hello, Stryker, and have a quick look at what you're dealing with. Stryker took Blunt's sweating palm in his, and all his bells and whistles went off at once. A storm of static raging in his head. He did his best to concentrate as his mind threw a myriad of information his way. None of it good. Yeah, I saw that, he managed, nodding towards the terrible display on the wall. Yeah, I saw that, he managed, nodding towards the terrible display on the wall. And have you seen enough there? Blunt pulled away his hand from Stryker's grip before he crushed the bones. For now. Stryker smiled. It didn't suit him. He looked ever so slightly insane each time he attempted the feat. Then I suppose you'll be leaving us to it, sir. Blunt nodded and walked. I'll call again, Sergeant. Every eye in the room followed him out. Stryker pulled off his leather jacket and dropped it over his now vacant chair. He wore a black polo that strained to enclose his muscular frame. His infamous Maori tattoos covered both his massive arms. The designs were based on the Manaya, the carrier of supernatural powers, who protect the spirit and guide it onward when the time comes. Felicity Abbott was back at her desk. She eyed him appreciatively. Nice tats, sir, she said, raising both plucked brows. Stryker turned his attention back to the large whiteboard on the wall that contained the photographs DCI Blunt had found so fascinating. The eight black and white images depicting the murder of Melissa Ward. I'm not a sir, I'm a sergeant, he snapped. So to avoid any confusion from now on, everyone calls me Stryker. He pointed to the horrific display. Felicity! Take those down for now, please. The young detective appeared puzzled, considered questioning her new boss, decided against it, and did as she was told. Stryker looked to Bob Higgins. You any good with a screwdriver, detective? Bob nodded. Not bad, boss, yeah. Stryker pushed a hand in his jeans and pulled out two twenties. Good, then nip to be in queue, buy one of those coded door locks and get it fitted to this office. The big man took the cash and pushed it in his shirt pocket. He looked over to Maureen Simons, who was rolling her eyes and shaking her head in disbelief. Stryker ignored her. When you've got that, Bob, I want you to find the cop that took Melissa's MISPA report from social services. Have a word. How worried were they? When did they think she might have gone? Boyfriends, girlfriends, that kind of thing. Bob nodded. And most of that info will be on the misbe form, boss. Stryker struck like a trodden snake. I know what's on a fucking misbe form, detective. It's what the lazy arse uniform didn't write down, I want to know. Bob nodded sheepishly. Stryker turned to Felicity Abbott. Okay, Felicity. Uh, Fliss, interrupted the young detective. People call me Fliss. It's easier. Stryker shrugged. Okay, Fliss, as soon as Bob has that lock fitted, you can replace those pictures and start a storyboard, but not before. Also, get me a list of all known sex offenders currently living in the area and begin to sketch a profile of our perp. Does anyone on the list jump out at you? That kind of thing. Oh, and try and find out what the hell that note meant. Stryker blew out his cheeks. Now I'm just going to nip and have some brunch as I get a wee bit tetchy when I'm not fed. 
He caught Maureen Simon's gaze. I'll see you downstairs in ten, detective. Bob Higgins stood and pulled on his suit jacket. Tell you what, guys, this job is weird. We've all been pulled off our regular case, Lord, without a buy your leave. And now we have an acting D.I. as a lead. I mean, you'd expect a super at least, eh? And I suppose you've all been given this job is top secret talk. Both women nodded. Simon's rooted in her bag for cigarettes. Ours is not to reason why, Bob. You just get on with fitting your door lock to keep out the big bad DCI. She found a pack of regal, rattled it to ensure it contained what she needed, and stood, smiling mockingly. After all, we're only being asked to solve a bloody child murder with just three detectives. But never fear, now we've got Arnie Schwarzenegger on board, what can go wrong? I think he's quite cute for a ginger, said Abbott, as she pushed the last of the crime scene shots back into their envelope. Oh, he's a big fucker, said Bob. He's a loose cannon, pointed Maureen. She lowered her voice. He's the one who got that young lad Westland killed. That's not exactly true now, is it, Maureen? said Abbott, flopping back behind her desk. Tag Westland was searching that new moss development up forward when a bomb went off. That was just bad luck. Anyway, it can't be the same guy. I heard he resigned from the job. Oh, it's him all right, said Maureen. One hundred percent. And bad luck follows a cop around. You mark my words. He talks funny, said Abbott, rebooting her iPad. Sounds like a yank to me, offered Bob Higgins. Abbott wrinkled her nose. I thought he sounded Irish. Maureen had made the door. Well, whatever he is, I reckon he's trouble. She motioned to Bob. Come on, big man, walk me downstairs. I'm having a fag while the going's good. Bob Higgins left Maureen at the entrance to the staff car park and set off in search of his Mondeo and Stryker's door lock. She watched the big lumbering detective slope off into the myriad of parked vehicles, turned and began her walk to the rear of the building. Minutes later, Simon stood in the late morning sunshine in front of what was laughingly called the police station smoking shelter. The structure was, in fact, an ageing bike rack that Josh Booth, the station's handyman, had converted using his talents for grinding and welding metal structures. It kept the rain off so long as the wind blew the right way, but that was about it. Lancashire Constabulary had no intention of encouraging their employees to indulge in their bad habit. After all, the evidence proved smokers were off sick more often, and smokers took on official breaks, making them less productive. Therefore, there were no seats in the shelter and the bare minimum of cover. Simons was forty-seven and single. She'd never even been close to wedlock, and lived in her own cottage to the north of the city with her two cats, Felix and Tom. Maureen was a big cat lover, but could never understand why folks had begun to give their feline companions silly names, like Dave and Kevin. Cats had cats' names, just like dogs did. That summed Maureen Simons up. She knew what she knew. Some things like naming your new kitten were easy. Other things, however, were not. For example, she knew she was overweight, that her hair needed cutting and dyeing, and that she should stop smoking. These things she knew for a fact, yet all these issues fell into Maureen's not category. Not easy at all. Simons worked an average of sixty hours a week, even though the unit she'd been attached to only allowed her to claim ten hours overtime a month. Another reason Maureen was still single, why she didn't feel guilty about taking the odd fag break, and why her roots remained grey. She'd always wanted to be a detective, ever since being a small child, sitting on the arm of her grandfather's chair, watching old black-and-white movies. Of course, she quickly found the reality of detective work to be far removed from those flickering images, and as Maureen's specialism revolved around the rape and sexual abuse of children and young people, she rapidly discovered it to be far more gruesome and disturbing. 
She blew out the last of the smoke from her lungs and flicked her stub into the fire bucket that acted as the station's only ashtray. Simons was about to remove a second filter-tipped number from her pack when she noticed the unmistakable figure of Ewan Stryker striding towards her. His red hair was cropped close to his head, and he sported a neat beard the same length. His nose had been broken one time too many. It pointed stubbornly to one side, breaching his otherwise symmetrical features. The man didn't appear to have any kind of neck. His head seemed to rest atop massively muscled shoulders. "'You haven't time for that now, Simons,' he barked, eyeing the pack of Regal. "'I need you to help me interview Ruby Ward.' Maureen Simons didn't care for Ewan Stryker. She'd heard all about his moods, his bad temper, his lack of compassion towards victims. And unlike some, she wasn't scared of him either. She pushed the pack down into the depths of her cavernous handbag and squared her shoulders, determined to fight her corner. I took a brief statement from her yesterday, sir, she snapped. And in my opinion, she's in no fit state to be interrogated by someone who couldn't even spell the word empathy. Stryker's sharp blue eyes flashed. Graham had intimated that the experienced detective was awkward to manage. I've read your statement, Simons, he said, and it tells us nothing. As for the woman's condition, I'll be the judge of that. And I'm not a feckin', sir. I'm a sergeant. Well said Maureen, undeterred, fishing out a piece of gum and popping it into her mouth. I suppose that whatever rank you are, you're the boss. But I can't see you getting very far with her. She's heavily sedated. We'll just have to wake her up then, said Stryker, turning on his heels. Come on, hurry up. Maureen was caught off balance by his sudden movement and scuttled after the long-legged detective. What? Where are you going? Where's your car, sir? I mean, Stryker. At home, I ran in this morning. Ran? Yeah, you know, you put one foot in front of the other, a bit faster than when you're walking. Simon slung her bag over her shoulder and did her best to keep up. She could feel her chest begin to tighten with each swift step and considered exactly how much damage her twenty-a-day habit was doing to her. Very funny, she breathed. Right, yes, I get that. But how exactly are we going to get to Avonham House? I mean, we could take C.I.D.'s pool car if you like. No need, said Stryker, pointing skyward. It's a beautiful day for a walk. But it's two miles away, protested Simons, her heels clicking away on the pavement. I know that, said Stryker, looking at his watch and stretching his legs further. Won't take as long. Maureen was already blowing. "'But you haven't got any statement forms.' "'Striker tapped the side of his nose with a thick finger. "'I phoned Simons. It has a record function. "'Now step lively. "'From what I've seen, you could do to lose a pound or two. "'Chapter Six "'Mr. Pitt, the owner of the funeral parlour where Henry Stott was employed, "'didn't like to work weekends. "'Approaching retirement,' Pitt preferred to take his wife Ethel away to their caravan in the Yorkshire Dales, leaving his prodigy in charge. He'd always found Henry to be a reliable and trustworthy young man, and the customers were always complimentary when describing Henry's polite yet solemn manner when dealing with their grief. Therefore, Pitt had no issue leaving Henry with the keys to the business, the company phone and the van used to transport the deceased to and from the parlour. Henry didn't mind the work either, and he was especially pleased to have possession of the company's black Ford Transit for two full days and nights. Officially, he'd made two calls over the weekend. The first was to the home of an elderly gentleman who'd been ill for some time. The doctor had issued a death certificate at the house, and this meant Henry could take the body straight to the funeral parlour. However, the second call was a coroner's case, where a middle-aged woman had suffered what appeared to be a fatal stroke. Therefore, a post-mortem would be required before Pitts could take charge of the arrangements. On this occasion, Henry had to transport the lady's body to the Royal Preston Hospital morgue for that process to take place. Unofficially, 
Henry had also disposed of Melissa Ward's mutilated corpse. On Monday morning, Henry had turned up at the parlour on time, with the van cleaned and polished inside and out. Working alongside Mr. Pitt, he'd completed the preparation of the old gentleman's body for viewing, collected the dead lady from Royal Preston Hospital, and before he knew it, it was lunchtime. Henry liked to swim, and his local pool offered an ideal slot, Mondays and Thursdays. It coincided with his luncheon. He had just enough time to walk to the swimming pool, complete his twenty lengths, and get back to work on the stroke of one o'clock. However, Mr. Pitt had been so pleased with Henry's weekend work, the shine on the van, and his all-round endeavours that morning, that he'd allowed him an extra thirty minutes break. This was a wonderful treat, as Henry knew that directly after the pool's usual one-hour adult swim slot, the local girls' high school had a half-hour session. That meant a minimum of twenty nubile young schoolgirls splashing about in the pool, and, far more importantly, getting undressed in the changing area. Henry would not want to miss that. He arrived at the leisure centre slightly out of breath. The woman on the desk, the one that took Henry's money and inspected his membership card each visit, smiled at him. "'In a hurry today, Henry?' she asked breezily. Henry smiled back. "'Not especially, Mrs. Charles,' he replied. "'In fact, Mr. Pitt has given me an extra half-hour for my dinner break. I've been a good boy, you see.' Edwina Charles had worked at the leisure centre for eleven years. She'd seen all the changes, seen kids move away from physical activities, preferring to play a computer game rather than splash in the pool. She'd also known Henry Stott. For the year or so, he'd been attending the lunchtime swim sessions. He seemed a nice young man, a little strange, maybe, a little on the spectrum, but a nice young man, nonetheless. "'You know, you still have to be out of the pool within the hour, though, Henry,' she explained. St. Jude's are in at one o'clock. "'I know, Mrs. Charles,' said Henry brightly. "'But I'll be in the changing rooms by then.' "'Good lad,' smiled Edwina. "'Good lad.' "'Oh, yes. "'Henry was indeed a good boy.' "'He swam faster than he ever had before. "'Henry powered through his twenty lengths in record time.' and as he lifted his body from the pool, his muscles ached. He shuffled along the poolside, taking care not to slip, and entered the male changing area. The room was warm, long and narrow. To the left were rows of small grey box-shaped lockers, to the right communal showers and six small changing cubicles. Henry strode expectantly to the very end one. For a moment his heart sank as he found the door to be closed and his favoured changing room occupied. He bit his lip in frustration, turned, went to his locker, removed his towel and shampoo, and walked disappointedly to the row of piping hot shower stations. Henry slipped out of his trunks and began his ablutions. As his ears cleared of soap, he heard the distant yet unmistakable sound of a group of giggling girls. They're here. He stepped out of the shower just in time to see an elderly man exit his preferred cubicle. His heart skipped a beat. He needed that room. He must have it at all costs. In his haste to grab his spot, Henry pushed past the man a little too briskly. "'Steady on there, son,' said the gent. Henry's pleasant features, his near-permanent smile, the one that endeared him to all he encountered, disappeared in an instant. Henry's benign countenance was replaced by one of thunderous, vicious hatred." "'Fuck you, old man!' he spat, and shoved the pensioner away. Seconds later, Henry sat on the wooden slatted bench seat in the confines of the cubicle. He was breathing hard, elbows on knees. Water dripped from his hair onto the floor. He counted the drops as they exploded like miniature bombs onto the tiles. One, two, three... He waited for his temper to subside before he stood and rubbed himself dry. The doctor had given him things to do in situations just like this. 
The doctor called them coping mechanisms. Henry wasn't sure what that meant, but they seemed to work. Dropping his towel to the floor, Henry stood naked, his rage behind him, trembling with excitement. He could hear them clearly now. The girls were just one flimsy wooden wall away. He could make out snippets of conversation, even names. Lucy, Faith, Beth. Then there were the distinctive sounds, the noises that could only be blouses being removed, skirts unzipped, bras undone. Henry climbed up onto the wooden seat, steadied himself, took the deepest of breaths, and stood on his tiptoes. Something, some device, or rather, some bracket, some pipe had once been fitted along the top of the adjoining wall of the cubicle. The lazy, inept joiner, plumber, or electrician had failed to fill in the two small holes left when the bolts had been removed. Henry rested his palms against the wall and let his right eye line up with the biggest of the two holes. There they were. Pale, sweet young things in various stages of undress. He moved his head left and right, looking, searching for just the right girl. Seconds later, there she was, petite in every way, with small, pert breasts, the blonde hair falling down to her shoulders, untouched, pure, innocent. Just what Henry craved. Henry felt his erection grow. He moved his hand downward and slowly began to pleasure himself. Oh, yes, Mr. Pitt, this is a treat, all right. A wonderful, wonderful treat. Chapter 7 Avenham House was a large Victorian terrace with a long front garden. Mature trees shaded the property and well-tended shrubs sat either side of the gravel path that led to the substantial red-painted front door. Someone took great care of the greenery, as along with the bushes, flowers and pot plants gave the place a splash of vivid colour. Stryker stood at the gate and waited for Maureen Simons to catch up. The female detective finally made it, sweating profusely and distinctly unhappy. No need, she managed, gasping for breath. No fucking need for that at all, Stryker. For what? For your comment on my weight. Stryker cocked his head. So you're happy being fat there, Simons? I didn't say that, did I? Stryker took on the appearance of a confused bulldog. What would you prefer, then? You want me to lie and say you're slim so? Simons managed to push open the garden gate. Forget it, Stryker. You have the social skills of a warthog. Stryker followed her along the path, his feet crunching on the gravel. He scratched his head. No, I'm struggling to get to grips with your point there, Simons. How about I give you some tips on a good diet and exercise regime? I'll have a stone or two off you in a couple of months. She stopped. Her face was approaching the colour of some of the garden's carnations. Their eyes full of thunder. Maybe I don't want to lose weight. Have you thought of that? Maybe I don't want to go on the diet because I'm happy as I am. Stryker was nonplussed. You want to be unhealthy? Simons turned and made an infuriated growling noise as she pressed the front doorbell. Listen, she hissed through the corner of her mouth. Can we forget my fucking waistline for one minute? The women in this place are damaged individuals, so is our Ruby. And I don't want you going in like a bull in a china shop. Can you get that in your thick head, Stryker? Of course I can. Good. Then be careful what you say and how you're behaving here. The mere presence of a man can upset some of these women. God knows you've upset me enough for one day. Stryker didn't understand why. He waited. The door was opened by a woman in her late fifties, small, thin-framed, bird-like. She instantly recognised Simons and offered a smile. After all, Maureen had worked as lead detective on the city's rape crisis team and 
had visited Avenham House on many occasions. Simons had not been exaggerating when she described the occupants of the establishment as damaged, battered, mistreated and abused women, desperate to feel safe in a place where their attackers couldn't find them. Avenham House was a godsend. There were no signs indicating what type of refuge was offered here. It was a very special kind of safe house. The bird woman did not smile at Stryker. And you are, she said flatly. Uh, this is you and Stryker, offered Maureen. He's leading the investigation involving Ruby Ward. The woman didn't take her eyes from Stryker, yet addressed Maureen. We have two very sensitive cases here right now, Detective Simons and I've taken the decision not to allow men into the refuge for the moment. Stryker was about to make his point, but the woman wasn't finished. You must be aware of how the presence of such a... She appeared to struggle to find her words, then added, An aggressive-looking man could affect our residence. Maureen turned. Give us a minute, please, boss. Stryker did his best to be humble and wandered back along the path to the road. He looked on as the two women carried on their private conversation, growing increasingly irritated as the seconds went by. He pulled out his phone and began to scroll the dozens of documents relating to the investigation, including the arrest record of Ruby Ward and her antecedents history. Finding exactly what he was looking for, he walked back to the gate and rested his huge hands on the top. "'Ladies!' he shouted. "'Sorry to interrupt you there now, but... Would you just pass a wee message to Ruby? Tell her I'll have a car here in ten minutes to take her to a nice wee boozer I know. Sit out in the sunshine in the beer garden. On me, so it is. Stryker got an incredulous look from Birdwoman. He watched on as Maureen Simon shook her head. There was some gesticulation, some unheard conversation. Finally the woman went inside. A minute later she was back. Ruby was on her way. Detective Bob Higgins had fitted the lock to the office door as instructed. It hadn't been as simple a job as he'd first thought and had taken him over an hour. Once he'd completed the task, he rang Stryker. Hi, boss. Uh, uh, Bob here. Uh, um, I wondered what you wanted to do about the cord for the office door lock. Bob could tell Stryker was in a car. He could hear the police radio traffic in the background. I'm open to suggestions there, detective, said Stryker, so long as it isn't second one, two, three, four. Bob thought for a second. Uh, how about 1066? How the feck is anyone supposed to remember that now? Barked Stryker. Uh, well, sir, stuttered the experienced but confused Jack. It's the day the... Battle of Hastings, see, and Stryker let out his trademark sigh. I realize that, Bob. My idea of a little joke. Oh, ha, <laughs> see, boss, yeah, yeah, of course you would know, eh? Even though you're foreign, like, I'm as British as you are, detective. However, my dual nationality means I can piss people off in four different countries. Now, just keep that wee number between us four, eh? And I don't care what rank is asking. You get me there, Bob? Not even the chief feckin' constable himself. Stryker killed the call, leaving Bob staring at the blank screen. Maureen's right. This block is trouble with a capital T. By lunchtime, Bob had traced the cop who had reported Melissa Ward missing. He sat across the canteen table from Constable Sharon Forshaw. She was a stout woman with short, cropped auburn hair. Married to another cop, Sharon had three kids under five, worked a response car ten hours a day, four on, four off, and was stressed to breaking point. "'It's all on the fucking form, Bob,' she said, taking the last gulp of her brew. "'Fuck's sake, man. Have you any idea how many jobs I'd do in a day like that one?' "'I can guess,' offered the detective. "'I mean, it ain't like it was when you were in blue, mate.' Eh? Sharon dropped her empty cup on the table and struggled with an awkward pack of bourbon creams. You know, back when you was on response, it was a couple of calls, then a brew with some friendly face on your patch, so on and so forth, eh? 
The pack was finally opened, and she crunched on a biscuit. Fuck me, Bob, I have a job list as long as me fucking arm before I even leave the nick. I've got seven case files to complete before I go on leave next week, in three of which the complainants are total junkie pisspots who can't remember what they had for breakfast. She scratched her head. I'm getting the same fucking way, to be honest. Bob Higgins looked a proper handful. Indeed, on the rugby field, he had the reputation of being one of the hardest tacklers on the team. That was until he'd fractured a vertebrae in his neck and his wife had demanded he retire from the game. However, off the field, he was a quiet, unassuming man who was liked by colleagues and criminals alike. Bob Higgins was firm but fair. It was his way, and it had served him well. He gave Sharon a kind smile. Did you ever meet the girl? Melissa, I mean. Sharon nodded and spat crumbs on the table as she spoke. A couple of times. Last one she'd run off from the kids' home again and I'd found her up on Callan with a real nasty piece of work. Miguel Jimenez. Bob nodded. Oh, I know him, yeah. Dealer and pimp of this parish. That's him. Sharon wiped crumbs from the table with her palm. Well, we had a tip that she was crashing at his gaff. She already had all the signs of being a crackhead then. That was maybe three months ago, I reckon. You know the way Miguel works, eh? Get em hooked and get em working to earn their keep. Bob nodded. He knew exactly. Sharon shook her head ruefully. I knew, even as I was driving her back to the home, she'd be gone again next day. Do your best for her, eh? Did she mention a mum at all? asked Bob. You know, when you spoke to her off the record. Sharon shook her head. You don't get taken into care these days unless things are really shite at home, mate. The uniform cop pointed. And I mean shite. Rumour had it that Ruby Ward had been pimping Melissa since she was thirteen or fourteen. Bob shook his head. He knew what level of mistreatment or lack of care was needed to be proven before social services would remove a child from a parent, especially a mother. Bob had two girls himself, one fifteen like Melissa, the other three years her senior had just started university and was living in Manchester. The detective was under no illusions just how difficult an inquiry this was going to be for him. And the home she was in? Car Street, said Sharon, standing and checking her watch. I take it as sea idea sniffing about. You think some harm has come to the girl? Possible, said Bob, aware of the strict news blackout enforced by DCS Graham. Shame, offered Sharon. Anyway, I have a date with one of my junkie witnesses. Good luck on this one, Bob. Chapter 8 Ruby Ward had been quiet on the journey to the Fleece Inn. She'd sat in the back of the car alongside Maureen Simons, her head resting on the window, staring out into space, her gaunt, pale countenance betraying her years of alcohol abuse. Ruby may have scrubbed up okay, but in bright daylight she appeared considerably older than her thirty-two years. As the uniform driver steered the car to their destination, Stryker again flicked through his phone, digesting anything and everything the cops had on his witness. In fact, Ruby wasn't a Ruby at all. Christened Bethany Susan Ward, she changed her name by deed poll at the age of fifteen. Her first arrest for soliciting on the infamous streets around Preston's Victorian radial-style prison came just after her sixteenth birthday. She'd fallen pregnant less than a year later, father unknown. There were more arrests in that year, but rather than street-walking, the offences were for petty thievery, shoplifting, pickpocketing. Stryker considered that a heavily pregnant woman may not be so popular with the Johns trawling the St. Matthews area of town, but quickly changed his mind, well aware that sexual deviances took all forms. No doubt Ruby had worked all the way through her confinement. She just hadn't been caught. The woman's life appeared to change for the better once Melissa had been born, 
and there was a five-year gap in her antecedents. That was until, once again, aged twenty-two, she had come to the notice of the cops, this time for possession of amphetamine sulphate. From there it was one long, dreary, depressing read of a young woman reliant on prostitution for money and dependent on drink and drugs to stay sane. Stryker couldn't help but feel a tinge of sadness for Ruby. They pulled into the Fleece Inn car park. It was a large pub on a corner plot at the top of Penwortham Hill, boasting a fine beer garden to the rear. The sun shone brightly, and once again Stryker's eyes were drawn to the happy children totting around the lawn, playing chase and ball, as groups of mums sat around on chairs and blankets, enjoying a cool drink. The relatively affluent area of Penwortham, just a few minutes' drive from Avenham House, must have seemed a million miles away to Ruby. "'What'll you be having there, Miss Ward?' asked Stryker as they stepped from the car. "'Gin,' she said flatly. "'Large gin.' "'Tonic?' quizzed Stryker. Ruby just shrugged and sloped off towards the table. Stryker watched her go. She was a shell of a woman. Empty. Her heart had been torn from her chest, yet the good Lord had deemed to keep her alive without it. Did God intend to make Ruby suffer for her past sins? Who knew? Stryker didn't have much time for religion, or the folks that peddled it. He knew all about loss, though. He knew all about death. And whoever you were, good, bad, saint or sinner, he knew it was the people left behind that hurt and grieved. He returned from the bar with a large G&T and two bottles of water. Maureen Simons eyed her Evian with some suspicion. "'Last of the big spenders,' she muttered. Stryker's eyes flashed. "'What you do off duty is your business, detective,' he said. "'Here and now, you stay teetotal.' Stryker knew that Simons would want to begin the interview with the usual how-are-you-coping chat. He had no time for that. He set his iPhone to record. "'When did you last see Melissa, Ruby?' he asked quietly. About three weeks ago, maybe. I bumped into her in St. George's. I was doing some shopping. Stryker noticed Ruby's eyes unfocus as she recalled the meeting, and for the first time realised just how attractive the woman could have been in different circumstances. She had a full mouth, fine features, almond-shaped eyes and thick auburn hair. Unfortunately, her lifestyle had taken its toll. Her lips were cracked and dry. Lines were already forming around the corners of her mouth from smoking. Her eyes were dull, lifeless pools. She was in care then. She hadn't been going to school, so they said it was best. Stryker nodded. How did she seem? Ruby took her drink in one gulp and shook the empty glass in Stryker's face. She curled her lip into a sneer. A lot fucking better than she looked in them pictures. She slammed the glass on the table. Them social workers got a lot to answer for. And you lot too. Where were you when she was being ripped open like a piece of meat, eh? Maureen Simon snatched the glass away and gave Ruby a derisory look. I'll get you another, she said sourly. Stryker waited for the detective to leave. He grabbed Ruby by the wrist and squeezed, just enough to get her attention. Listen, sweetheart, don't be taking your grief or your guilt out on me, okay? I know you ain't up for Mum of the Year, and I don't care about what social services did or didn't do, okay? You can argue about who was to blame for your kid running wild another time. My job is to find the animals who did this to Melissa and lock the bastards away for life. Are we clear? Ruby stared at Stryker's thick fingers wrapped around her thin wrist. Then a light came on and her eyes widened. Animals? You mean there's more than one? Stryker released her arm. Someone worked the camera, Ruby. She nodded furiously and bit her bottom lip so hard Stryker thought she may draw blood. Then silent tears fell. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean nothing by... Stryker pushed on. There'd be time for sentiment when he'd caught his prey. 
When exactly did you receive the package? Ruby wiped her eyes with the back of her hand. It was... It would have been when I got home from work Saturday evening. Work? Ruby eyed Stryker knowingly. I don't have punters at me flat on weekends. It pisses off the neighbours, so I do house calls. So you got home and the envelope was pushed through the box? Ruby nodded again. And what time was this now? Seven, maybe eight o'clock. And you opened it straight away. I don't get many letters and it was brown, you know, like a bill or something. Then what? Maureen dropped another gin and tonic on the table. Ruby ignored the mixer and emptied the shot of neat spirit in one, hand shaking. I opened it and saw, saw my baby all tied up. And that, that beast do it. Oh my God, it's all my fault, isn't it? Maureen Simons draped an arm around Ruby's shoulders and let her break her heart all over again. Stryker went back to the bar. When he returned, Ruby had stopped crying, but sat head in hands, mumbling to herself. Stryker pushed the drink towards her. For the third time, she swallowed the liquid in one. "'Look at me,' said Stryker sharply. She raised her head, eyes red, nose running. Stryker's eyes bore into Ruby's. "'What, then?' he asked. For a moment, Stryker saw something in Ruby's face. The hairs on his neck bristled. Was it fear? Then, she hesitated. I, I went to, I mean, I took the envelope to the station. Stryker examined the woman. What was she hiding? And how did you get to the nick then? Taxi, stuttered Ruby. I got a taxi. Chapter 9 Will Garrett sat drinking tea. When Ruby had turned up Saturday night, he put the cat right among the pigeons. Standing there, piss wet through with those pictures stuffed in a brown envelope, she'd spoiled his plans good and proper. And it was a good fucking job his missus was up north too, or the shit would have really hit the fan. She should have gone straight to the nick, silly bitch. Despite Ruby's gin-sodden tears, he'd used all his powers of persuasion to convince her to go to the station in the cab and keep her mouth tightly shut about the visit to his home. Will certainly didn't need any association, however tenuous, to a dead teenage prostitute, especially one he'd used himself and one who had made him many thousands of pounds. Awkward questions from nosy murder squad detectives were not the biscuit to go with his brew. He'd known Ruby Ward since she'd turned tricks at the back of Preston Prison as a sixteen-year-old. They had been the closest thing to love as a cop and a whore could ever be. If Garrett hadn't known better, he might even have suspected that Melissa was his own child. She was not. Ruby's only daughter was later to become one of the many underage girls Will provided for the entertainment of his regulars. Melissa had been easy meat. Even as a fourteen-year-old, the girl had been immensely popular with his wealthy clients. She'd been no shrinking violet either. Bleach blonde and big-breasted, she knew all too well what his customers wanted and played the part to a T. She'd been a little gold mine. That was until she ran off with that fool, Miguel Jimenez, from the Callan estate. Once the girls went down that route, they were no good to Will Garrett any more. Fresh and youthful was his mantra, not stoned and smelly. Still, plenty more fish and all that. Fish that weren't smoking crack cocaine, passing out mid-BJ and costing Will Garrett his commission. Melissa had lost her way, and with it, her worth. He had, however, promised Ruby he would look out for her daughter. Epic fail there. Will's phone broke his concentration. It buzzed in front of him, spinning around like a demented top. 
He examined the screen. It was the fifth time the device had danced around the table in the space of an hour, and each time it had been DCI Alan Blunt. Will had spent most of the previous morning arranging for Blunt to meet the two Chinese whores he was so keen on. Blunt's marathon sexual encounter had taken place later that night at a discreet little flat Garrett used for such delicate matters. Will had bought two apartments with the cash he'd made from those very same punters. They had every conceivable piece of fetish equipment, every sex toy, every uniform a sexual deviant could wish for. Most of all, they were tucked away on the outskirts of town, well away from prying eyes. After all, the sight of a bloated middle-aged man meeting two obviously underage girls in a fucking travelodge was a recipe for disaster. And now, looking at his buzzing phone... Will figured the dirty bastard was desperate for another taste of the delightful twins. Some just can't get enough. He grabbed the handset and answered. Blunt was not in a buying mood. He was in full-blown panic mode and positively hissed into the handset. Garrett, thank fuck. Have you heard? Will played dumb. Heard what, Blunty? Heard what? Heard that there's a fucking murder investigation going on and the victim is that kid Melissa, that's what. Melissa? Oh, come on, Will, don't fuck around here. This is serious shit. That young bird you sorted for me, you know, about twelve months back. The little blonde big tits. Will kept his powder dry. You say the girl's been chopped, Al? Garrett could hear the DCI moving about his office, obviously checking for prying ears. The senior detective lowered his voice another notch. Not just fucking topped, Will. Tortured, raped. Fuck me, this is as bad as I've ever seen. And they took fucking pictures. The bastards even sent them to her mother. That ruby, that horn you're so close to. Garrett's business had only just recovered from the Independent Police Complaints Commission, sticking their noses in where they weren't wanted. It had taken some serious friends in high places to get rid of them. A panicked Alan Blunt was the last thing he needed. Of course he knew there would be a murder investigation the second he saw the pictures of Melissa. What he couldn't get his head around was why it wasn't all over the news. Despite Blunt being an old woman in the worry department, he did have a point. The murder was being kept on the QT by people at the very top. Another good reason not to enter into stupid mobile phone conversations. He allowed his tone to change just enough to let Blunt know where he stood. Be careful what you're saying there, Blunty. I have no idea who you're talking about, son. I don't know no Ruby, no Melissa either. Understand? The DCI's temper was rising. Don't fucking come out with me, sunshine. Who was it that got shot at that fucking IPCC for ya? I paid you thousands over the years and kept quiet about your... your... Well, you know. Will's voice was flat calm. And I, you, Blunty. Those two last night, for starters. Blunt took a deep breath. Look, well, fighting and talking shite won't get us anywhere here. Listen, this investigation's been run by some guy called Stryker. It's not even a full DI. I mean... Come on, the fucking sergeant running a murder inquiry. What the fuck's that about? Why hasn't my team got the nod? And why is there a full news blackout on the murder? I only found out by accident. No one outside Striker's team knows anything. Garrett played dumb. Maybe this Striker guy's something special. And maybe someone upstairs knows more than you think. Well, maybe the IPCC turned up more than we thought. Like what? I don't know, but what I do know is that this striker's going to examine this girl's past in fine detail, her movements, her associates. I mean, what if someone finds out about our... our arrangement? I mean, look, well, fuck me. I'd be ruined, I'd be dead in the water, I'd lose everything. They'd say I was a paedophile, Will, a fucking nonce. Garrett listened to Blunt whine a minute or two longer, then stopped him. Blunty, Blunty, calm the fuck down. No one's going to grass anyone. You just keep an eye on this striker bloke for me and report back what you can, OK? 
I'll sort everything my end. No one will be able to trace anything back to you, I promise. You know me, eh? Discretion is my middle name. The DCI exhaled loudly. Right, okay, well, yeah, I suppose. I suppose you're right. Okay, mate, stay in touch. Garrett sat and mulled over what he needed to do. Once Melissa had become enamoured with her drug dealer friend, she'd become an instant problem. Hence his decision to stop using her services. He was totally confident of Ruby's silence. Too much water under the bridge, too many favours, too much knowledge on both sides. But Miguel Jimenez was quite another issue. What if the delicious Melissa had indulged in some pillow talk with her pimp? What if she'd mentioned the names of some of his very special clients? What if she'd mentioned the out-of-town flats? The cops would be knocking on Miguel's door before you could say Jack Robinson. Loose lips. Dead girls were one thing, but he couldn't afford another IPCC investigation. Garrett lifted his case from the sofa and placed it on the table in front of him. He slid the two gold-plated locks to one side. The clasps flicked open and he lifted the lid. He opened the revolver and checked it, closed the case and walked to his door. He and Miguel needed a little chat. Blue slips. Sink ships. Henry was late for work. He was late because he'd waited for the party of schoolgirls from St. Jude's to come out of the front door. Well, actually, he'd waited for one particular girl to emerge. The pretty, skinny little blonde whose nakedness had sent him into raptures, who had made him explode within seconds. He'd needed to know her name. He'd needed to know where she lived. He'd needed to know... her. Henry stood at the side of the school bus, watching, waiting... As the seconds ticked by, more and more of the group emerged. He was becoming concerned that he had missed his girl. Had she somehow left without him noticing? He felt his rage begin to build inside his skull. The relentless pressure mounting behind his eyes, blurring his vision. If he'd lost her, Henry thought his head may burst. Then there she was. He felt himself smile in the girl's direction but she didn't see him. Pretty blondes never saw Henry, and this one was no different. She was too busy laughing and joking with her friends. He moved to one side, making himself more visible to her group, but she still didn't look. Too busy. Pretty skinny blondes were always too busy. It had been the same all Henry's life. But those pretty blondes weren't too busy when it came to good-looking boys with flash cars and a few quid in the bank, were they? No, not those same pretty blondes that called Henry names, called him weird, called him porky, called him dirty. How dare they call him anything when they drop their knickers at the sight of a flash car or a wad of notes? Who's dirty then, eh? They all became whores sooner or later one way or another, all of them. They took money and gave their bodies. Henry was tired of whores, the whores he'd brought back to his house each week, the ones he'd picked up from the street in his car, the ones he took to his mother's old bedroom. No, Henry wanted a girl who hadn't been tainted, pawed, molested. Henry wanted this one. He shouldered his gym bag and strode over to the small group. His T-shirt was tight on his muscular body, his hair slicked back still wet from his shower. He looked good. He felt like James Dean. Henry pushed his way through the giggling mass of bodies until he was in front of his girl. She stopped her conversation and looked up at him quizzically. Henry smiled. Hi. Sorry to interrupt, but are you Jim Lawrence's sister Trudy? The girl looked into his eyes. She was indeed beautiful, so fresh, so innocent. She let out a nervous laugh. 
no, no, I'm Lucy, Lucy Stevenson. Henry theatrically put his hand over his mouth and threw back his head. No, oh my, I'm such an idiot. I'm sorry, Lucy. I figured you were Jim's sister, you know, the model. Lucy blushed. The two friends laughed. One pushed Lucy playfully. Hey, a model, look at you, girl. Lucy flushed with embarrassment. Uh, no, sorry, that's not me, she said quietly. Henry smiled again. OK, no worries, eh? No harm done. Just that my brother is a talent scout at a modelling agency, see? And I only met Trudy once, and you look just like her. Henry made a show of looking Lucy up and down. How old are you? Sixteen? Seventeen? There were more giggles from the two friends. I'm only fourteen, pouted Lucy, naively enjoying the attention from a grown man, even if he did seem a little weird. Wow, said Henry, you look older. He wagged a finger. You know, I'm sure my brother could get you work. As a model, I mean. Henry knew he needed to move quickly before the teachers noticed him. Nosy teachers asking questions had got Henry into trouble before. Not at school. No, he'd always seemed to avoid them in school. But later, as he got older, as he got more desperate. Well, that had been quite a different matter. Look, Lucy, I know this is going to sound a bit creepy, but can I take a picture of you and send it to my brother? I'm sure he'll get you work. Nothing sleazy, of course, just catalogue stuff, you know, clothes, shoes, that kind of thing. Lucy looked to her two friends for support, unsure what to say. Henry saw that the remainder of the school party had boarded the coach. He couldn't wait any longer. He couldn't get caught. Not again. Henry pulled out his phone. Come on, big smile, Lucy. Lucy smiled. The phone clicked. Great shot, he said, giving a thumbs up. Henry raised his eyebrows and put on his best serious face. Now, as you're underage, the firm who my brother works for will need written permission from your parents. He looked into Lucy's sparkling blue eyes and felt the telltale stirrings in his jeans. He managed a smile. So I'll need your postal address. As the girls boarded their coach, Henry typed Lucy's address into his phone as best he could. He stepped away from the exit door and watched as the bus pulled away. Henry couldn't hide his pleasure. Edwina Charles, the leisure centre's receptionist, the woman who had checked Henry's membership card twice a week for the last year, had observed the proceedings through the open window of her office. And Edwina didn't like what she had seen and heard. Not one little bit. Henry jogged back to work, checking his watch as he ran. He was, indeed, fifteen minutes late, and that meant trouble. Trouble he didn't need, especially as he was desperate to finish work on time. He badly needed to view the picture he'd taken of Lucy, to crop it and blow it up to the biggest size possible and to spend an hour or so in his bedroom, paying his own special kind of tribute to the image. And later, well, later, he may even drive past her house in Ribbleton and see where she lived, where she ate, where she slept. Henry did his best to block out what was surely to come, but as he approached the funeral parlour, he could see old Mr. Pitt standing outside, alongside one of the new hearses, arms folded, staring down the street in his direction, face like thunder. "'Late, Henry!' shouted Mr. Pitt. "'Late, late, late!' He removed his glasses and began to rub the lenses furiously with his handkerchief. And we knew his boss always did this when he was cross with him. I'm sorry, Mr. Pitt, but Henry offered. Sorry was no good. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That's all I ever hear from you, Henry, interrupted Pitt, holding up a palm. And you are too late to conjure me this time, son. I've already called. Henry's heart sank. 
You called the doctor. Terms and conditions, Henry. Terms and conditions of your employment. You know I'm obliged to inform the doctor of any changes in your behaviour or tardiness in your work. And as I have already been generous enough to allow you a further half an hour for your luncheon, I can see no excuse for your lateness. He replaced his glasses. So there, it's done. Henry wanted to smash Pitt's face to pulp, to grind his stupid glasses into his stupid eyeballs, to stamp on his head until his skull popped open like an overripe peach. Henry could feel his heart beating in his throat. The pressure behind his eyes had returned and his head swam. He balled his fists, every sinew in his body tense and ready to explode into a vicious frenzy of violence. Then his phone rang. He looked at the screen. Private number. It could only be one person. Hello, Doctor, said Henry, his rage falling away like rain down a pane. Hello, Henry. This is a disappointment now, isn't it? I'm sorry, Doctor. Now what did I always tell you, Henry? What did I say about truthfulness? Henry watched as Mr. Pitt strode away, leaving him to deal with the doctor alone. He felt the fear drag him creep up his back, scratching its nails along his spine ever upward, its fiery breath burning his neck. He began to shake. You said not to say sorry unless I meant it, mumbled Henry. Yes, exactly. That is exactly what we agreed now, isn't it? Yes. Are you alone now, Henry? Yes. And where have you been? What have you been up to that would make you so late? What have you done that was so bad that Mr. Pitt thought it fit to disturb me? I was swimming. Your swim finished fifty minutes ago, Henry. You always make it within your lunch hour. Twice a week, Mondays and Thursdays. We agreed you could do that, didn't we? Now Mr. Pitt says he gave you an extra thirty minutes for lunch. So what have you been up to? Henry could hear the doctor tapping keys on the computer. Yes, here we are. Adult swim and... Twelve forty-five hours. Oh, yes, I see. Followed by... Thirteen hundred hours. St. Jude's R.C. High and... Thirteen thirty hours. Now, forgive me if I'm wrong here, Henry, but isn't St. Jude's an old girl's establishment? Henry's shaking was uncontrollable. He thought his legs might give away. Yes, Doctor... The doctor's voice was low, sinister. You've been looking at naked schoolgirls again, haven't you, Henry? Looking at their nubile little bodies and playing with yourself. Henry dare not tell about Lucy. He knew what the doctor would do, what the doctor was capable of, what pain he would suffer. There's a hole, he said quietly, in the changing rooms. No one could see me, honestly. The doctor considered Henry's last statement and was silent for a moment. Then, you know what happened the last time you were caught playing with yourself in public, don't you, Henry? Henry nodded, then realised he was on the phone. Yes, yes, I do. And I said I would help you, didn't I? So long as you played by my rules. Yes, but now you have broken them. I'm... Um, don't! bellowed the doctor. Don't tell me you are fucking sorry one more time, or God help me, I will make sure you are back in a padded cell before the end of this very day. Henry stayed quiet. The thought of being back in that place, after more than a year of freedom, was too much to bear. I won't let you down again, he said. No, said the doctor. No, you won't. You won't risk everything I have planned just so you can wank yourself off over some little schoolgirl. I've told you over and over, Henry, leave the innocent ones alone. Yours are the valueless ones, the druggies, the whores, the ones whose parents don't love them, just like your mother didn't care for you, Henry. 
The doctor's tone became quieter, softer. No one will care for the six, Henry. No one will come looking for all the worthless whores. And when we are done, my boy, when we are as clever as clever, then, maybe then, I will allow that spirit of yours its freedom. The doctor was businesslike. Now, did you get rid of number one? Yes, just as you said. No trouble? No. Two? Three? I fed them this morning. Good. So tomorrow, Tuesday, you can have girl two to play with. Henry was starting to feel better. I'd like that. Another blonde, Henry, said the doctor cheerily. The one that laughed at you, remember? You paid for her body, but she laughed at you, ridiculed you. Henry felt his temper returning as he recalled the girl's mocking laughter at his naive fumblings. Number two, he said. Yes, doctor, I remember her well. Good, good boy, Henry. Henry felt himself smile. The girl hadn't laughed earlier. When he'd removed her gag so she could eat that morning, she begged Henry to release her from her makeshift cell. She'd said she'd do anything he wanted, offered him all her body, no act out of bounds, no charge. "'I am a good boy, doctor,' he said. "'A very good boy.' Chapter 10 Felicity Abbott, or Fliss to her friends, was a good solid detective, but her real talent was as a psychological criminal profiler. It was her job to identify the type of person the cops were looking for, what the perpetrator's background might be, where they might live, would they be married, what was their job. She would narrow down each trait until a suspect could be identified. It wasn't an exact science, but was now widely used by police forces worldwide. However, Lancashire was some way down the line from where she trained in the States. Abbott had spent two years at the National Centre for the Analysis of Violent Crime, NCAVC, Quantico, Virginia. Not only was it a centre of excellence for behavioural analysis, but profilers had access to VICAP, a database that compiled facts, statistics, and germane details regarding violent offences, including rape, assault, and murder, for the purpose of linking known offenders to previous or current crimes. As she examined the eight crime scene photographs sent to Ruby Ward, she wished she had access to VICAP now. Abbott investigated each crime in the same structured way she had been trained to do at Quantico. First, she would look at the antecedent phase of the offence. Did the murderer premeditate his act? In this case, obviously, yes. What plan did he have, and what was his motivation for killing? Was it pure degradation, sexual deviation, jealousy, hatred? Then she would examine the method used, the modus operandi, including any ritualistic or fantasy-based behaviours exhibited. Fliss considered the shocking images and mused. Jesus, I could write a book on this one. Of course, equally important to the case were the demographics of the victim. Where did she come from? What caused her to be where she was when the offence took place? Then, if they ever found her corpse, how was the body disposed of? Finally, as time progressed, she would examine how the murderer may respond to the fact they were being hunted. All these things would eventually create a picture. Small pieces of information would slot into place until Abbott could finally identify her prey. Or so she hoped. Fliss checked her mailbox, but the list of sex offenders residing in the local area still hadn't found its way in there. She stood and stretched, walked over to the office door and checked that Bob's new lock was secure. Satisfied they now had a locked room in which to work, she again lifted the pile of crime scene pictures from her desk and began to reattach them to the whiteboard on the back wall. The last item in the pile was a photocopy of the note found inside the envelope. She read it over. 
When I was one, I had just begun. Abbott shivered. It was an uncontrolled reflex, as if someone had walked over her grave, as her nan used to say. Still, it was as good a place to start as any. She sat, opened Google, and typed in the words. The result was instant. Whoever had written the note had either intended the cops to discover its origins quickly, or it was there purely to tell them something the killers wanted them to know straight away. This was not a difficult puzzle to solve. When I Was One was the start of a children's poem by A. A. Milne, entitled Six. Abbott instantly knew why she had shivered. Her mother had read Milne's stories and poems to her as a small child. He was the English author best known for his tales about Winnie the Pooh. Fliss was enchanted by the Pooh stories and loved the way Milne's poems rhymed so nicely. Six was such an innocent little verse. In the poem, a young child recounts his previous five years and how life was just beginning. But six, oh, six was going to be the very best year of all. Yet, as Detective Felicity Abbott read and re-read the short script, Milne's verse took on a whole new, malevolent meaning. When I was one, I had just begun. When I was two... I was nearly new. When I was three, I was hardly me. When I was four, I was not much more. When I was five, I was just alive. But now I am six. I'm as clever as clever. So I think I'll be six now, for ever and ever. She grabbed her phone and dialed Stryker. He answered on the second ring. Speak, he said. Boss, she breathed. It's, it's Fliss at the office. That note, the one on the envelope, it's a poem. It's called Six. Boss, this isn't a clue. This is a notice of intent. Shit, Stryker. I think there are going to be five more girls. Chapter 11 Stryker closed the call and let out a long, pained sigh. He and Maureen Simons had just dropped a rather inebriated ruby back at Avenham House and were on their way to see a man by the name of Philip Worthington, Melissa's old caseworker. He had an office in the centre of town and was expecting them. The news Abbott had just presented to him had not come as any great shock. After all, if you were going to go to all the trouble of creating a dungeon to rival E. L. James's wildest imagination, film your exploits and thumb your nose at the cops, why stop at one? No, Stryker knew there was more to the murder than met the eye. It wasn't just about sex and depravity. It was something else. Unfortunately, he had no idea what that something was, and was hoping Felicity Abbott would be able to answer that riddle sooner rather than later. He opened another call. Bob, what are you up to now? I'm just on my way up Callan to have a word with a guy by the name of Miguel Jimenez. Apparently Melissa was found at his flat the last time she went AWOL. For him? Loads of it. Drugs, violence, living off immoral earnings. A pimp, then. In one, boss. Good. You need another pair of hands? No, I'm a big boy. I saw. Am I door lock? Causing all kinds of consternation in the CID office, boss. Good. As soon as you're done with this Jimenez, meet us back at the nick. Yes, boss. Stryker pushed his phone back in his pocket and turned to Maureen Simons. You heard of a guy called Jimenez? Uh, Miguel Jimenez? Stryker nodded. That's him. Oh, yes, real badass boy. Likes to think he's big time. Supplies crack to the street girls, runs a few himself. Why? Apparently Melissa was found at his gaff the last time she went missing. And from that, you figure Melissa was whoring like a mother? Their uniformed driver swung the car up to the curb and pulled to a stop. Stryker shrugged his massive shoulders and leaned into the door. Let's go and ask social services that same question, eh? Philip Worthington's office was tidy. Very tidy. 
The striker and Simons folded themselves into two very tight wooden chairs. Worthington carefully lined up his pen at a right angle to a thick file that sat in front of him. Other than these two items, his desk was clear. Worthington himself was not so tidy. He sported a mass of grey curls that frizzed in all directions, a matching beard that birds could have nested in, and a pair of eyebrows that appeared to curl onto the top of his horn-rimmed glasses. He wore a tweed jacket with school-teacher regulation leather elbow patches, a shirt with a frayed collar that had once been white, all finished off with a plain red tie held in place by a Socialist Workers' Party badge. He offered his hand to both detectives. "'Terrible business. Shocking. Melissa found dead, you say?' "'It is shocking,' said Stryker. "'But I must ask you, for the moment at least, to keep this conversation within these walls.' Worthington nodded. "'Of course, I fully understand.' He opened the heavy file in front of him and made a show of pressing the top of his pen. "'How exactly did poor Melissa die, detective?' Stryker kept his counsel. "'We haven't had the results of the post-mortem through yet, Mr. Worthington, so it would be wrong of me to speculate. Suffice to say, we are treating her death as suspicious.' The caseworker tapped his nose conspiratorially. "'I see, I see, of course.' Maureen Simons leaned forward. "'How long had you known the Ward family, Philip?' Worthington blew out his cheeks. "'On and off, ten, coming up eleven years, I'd say.' Simons took out her notebook. "'And the reason for Melissa being in the care of the local authority most recently?' Worthington sat back and chose to waffle rather than answer the direct question. Over the years, we have done our best to manage the situation in the Ward family home. On occasions, that has included removing the child. You will be aware we consider it a last resort to take away a child from her parents. Naturally, said Maureen impatiently. Philip ploughed on, unsure if Simons was being sarcastic. "'Well, we did stabilise things for quite some time. "'As you probably know, Mum had some issues with drink and drugs, "'but for prolonged periods managed to look after Melissa. "'The child was fed, clothed, attended school regularly, and seemed happy. "'Therefore, during those better periods, Melissa remained at home.' Stryker cocked his head. "'It didn't concern you that Ruby was a prostitute all that time?' How people keep the wolf from the door is not our concern, detective. Ruby wasn't walking the streets, and she wasn't working in a brothel. So unless the laws of the land have changed, as I understand it, she wasn't breaking any rules. Simon shook her head in disbelief. Yes, but the risk to the child, surely. Worthington raised his hand. Ruby wasn't bringing her clients to her flat whilst Melissa was at home. Well, not in the beginning, at least. It was only as Melissa got older that we raised our concerns. Two things became obvious. The first was that Ruby had become totally alcohol-dependent, and the second was that Melissa was truanting and growing increasingly promiscuous. How old was she then? asked Simons. Twelve, maybe thirteen. Maureen scribbled some more. But you didn't ever consider that her promiscuity was down to the mother's lifestyle? Worthington considered his words. Social services did everything in their power to protect Melissa Ward, detective. They have acted with professionalism every step of the way. Stryker was losing patience. We're not looking for a scapegoat, Worthington, and I appreciate what a fine department you have here, but I would hate any other victims to turn up whilst you pontificate about your precious fucking reputation. Worthington pursed his lips and nodded a reluctant acknowledgement. In the end, we moved quickly because we, we thought there may have been a third party involved. A man... We believe that Ruby Ward was having a relationship with an older male, and although she never mentioned him, there were two separate notes on the file to suggest that this was the case. Stryker and Simons waited. Worthington took a breath. 
Melissa was an early developer. She appeared much older than her years, and there is no doubt that her mother's choice of occupation did little to calm her rage in promiscuity. However, at age 13, her sexual activity seemed to be centred around her peers, boys her own age or slightly older, 15, 16 maybe. But it was when she turned 14, things began to change. Melissa stopped attending school altogether. She avoided our regular visits, and on the odd occasions our workers managed to catch up with her, they reported startling changes in the girl. Her hair, her clothes, her shoes, and her attitude. She had money, asked Simons. Definitely, said Worthington. Lots of it. And this mystery man? Our striker, what can you tell me about him? Worthington shook his head. Nothing much. He was seen leaving the flat a couple of times. Tall, heavy set, early fifties, big scar on his face. One worker described him as scary. Simons noted the description. And you figure this guy was pimping Melissa? Worthington shrugged. We made an informed choice to remove the girl from the family home on the evidence we had. What if any influence this mystery man had over Melissa, we really can't say. But we suspected that she was working as a prostitute at that time. The sightings of the man and Melissa's newfound wealth seemed one coincidence too far. The caseworker closed the file in front of him, clicked his pen top and placed the item back in its right-angled position. And I can tell you this. Melissa Ward wasn't on her knees in a back alley earning ten quid a blow, either. If this guy was indeed working her, he was getting good money for her. Stryker stood in the sunshine on the pavement outside Worthington's office. The big man shaded his eyes with his hand. He was looking across the road, but spoke to Maureen at his side. You figure that this scar-faced guy was pimping Melissa? It's possible. Then it's possible he sold it to our murderers. Again, possible. Tentative, but possible. Stryker turned and locked eyes with Simons. You know the two lines of script found in the envelope? Maury nodded. You mean that when I was one thing? That's it. Well, it's the start of a poem called Six by a guy called A. A. Milne. Simons raised her brows. Other than the fact the guy wrote the Winnie the Pooh stories, that means nothing to me. It didn't to me either, but our D.C. Abbott thinks it means there are five more girls to come. Shit. My thoughts entirely. Maureen felt in her bag for her cigarettes, then thought better of it. You drink coffee, Stryker? I do so. Italian is my preferred cup. Nero's? Stryker nodded. The pair sat opposite each other in the American-owned chain on the corner of Market Street and Frygate. Stryker sipped his double espresso. Maureen stirred her mocha with her long spoon. Stryker examined the menu. Do you realize that there are 305 calories in that mug there, Simons? 20.8 grams of fat there, too. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, it's a feckin' meal. Maureen ran her tongue over her front teeth and shook her head. Oh, and how many calories in yours, then? Fourteen. And how do you know this shit? Because it's written in the menu here, so... Stryker dropped the card on the table. Anyways, you obviously no care for your poor body there, so we better get on with solving this case before you have a feckin' heart attack. What's your thinking so far? What about our newfound pimp? Maureen rolled her eyes and pulled out her notebook. She opened it and scanned her scribbles. A moment later she slapped the book closed and dropped it back in her cavernous bag. She rested her elbows on the table and looked Stryker in the eye. Have you any idea what it was like for that poor kid living with Ruby? Stryker couldn't even imagine. He shook his head. Well, I have. My mother was an alcoholic. I cooked, I washed, I ironed, I cleaned. I went to school exhausted most days. Then one day I came home and there was some big, fat, hairy bloke in my mother's bed. My old mum was sparko, pissed as the proverbial. 
I was about Melissa's age, just turned fifteen. Believe it or not, I was a skinny little thing back then. Anyway, I ran straight to the kitchen, as always, and started the tea. As I'm at the stove, hairy man comes in behind me, stark bollock naked, dick sticking out in front of him. Real proud of it, he was. Bet you ain't seen one like this before, he says. Why don't you touch it? Stryker was wide-eyed. What did you do? I grabbed the carving knife and went to cut his knob clean off. Feck! Maureen laughed down her nose. He ran off like a scolded cat, he did. She took a sip of her coffee and disappeared into another world for a second or two. When she returned, she said, I came home three weeks later to find me mum dead on the carpet. Paracetamol overdose. I'm sorry. Simons wrinkled her nose. Ancient history. But it does give me a small insight into what could have been going on in that flat. She tapped the table with a finger. I mean, let's just say that this scar-faced bloke, this pimp, was Ruby's lover for a time. He sees that Melissa is growing up, running wild, and with a bit of gentle persuasion and maybe a few quid, he persuades the child to have sex with him first. That's normally how it goes. And he starts to buy her a few expensive things. He treats her nice. He understands her. He grooms her. Then he suggests that she could make money having sex with his friends. At first she finds this exciting, and the money is more than she's ever dreamed of. Stryker pointed, but she gets herself taken in a care and Scarface loses easy access to her. Maureen cocked her head. Sounds about right. So how did she end up dotting in a house on the Callan with another pimp, Miguel Jimenez? Simons leaned in. You have to remember that Melissa was a broken individual. In all probability, she would have believed that this scar guy had feelings for her, maybe even viewed him as a father figure, as weird as that sounds. Once he dropped her, she needed that emotional contact to be replaced, and Jimenez was only too happy to do that. It's classic. So you think Scarface dropped her because she was in care? Maureen turned down the corners of her mouth. I've been involved in several child prostitution investigations, Stryker. And child prostitutes are just that. Children. Maybe, as you say, it was just that she was no longer easily available to our groomer. Maybe the guy's clientele liked them very young and... At fifteen and busty, Melissa didn't fit the bill anymore. Who knows? Stryker drained his espresso. And maybe because she was losing her value to the Scarface guy, he had one last very special client left for our Melissa. You mean our killers? The snuff movie makers? Stryker shrugged. Maureen shook her head. I've worked with sexual deviants most of my career, boss. I've seen some terrible things, but I've never seen anything even resembling a snuff film. Until recently, I would have said that they were an urban myth. There was an allegation that the Manson family was involved in making such films to record the murders back in the late sixties, but none were ever recovered. Maureen wiped foam from her mouth. However, we now have Peter Borgias. Stryker furrowed his brow, but stayed quiet. Maureen drained her coffee. Borgias is an Austrian who is currently on trial in Thailand, suspected of numerous crimes against children. The allegations include filming the torture and rape of girls as young as ten. Most of his victims' bodies have never been recovered, and the films are allegedly changing hands on the dark web for ten thousand dollars a time. I don't see money as the motive here, Simons. Maybe not for our rapist in the gimp mask, but what about the guy in charge of the camera? Stryker pursed his lips. It's possible the film was made for commercial reasons. But if that were the case, why send it to Ruby? Why not just circulate it to the sickos who'll pay ten grand to watch it and dump Melissa's body? I mean, come on, how many fifteen-year-old runaways have we on the books? We wouldn't even be looking for Melissa, let alone investigating her murder. He blew out his cheeks. They wanted us to know what they'd done. 
or someone else? Stryker stretched his massive frame. Maybe Bob can get some answers from this Miguel Jimenez dude. Maybe, said Simons, but I wouldn't hold your breath. Chapter 12 Will Garrett watched from a distance as Detective Bob Higgins stepped out of his CID car, rubbed his aching back, and reluctantly slipped his arms into his jacket. No doubt he too wanted a word with Miguel Jimenez. Garrett had already been to see the unfortunate pimp, and there was no way on God's green earth he would be talking to anyone. Garrett hadn't needed to threaten him either. His gun had remained firmly in his briefcase. Will smiled to himself as he watched Higgins walk towards the house, then slipped into his car and started the engine. One less pimp, one less problem. Bob's shirt was already stuck to his spine with sweat, and he looked up at the cloudless sky, hoping for a change in the weather. No chance. He stood outside the Jimenez house on Downing Street, and considered that if any of the modern-day Prime Ministers had ever been unfortunate enough to live on this particular street of the same name to the famous London landmark, they may have treated the poor a little differently. As with many of the houses on the development, the semi had been recently refurbished and looked tidy enough. Improving the houses, replacing the roof tiles, fitting double glazing was all well and good, thought Bob. However, improving some of the residents was quite another matter. As with many other housing estates in the land, there were good, honest, law-abiding people on Callan, just not enough of them. Parked outside the semi, two wheels on the footpath, was a shiny blue Subaru Impreza. Bob noted the registration and wiped sweat from his brow. Me, as I see. The burly detective strode down the path and rapped on the newly fitted plastic double-glazed door. Nothing. Bob peered through the front window. The television played on the wall above the fireplace. A sultry cup and a packet of cigarettes sat on the top of a small circular coffee table. Alongside the pack lay a bunch of keys. The fob bore the Subaru logo... Bob walked around the side of the property. The kitchen door was situated on the gable. Again, he knocked with no response. This time he tried the handle and the door opened. "'Police!' he shouted. "'Anyone home?' Bob stood in the small kitchen. It was as clean and tidy as the impreza parked out front. All the dishes had been put away, the work tops wiped clean. The room smelled vaguely of bleach. Bob stood and listened. He could hear the TV in the lounge, but nothing else. No running water, no shower tinkling, no bath running or toilet flushing. In bed, then? It wouldn't be the first time that the experienced detective had roused a suspect from his pit at four in the afternoon. But the neat and tidy home, the polished car, just didn't fit with an all-day sleeper. Bob opened the door that led into the tight hallway. What he saw stopped him in his tracks. He listened again for the sounds of another human being in the house, heard nothing, checked where he was standing, stepped back the way he'd come and opened his phone. Hi, sir. Uh, oh, I mean, Stryker. Are you still with Maureen? Just pulling into the nick now, Bob. What's up? Bob swallowed. Oh, I reckon you should pick up Fliss Abbott, boss, and the three of you get over here to Jimenez's gaff. Call CSI too, eh? You found another girl there, Bob? No, boss. But I found Miguel Jimenez. Much to Stryker's annoyance, it took him and his team 40 minutes to collect four sets of forensic coveralls from the stores and drive to Jimenez's house. By the time they arrived, uniformed officers had set up an outer cordon on the premises. One stood at the front gate with a clipboard, registering anyone who wished entry. Phil Grover, the police surgeon, sat in his car across the street eating a sandwich and chatting to Bob Higgins. CSI were kitting up on the drive. The moment Bob saw Stryker, he stopped his conversation and walked over. "'You got a suit for me, boss?' he asked. 
Bag in the boot, he said. What do we got? Bob found the package he wanted, tore it open, and began to pull on his coveralls. Jimenez is hanging from a noose tied to his banister. Suicide? Higgins found his paper hat, checked he had it the right way round, and stretched it over his bald head. Doc says no, and it don't feel right to me either, boss. Honest, he doesn't. Anyway, Phil is waiting to walk us through it. Stryker nodded and wandered over to where the police surgeon was finishing his sandwich. Grover was a Liverpudlian, a scouser through and through, with a thick accent that belied his intelligence and expertise as a medical examiner. Right there, la, offered Grover, wiping his hands before offering to shake. Stryker almost smiled. Not bad there, so, Phil. How's the healing business? Grover had known Stryker since his early days on CID. He knew just how awkward he could be. He also knew just how good he was at his job. Both men respected each other, and it showed. "'I lose them all in the end, Ewan,' said Grover. "'It's just some last longer than others.' Stryker nodded ruefully before gesturing towards the house. "'Aye, I suppose that's right. And what do we have here, Doc?' Grover pulled on a new set of latex gloves and strolled towards the drive. Asphyxiophilia, or autoerotic asphyxia, an act committed by a person to themselves. Colloquially, a person engaging in the activity sometimes called a gasper. So, uh, suicide? Not quite. The gasper cuts off the oxygen-rich blood from the heart to the brain by some form of strangulation or asphyxiation. In Mr. Jimenez's case, a noose. The sudden loss of oxygen to the brain and the accumulation of carbon dioxide can increase feelings of giddiness and pleasure, all of which will heighten masturbatory sensations. Stryker was incredulous. He was masturbating with a noose around his neck? Allah, Michael Hutchins and David Carradine, if you believe the tabloids. Grover tapped both temples with his forefingers. You see... When the brain is deprived of oxygen, it induces a lucid, semi-hallucinogenic state called hypoxia. Combined with orgasm, the rush is said to be no less powerful than cocaine and just as addictive. The pair reached the back door. I'll stick to endorphins and exercise, said Stryker. Stryker, Dr. Phil Grover, Simons, Higgins and Abbott checked each other over before entry. No one wanted stray bits of hair or any other contaminants at the scene. Just before each entered, they pulled on paper overshoes. Moments later, the five filed into the hallway where the corpse of Miguel Jimenez dangled from what appeared to be a realistic hangman's noose. Jimenez was naked from the waist down. On the floor at his feet were several pornographic magazines with their pages open to display his preferred shots. Begin to his BDSM muttered Simons, glancing at the content. Not unusual, offered Phil Grover. Gaspers and gimp masks seem to go hand in hand. The police surgeon gazed upward. As you can see, the rope he used had been slung over the banister on the landing and then secured to the angled banister serving the stairs below. He was in a slip knot. Once the forensic guys cut him down, they'll confirm for certain, but I reckon just one tug on that loose end. He pointed... Their dangling between the ninth and tenth spindles would have simply dropped Miguel down safely to the floor. And of course that was his intention, said Fliss Abbott. Get himself off, then reach over and release the rope. In one, offered Grover. So why didn't he? asked Simons. I mean, how could he have got it so wrong? Not just him, said Abbott, treading the stairs so that she had the same view of the hallway as the deceased. Over two hundred a year die this way in the States. Phil Grover examined Jimenez's right hand, pulling a magnifier from his coveralls to get a closer look. You were right there, young lady, he said, then noticing something of interest to him, added, Hmm, now that is odd. Stryker was desperate to know what Grover was thinking, but had worked with him long enough to know not to interrupt when he was in full flow. The doc took a pen from his pocket, lifted the corpse's penis slightly, and used his magnifier again. Ha! Yes! Stryker thought he would burst. Ah, oh, come on, Phil, for feck's sake! 
Grover ignored Stryker's plea and carefully grabbed Jimenez by his right wrist. Then he slowly extended the dead man's arm towards the slipknot. He could easily reach, blurted Maureen Simons. Grover turned, offered Simons a smile, and in the thickest scouse said, Not so simple when you're on the vinegar stroke, though, eh? Maureen gave the dock a thunderous stare. Let me guess, you and Stryker went to the same charm school? The doc nodded. We have the same sense of humour, detective. Well, Jimmy Tarbuck, you ain't, she spat, turning on her heels. I'm going outside, so you two can talk about wanking in peace. There was an awkward silence as Maureen shuffled out of the house. Stryker shrugged. It's been a long day, I think she needs a fag, that or a food. I'm never good when I'm hungry myself. Come on, we can talk outside. Let's leave the CSI boys to get on with it. The team exited to find Maureen spending equal time pulling on her embassy and picking at her nails. The team stood in a circle on the driveway, Stryker ensuring he was furthest away from the smoking detective. He'd lost his father to lung cancer, who had never smoked a day in his life and had no desire to follow in his footsteps. Phil Grover removed his paper hat to reveal a shock of jet black hair that was the closest thing to a mullet Maureen Simons had seen since she'd watched Staying Alive on the box. She finished her fag and flicked the stub into the street. I hope you bought your barber a retirement gift, she offered with a thin smile. Must have been cutting hair since Kevin Keegan played for your team. Phil was about to make a stinging retort, but Stryker was in first. We're not here to squabble. We're here to find out what happened to the guy hanging from that feckin' rope in there. Understood? The pair looked suitably sheepish. Phil Grover took a deep breath and pulled out a notebook. Okay, the deceased is believed to be Miguel Peter Jimenez, 22 years, born here in Preston. English mother, Spanish father. I arrived at the scene at 16.40 hours and pronounced life extinct in the presence of D.C. Bob Higgins whose death is presumed asphyxiation by strangulation. But, of course, we'll need the PM to confirm that. My initial observations were that the deceased had been partaking in a practice known as autoerotic asphyxia, where the party stimulates themselves whilst depriving the brain of oxygen. However, this is a very dangerous sex game to play, and things can go wrong, and often do go wrong. As in this case, offered Bob Higgins. Grover shrugged. I'm not so sure, Bob. If Jimenez had indeed been desperate for a little autoerotic fun this afternoon, the setup just doesn't work for me. Fliss Abbott was in. Me either, Doc. OK, the rope, the noose, the slipknot is all textbook. And finding the body of the asphyxiophilic half naked and with the pornographic material strewn about is also straight out of the manual. But bodies found at the scene of an accidental autoerotic death often show evidence of other paraphilic activities, such as fetishistic cross-dressing or sadomasochism. Grover raised his eyebrows. You know a little about this subject, then, Detective... Um, Abbott? Fliss Abbott. And, and yes, I do. I studied the sexual deviances of serial killers when I worked in the States. Autoerotic deaths form part of one of my theses. The doc was impressed. And have you any other observations for us, Miss Abbott? Fliss nodded. Yes, I'll bet the only fetishistic pornography we find in that house are the magazines laid at our victims' feet, and they looked unused and brand new to me. Also, when you stand on the stairs at head height to the victim, they can't be seen. What was the point in those mags being there if Jimenez couldn't see them? Also, gaspers meticulously plan these events, often building up to them for weeks. Our victim wouldn't just get up from watching Jeremy Kyle, mid brew and fag, and think, I know, I'll just hang myself from the banister. Grover looked at Stryker. She's good, mate, he said with a smile. Stryker grunted. We'll see. There's more to being a detective than studying things in a book dock. You got any more for us? Grover shook his head and gave a somewhat deflated Fliss Abbott a knowing wink. Well, you all saw that Jimenez could have reached that slipknot with ease. Now, that is not to say that failing to save himself in itself is suspicious. 
Grover looked over to the now calm Maureen Simons. Grabbing at something to save your life when you're semi-conscious isn't that fucking easy. After all, that's why these guys are regularly found dead with the pants down. However, Grover began to unzip his coveralls. If that was simply the case, I would have expected panic to set in. I would have expected to see scratches on the banister as our boy thrashed around, desperate to grab the rope. That and paint under his nails as he missed his target. Then I'd expect torn flesh at his throat as he clawed at the noose in his final throws. And, offered Stryker. Grover shook his head. None of the above. And he hadn't ejaculated either, had he? Stated Abbott, her confidence returning. Two points to the scholar, said Grover. Again, the PM will confirm, but I'd say ninety per cent no. So his hands were tied, asked Bob. Grover shrugged. Or oh, held by someone very strong indeed. Stryker scratched his head. How long had he been dead, Phil? I would hazard less than six hours. I'd say Bobby had just missed a very important lunchtime visitor. Stryker nodded. Right, well, let's get the house-to-house teams going. Maybe a nosy neighbour saw something. Bob, Maureen, Fliss, let's get back to the Nick. We have a video to watch. Chapter 13 The team sat around in their tiny office, each detective sipping coffee and dreading what was to come. Okay, said Stryker, before we review the film, let's see what we have, okay? Nods all around. He tapped a growing file on his desk. According to social services, Melissa Ward was officially taken into care of the local authority because she had been regularly truanting. However, around that same period, case workers reported a tall, well-built white male in his fifties visiting the family home. He had a distinctive scar on his face. Now, the evidence is tenuous and circumstantial, but... Social workers also reported changes in Melissa's behaviour at this time and suspected that she was working as a child prostitute. Question one, was this Scarface pimping the girl? Either way, she was removed to Car Street Lodge, away from Ruby and our unidentified man. If this man was indeed selling Melissa with Mum's approval, that was going to make life difficult for him. That said, Car Street is not secure accommodation, and as we know, the girl simply ran away at every opportunity. She did not, however, run back to her mother or Scarface. Take what you will from that. Question two. Had Scarface grown tired of the girl, or the other way round? Whatever the reason, she ran into the dubious arms of Miguel Jimenez, local pimp and drug dealer also now suspiciously deceased. The uniform that found Melissa Ward at Jimenez's house back in May reported the girl already had all the signs of substance abuse, namely crack cocaine. Now, if our man Scarface was indeed pimping underage, fresh-faced girls to his clients, as Detective Simons here suggests, he would be rather pissed at losing one of his prime girls to Jimenez, who preferred his girls street-walking and stoned. So, my third question. Is Scarface involved in the murder of Melissa Ward? And is that why Miguel Jimenez is dead? Well, that's four questions, said Maureen Simons. Glad you're keeping count, Detective, said Stryker. He turned in his seat and lifted a separate file from his desk. We've also received the forensics report back on the video footage. The boffins at HQ believe the film to be heavily edited. What we are about to watch lasts ten minutes and eleven seconds. However, they believe the actual filming took place over an extended period. They know this to be the case, as the stills included in the package were digitally produced from the video itself, and our killers have not gone to the trouble of removing the digital time stamp from the files. Sloppy, offered Maureen Simons. "'Showing off,' muttered Fliss Abbott. "'Killers? Plural?' asked Higgins. "'You sure are that now, then, boss?' Stryker pressed on. 
I'll come to that, Bob. Now, the first still was taken 1907 hours, Tuesday night, whereas the last shot showing Melissa deceased was 0620 hours, Wednesday. The video file was uploaded to the memory stick 1540 hours, Thursday. He dropped the papers on the desk, his voice unable to hide a hint of sorrow. Everything posted to Mum, Friday. Stryker pulled himself from his seat, sat on the end of his desk and pushed his hands in the pockets of his jeans. The film was produced using five fixed cameras all running simultaneously. Each of the cameras had pan and tilt zoom capabilities and were controlled remotely from an unknown location by a second perpetrator. So yes, Bob, we are certain we have two killers. The footage recorded by each camera was then edited together to make the film and produce the stills. Forensics say whoever did the job used a professional program and knew what they were doing. Fliss nodded. So the cameraman could have been anywhere, not in the same building? It's possible, said Stryker, but I think that's unlikely. I reckon our camera operator is the brains behind the operation. The location used has been prepared especially for the murders and... I bet the recording and editing equipment is very close to the scene itself. It would be too risky to use a web-based control system. He wouldn't chance leaving a digital fingerprint for us to trace. No, I reckon the system is hardwired into a room just off the dungeon. You think this Scarface could be our cameraman? Asked Bob. Stryker shrugged. It's possible. If he's a pimp making money out of underage girls, who's to say he wouldn't make and sell snuff movies on the dark web for ten grand a time? He could have been working the cameras and directing Gimp Mask Boy, said Maureen, telling him what to do to the poor kid next. The sick fuck, spat Higgins. One killer controlling the other, offered Abbott, locking her fingers together, stretching her hands above her head, arching her back. Classic, really, but you haven't mentioned the note, boss. Ah, yeah, the infamous note, offered Stryker. The little kid's poem I was coming to that. It is creepy, said Bob Higgins, especially in the context it was sent. Just the first two lines, like. Agreed, said Stryker. But if D.C. Abbott is correct and there are five more girls to come, we haven't just got two killers on our hands, but two serial killers working in concert. How rare is that? Maureen Simons leaned forward on her elbows and made a pyramid with her fingers. Hindley and Brady, Fred and Rosemary. Stryker shook his head. I get that, yeah, but they were romantically connected and I just don't see that here. But there have been plenty of platonic pairs of serial killers, boss, said Phyllis Abbott, pushing the tails of her blouse back into her skirt, post-stretch. Uh, Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris, a.k.a. the Toolbox Killers. Kidnapped, raped, tortured and killed five teenage girls in California. Adelfina and Maria de Jesus Gonzalez set the record for the most prolific murder partnership. The two sisters ran a brothel in Mexico and murdered 90 women. Closer to home, in the 1980s, friends John Duffy and David Mulcahy raped and murdered multiple women near British railway stations and were dubbed the railway killers. I could go on. Stryker couldn't help but be impressed by Abbott's depth of knowledge. Okay, he said, you win. So let's say we run with your synopsis. Are our killers sending notes and leaving clues because they secretly want to be caught? Is that it? Fliss shook her head. No, boss. It's a myth that serial killers want to be caught. Serial offenders may suffer some form of guilt complex after having committed a murder, but this quickly pales away. They need to satisfy their addiction to feed their fantasy. They enjoy what they're doing too much to want to get caught. However, some are so confident they believe they are untouchable and leave clues, even calling cards. The only weird thing about this poem is the killers appear to suggest exactly how many victims there will be. That I've never seen before and doesn't fit a serial killer's profile. Stryker examined the young detective. She was indeed bright. He flicked through the papers on his desk until he found the complete poem. He lay it in front of him and began to read. Feeling the first electrical pulses begin to creep up his spine, 
He waited for the explosion of energy in his skull. Closing his eyes, he rested his hand on the sheet of paper and let his head fall, allowing the surge of dynamism to take charge of his senses. Seconds later he looked up, finding the gaze of Felicity Abbott. His voice no more than a whisper. Jesus, Mary and Joseph. It might not fit any profile, but I think you're right. Stryker scanned his meagre, tired-looking crew. He pushed a small red memory stick into the team's computer tower, and the atmosphere in the tight confines of the office became visibly tense. Foreboding filled the small room. All knew what was to come. His finger hovered over the space bar on the keyboard, aware that one simple press would send the desktop projector flickering into life and fill the room with a level of violence no one on the team had ever witnessed before. He pulled his hand away a moment and eyed his people again. All sat tapping fingers, scratching chins, biting nails. We, he began, we've all seen our fair share of shit, heard some sick stuff too, but we're normally there after the fact, there to pick through the blood and the bone. But this, what we are about to watch now, is going to be disturbing to us all. He nodded towards D.C. Higgins. Bob, I'm aware you have a girl the same age as Melissa and... This will be tough for you. If you feel the need to leave us at any point, there ain't anyone in this room would hold that against you. Okay? I'll be fine, boss, said Bob, rubbing his face with his palms. The fact was, no one would be fine. And Stryker knew it. He pressed the button. Fliss Abbott, Maureen Simons, Bob Higgins and Stryker himself would never be the same again. Chapter 14 The sun was setting and the evening air chilled Maureen Simons as she stood in the smoking shelter. Taking a long pull on her third cigarette, she shivered, and even though her tears had dried, she mechanically wiped her eyes with the back of her hand for the umpteenth time. Just minutes into the film, Bob Higgins had been sick, thrown his guts into a waste paper basket. But he'd watched it. He'd watched it all. Watched the viciousness, the degradation, the humiliation, the murder of a child. Fliss Abbott had surprised Maureen. After all, what was she? Twenty-five, twenty-six, maybe? The young DC had sat emotionless, scribbling notes on a pad the way Maureen had seen pathologists do when slicing into a body. Detached, impassive. Stryker remained silent throughout, brooding, fists clenched, teeth gritted. Maureen thought he may smash the screen to pieces before the end. But he had not. The moment the film had finished, he had leapt up, switched off the unit, turned to the team and dismissed them all for the day. Back at seven in the morning, he'd said. Get some rest, he'd said. Fat chance. Maureen didn't think she would ever sleep again. She didn't think she would ever be able to rid herself of Melissa Ward's cries for help. Her pleas for mercy. That sound. That awful, pathetic begging. My God, why ever rid myself of that sound? Despite Melissa's sobs and cries, there had been no clemency, no compassion, no quarter given. Whoever was behind that rubber mask was no more than an animal, and whoever had driven him, directed him so they could obtain those pictures, was even worse. You okay there now? The voice made her jump. She'd been so far removed from reality she hadn't noticed Stryker's presence. She nodded and smoked some more. How's Bob? He called his kids then, went to a bar. Not surprising. No. You got any family, Striker? All gone. Maureen cocked her head. So, no one special? Nope. I got cats. 
nice. I couldn't cope with the hair myself. Maureen smiled and stubbed out her fag. A true loner, then. I don't need the responsibility. Simons pulled out another cigarette, tapped the end of the pack and looked up into Stryker's face. Your fear of responsibility, it wouldn't be anything to do with the Westland kid, would it? You know about that, then, so? I heard, yeah. Stryker turned his face away and looked skyward. He was a really good lad. Good cop, too. I dragged him along on that job, chasing a terrorist with no backup. Even the big bosses thought we were mad. He survived all that, and then a little piece of shit like Barry Williams comes along with his ideas of white supremacy and plants a bomb on a building site. Shit happened, Stryker. And then you die, he said, gesturing towards Maureen's cigarette. She looked at the unlit smoke, thought for a moment, and threw it into the fire bucket. You never give up, do you, Stryker? He shook his head. Never. And I won't give up till I catch these fuckers, Maureen. I believe you, Stryker, she said. I believe you. Stryker climbed the stairs to the team office and heard raised voices ahead. As he reached his goal, to his surprise, Fliss Abbott was standing at the door. She held it half open, face pale, a slim body blocking entry to none other than DCI Alan Blunt. Blunt was red-faced and unsteady. He'd obviously been drinking. "'What the fuck is this about, Sergeant?' he barked, pointing at the newly fitted lock. "'Privacy,' said Stryker. "'Fucking privacy!' sneered Blunt. "'Don't take the piss, son. "'I'm the senior detective in this nick, "'and you can't go around fitting door locks to offices without my say-so.' "'Well, I have done,' said Stryker flatly. "'He nodded towards Fliss Abbott. "'And I don't care for people who try to bully my detectives.' "'I'm okay, boss,' said Abbott quietly. "'I told him your orders. "'He's a bit pissed, it's all.' "'Blunt staggered slightly and snorted his derision.' I'll fucking do as I please, darling, and some little split ass won't stop me. He pointed at the doorway. If I want to go in there and see how things are progressing with little Melissa, I fucking will. The instant Blunt spoke Melissa's name, Stryker's head filled with static. Millions of minuscule pieces of cerebral information poured into his skull, flashing across his eyes like binary code on a screen. He stepped forward and grabbed Blunt by his jacket lapels. The chief inspector was a little under six feet, around fifteen and a half stone. Stryker lifted him up like a rag doll and slammed him into the wall. Now, chief inspector, he hissed, his face inches from Blunt's. I'm curious as to how you've obtained the name of our victim there. I don't recall mentioning it to you. Stryker's head was clearing. Whatever had been going on in his brain had settled on one very pertinent fact. His sharp blue eyes bore into the DCI. I think you know her name because you knew the wee girl, didn't you? Blunt struggled violently, face contorted with rage. He kicked out at Stryker who merely twisted his body and leaned into Blunt, his massive frame squashing the bloated detective and knocking the wind from his lungs. "'I'll have your job for this, you paddy bastard!' panted Blunt, doing his best to swing punches into Stryker's kidneys between words. Stryker had heard enough, dropped Blunt back on his feet, drew back a massive tattooed arm, and delivered a ferocious slap to the senior detective's face. Phyllis Abbott winced as she heard the terrific blow connect with Blunt's jowls. "'That's got to hurt,' she said under her breath. Blunt reeled from the blow. His head swam. He staggered backwards until he reached the wall where he steadied himself, hands on knees, blowing hard. He touched the side of his face where Stryker had made contact, examined his fingers for blood, but found none. Finally, he raised his head and locked eyes with his foe. I want your resignation on Errol Graham's desk within the hour, Stryker, or God help me, I'll have you locked up for assault. I didn't see any assault, said Fliss Abbott, head cocked, wry smile. I saw you fall into that doorframe there, half-pissed. 
Blunt flashed a look in Abbott's direction, then turned to Stryker, who shrugged his massive shoulders. You heard what the lady said, Chief. Maybe you need to take more water with it. Blunt straightened himself and sneered. You think you're clever, eh, Stryker? Graham's blue-eyed boy. Well, you're finished, son. He twisted his head towards D.C. Abbott. And you go. I'll see to it you're issuing pack and tickets before the week is out. Stryker moved with terrific speed for such a big man. His right arm flashed forward, his forefinger and thumb expertly finding Blunt's larynx. The DCI rapidly began to fight for breath as Stryker applied just enough pressure to cut off his supply. Blunt feebly pawed at Stryker's hand, his mouth open, eyes wide. "'There's something wrong about you, Blunt,' said Stryker quietly. "'Something very wrong.' He increased the pressure slightly. The chief's legs began to buckle. And I intend to find out exactly what that is. He released the DCI, who fell to his knees, gasping for breath. And if you want to mention to DCS Graham that you have been snooping around this investigation without permission, I will gladly join you in that meeting. Now, he said, turning to Fliss Abbott, you got a car detective? She nodded. Good. He said, I'm too tired to run home tonight. You can give me a lift. Close the office door, eh? He looked down at the choking senior detective. Make sure it's locked. Not too far out of your way there now, is it, Abbott? Asked Stryker. Fliss drove her mini steadily out of the city towards the motorway. And not at all, boss. In fact, I think we're pretty much neighbours. You have a house on Buckshaw? Well, not a house too rich for my taste, but a flat, yes. Stryker fell silent for a moment, then turned in his seat. You were very professional today, Abbott. That was a tough one, watching that video. Felicity Abbott was twenty-six, with a petite figure and sharp features. Her best features were her expressive eyes. Some would have called her geeky, yet she had something attractive about her that Stryker couldn't quite put his finger on. I spent almost two years studying serial killers, she said. I've seen quite a few sick videos in my time. She glanced over to Stryker. Never seen someone take a life on film, though. Me either. Abbott nodded. You don't drink, do you, Stryker? Never touch a drop. Abbott indicated to turn, bit her lip, shot her boss a knowing look and took a chance. You won't mind if I have one, though, will you? Stryker walked from the bar, carrying Abbott's jack and diet and his bottle of water. He went to sit in one of the trendy curved seats opposite the young female detective, found they were too small for him to fit into, and opted for the bench. "'Bet you're a bundle of laughs to sit next to on a long haul,' said Abbott, a cheeky grin on her face. "'I buy two seats,' he said. "'Really?' Stryker scratched at his beard with both massive hands and raised his brows. "'No. Are you always so naive?' Abbott sipped her jack and smiled. It's been said before. But hey, you must be, what, ninety, twenty stone? I'm two eighty on a good day. I've always been a big guy, you know. I was two hundred pounds by the time I was fifteen. The waiter brought over cutlery and late in front of Stryker. He checked it for cleanliness, nodded his satisfaction and turned to Abbott. You sure you don't want anything? Abbott picked up her glass. "'This is just fine for me. Too late to eat now.' "'Never too late,' said Stryker, unwrapping his napkin. "'What did you order?' asked Fliss. "'Chicken.' "'With?' "'More chicken.' "'At that the waiter returned with a full roast fowl on a large oval plate. "'You weren't joking there, Stryker,' said Fliss. "'Carbs are the enemy of man,' he offered, "'removing the skin from the bird before tearing into it. And fat is its rival. Fliss watched the striker devour the last of the meat on his plate. I've never seen anyone eat so much so quickly, she said. The detective sergeant wiped his hands and mouth with his napkin. I feel better now, he said. Good, smiled Fliss. Then you won't mind if I ask you about your... 
your episodes. Episodes? Oh, come on, Striker. Most wouldn't notice, but to me it was obvious. It was? Yes, you had one as you read the A.A. Milne poem and another one outside the office when D.C.I. Blunt mentioned Melissa's name. Ah, those moments. Moments? Is that what you call them? That's what my mother called them sometimes. I've seen it before. Seen what? In precognitives. Hey, come on, Abbott, this is all getting a bit Steven Spielberg here. I'm not making prophecies. That would be a bollocks. No, Stryker, it isn't. And maybe you can't see the future. But what I want to know is what do you see? Look, the thing is, where I trained in the States in Quantico, they don't dismiss anything that may help them solve a crime. They embrace it. You train with the FBI? Uh, sort of, but never mind that now. Uh, look, when you have these, these moments of yours, how do you feel? Like my head will burst. Anxious? Sometimes. And is it just people that set these moments off? Stryker shook his head. Not always. Sometimes it's objects. Sometimes I just feel... I don't know. I can't explain. My pa said it was intuition. My mom called it a gift. Up until recently, they were just like feelings, hunches. Then after I resigned, they changed. They became more intense. They take over my head. I don't know how to explain it. It's just like... You ever seen the film The Matrix? Yes, of course. Well, you know when all that green code is running down the screen? Millions of pieces of information. It's like that. And my head clears and I'm left with a single thought. And that thought is always right? Mostly. When you resigned, it was because of the Westland thing, right? Mm, not just because of Tag, but he was a big part of it, yeah. And your episodes grew in strength and intensity after that. I prefer not to link the two. But yeah, Abbott finished her drink. And your second episode today, the one with the chief inspector. What did that tell you about DCI Blunt? Stryker's eyes flashed. I think he's connected to the murder of Melissa Ward. Chapter 15 Fliss Abbott arrived at the Nick just after 0600 hours to find Stryker already at his desk and the video running. Early bird, she offered. Time is precious, said Stryker, pressing pause. I hit the gym just before five. There's a 24-hour place on Moss Side Industrial Park. Does the job clears the head. You okay? Fliss nodded, shook off her jacket and draped it over the back of her chair. Couldn't sleep. Figured I may as well be here. Did you run in again? Stryker grimaced. HQ have finally found me a car that hasn't been smoked in. They delivered it last night. Fliss raised her eyebrows. Celebrity has its pluses. Stryker pointed at his broken nose. It's my charm and good looks. Fliss sat, pulled out her notepad and hit play again. Stryker had been watching with the sound down. She went to raise the volume, but he held up a hand. I don't need to hear that again, Fliss. Abbott shrugged. What stands out to you, boss? You know, what is the first thing you noticed about this video? Stryker opened the cover of his iPad. Melissa is stoned. Fliss nodded. I agree. Even though we don't see her before she's restrained, there must have been a level of compliance to get her into that sex swing contraption. Stryker scrolled. Widely available on the internet for £250 with free postage and discreet packaging, would you believe? As are most of the sex toys we see our killer using. But yeah... I agree. He probably gave her something before the camera started rolling to make her easier to control. What else? asked Fliss. She must have been held somewhere before the filming started, said Stryker. I agree. But my question is, how long had they held her? Stryker stood. 
I'm going to get Bob and Maureen on that today. Get them to pay a visit to Car Street Lodge. Speak to the other girls that are living there. Then tonight, you and I are going to have a drive around the St. Matthews area. Speak to the street walkers. One way or another, I'd like a last confirmed sighting of Melissa by the end of play today. Makes sense. Stryker pulled two small sachets from his inside pocket. Coffee? Mmm, yes, please. He walked over to the makeshift kitchen area, which consisted of a small table, four cups, a travel kettle, a bag of sugar and a carton of long-life milk. Fridge would be nice, he said, emptying the contents of one pack into a cup. So would another ten detectives, offered Fliss, rewinding the video and watching one specific section over. Not gonna happen, said Stryker. You know why that is? I have a mind. And? Sugar? he asked, waving a mug. Fliss shook her head, realising she was wasting her time pressing Stryker further. Have you seen this? Abbott put the same section of footage on a loop. I didn't notice with the sound plate, but our killer here stops for a second as if he'd been interrupted. See, just there. You think our second perp walks in the room, out of shot? She pursed her lips. No, see, our rapist reacts to hearing something, but Melissa doesn't move or look around. Stryker sat and pushed Abbott's coffee across the desk. Let the tape run now, he said, then nodding slowly. Yeah, there, he's heard something. He changes tack, too, he... Stops what he's doing and goes to collect the plastic bag, the one he eventually uses to suffocate the poor kid. He's taken direction from our other killer, said Fliss. I'd say he has an earpiece kit under that hood. Stryker paused the film again. Talking of the hood, the mask, whatever you want to call it. Again, available online. I mean, feck, you can even buy them on eBay. Do you think that is there purely to hide his face and hair, rather than any sexual or fetishist reason? Abbott shrugged. Possibly both. It would hide the earpiece, too. Okay, said Stryker. So what about the weightlifting gloves? Is that a fetish or simply protection? Fliss looked at her notes. What I wrote down last night was this. Subject is more concerned about protecting his knuckles from damage than he is about leaving fingerprints or DNA. I agree, said Stryker. Over the course of the attack, he dishes out so much physical punishment around Melissa's head, face and body that without the protection of the gloves, his knuckles would be bruised, maybe even cut. Fliss turned the pages of her pad. So our rapist works out? Stryker let out a groan. Do I need a profiler to tell me that, Abbott? Yes, he does, and he's wearing Everlast fingerless training gloves. Not expensive, but not the cheapest either. But he doesn't train professionally, maybe not even in a gym. Stryker walked to the screen and pointed at the killer's back and shoulders. See these groups of muscles here? These are the pull muscles. They work to pull resistance towards the body. The back comprises rhomboid and latissimus muscles, which are supported by the biceps. To work these effectively, you must use pull-down exercises using cable pulleys, not something you would usually have in a home gym. There is no doubt this guy works his body hard, but he has no guidance, hence no real definition in his back. Fliss nodded. Okay, so you are the expert on lifting heavy things? but I still believe the reason for the gloves is that our perp has a job where his hands are visible to the general public. If I put my profiler's hat on here, I'd suggest we have a boy who has enjoyed inflicting pain all his life. He has to be in the system somewhere, either criminal, mental health, or both. This is not the first time he has hurt someone. He may not have killed before, but he's been a danger to others all his born days. Obviously a misogynist, a damaged individual who has never had a loving or real physical relationship with a woman, not even his mother. I'm not saying he hasn't got a high IQ, but he could well be on the spectrum. I would bet on a service industry job. He certainly doesn't dig holes in the road where his hands will be bruised and cut as a matter of course. 
She flicked through her pad again and began to scribble. Yes, service industry, she muttered. But not something that would bring him into contact with young people, especially girls where his weirdness would be cause for concern. Something where he could hide his strange behaviour. Old people's home, suggested Stryker. Good call, said Flit. Stryker lifted his arms out to his sides, palms up. OK, but tell me this, then. If he's so unconcerned about leaving DNA or prints lying around, why is he wearing a condom? Fliss took a long drink of her brew, then wiped her mouth with the back of her hand. To protect himself, that's why. You see, he knew. He knew Melissa was a prostitute. I would hazard that it is one of the reasons she's been chosen. Maybe his mother was a working girl? She pointed. But whatever the reason for Melissa being targeted, that bastard is more worried about catching an STD than being caught by us. Stryker rubbed the top of his head with his palm, leaned in close to the screen and spoke to the still picture. Yes, son, that's just it, eh? You knew she was a working girl, because you chose her. You picked her up from the street, didn't you? What did you tell her, eh? Come back to mine for a party? Did you offer a few extra quid to film her? Yes, you did, didn't you? You drove the streets, picked her up in your car, took her to your dungeon, drugged her, trussed her up like a turkey at Thanksgiving, and murdered her. Fliss finished her cup. I'm not sure about that, boss. About what? That he chose her. Go on. I mean, he may well have picked her up from the street, but I think the guy behind the camera chose her. Why? I think he chose her because she was Ruby Ward's daughter. Bob Higgins and Maureen Simons arrived together on the stroke of seven. Both looked tired and drawn. Fliss made them coffee whilst Stryker went through the ever-growing paper file, scanning documents into the force's homes system and creating the day's actions for the team. We could do with a trained operator for that job, boss, said Bob, placing his cup next to the computer monitor. I know my way around it, countered Stryker. I have a love of computers. It's a time it takes, though, said Maureen, dropping her bag by her desk wearily. The fact is, if Fliss is right and there are five more victims to come, we just won't be able to manage with such a small team. Stryker's eyes were sharp and demanding. We'll just have to make sure we catch these buggers before they can complete their plan then, eh? He rapped the desk with his knuckles. We need to be wide awake on this one, guys. He pointed at Maureen and Bob in turn. I'd say you both had a drink or three last night. Now so. And I'm not suggesting for a moment you take the pledge or such like. But we all need to be fresh and switched on every minute of every day until this is over. I realize yesterday was hard. But we have to be professional. Bob nodded and looked at Stryker from under heavy lids. I did have a few last night, boss. What happened again? OK, said Stryker. Fair enough. However, I need you and Maureen to read the log now. See what Fliss and I have added this morning, just so you're up to date. Then, Bob, you get over to Car Street Lodge, preferably before the kids leave for school, and see who saw Melissa last. Did she have friends there? Anyone she confided in? Any mention of the Scarface man? You know the script. He turned. Maureen, you nip to Avenham House and have another word with Ruby. I've been watching the film through this morning, and one thing struck me. Melissa isn't wearing anything. Not one for stating the obvious, are you, boss? Offered Maureen, sipping her brew. Stryker screwed up his face. What I mean, detective, is that she isn't wearing jewellery of any kind. Come on, how many fifteen-year-old girls do you know who would go out without a single piece of bling? Ask Mom what she would normally wear day to day, okay? Maureen nodded. Stryker stood and pulled on his jacket. 
When you've both done these wee jobs, get on to HQ, will you, and chase the feckin' fingerprint boys for anything on the package or contents. Also, find out if we have a handwriting analyst on our books. If so, what kind of person wrote the feckin' note? Left-handed, right-handed, male, female, young, old? Fliss, I want you to get to work on that local sex offenders list. You should have that through by now. If not, I want to know why not. I want you to look at anyone who fits our rapist description. Male, white, between 25 and 35, living within 50 miles. Check the antecedents, arrest history, convicted or not. Then see who you think would fit the profile you're building. That will take some time, said Fliss. Stryker checked his Amiga, then eyed the young detective. I'll expect a list of probable suspects before we go out curb-crawling tonight. Fliss took a deep breath and opened her email to look for the data file. Yes, boss, she sighed. Right, offered Stryker. I'm off to meet Phil Grover at the Royal Preston Hospital. It's Miguel Jimenez's PM this morning, so I'll catch you all back here, let's say, 1,200 hours latest. And I'll treat you all to lunch. Chapter 16 Lucy Stevenson had showered and changed into her school uniform. Then, as usual, she traipsed downstairs to eat breakfast with her little brother Sam, her mum Linda, and her dad Brian. The family always ate breakfast at the table. It was a ritual her dad demanded. The most important meal of the day deserves to be eaten together, he would say. Brian Stevenson worked nights at Leyland Trucks and was always home and awake when Lucy rose. Her mum Linda worked three afternoons a week in the local sandwich shop. She'd been forced to leave her full-time role as a clerical assistant, when, much to everyone's surprise, Sam had been conceived a full eleven years after her daughter. This morning, as every weekday morning, Sam was struggling bravely with his cocoa pops. Lucy did her best to avoid the chocolate milk splashing in all directions whilst eating her muesli. Brian tucked into his poached eggs, and Linda munched on her toast. A happy family enjoying breakfast. Henry checked his watch. He dared not be late for work again. He dared not incur the wrath of Mr. Pitt. More importantly, the anger of the doctor. He decided that Lucy would have to leave her house just before eight, and that she would almost certainly get the bus to school, using the stop opposite from where he stood. That gave him just enough time to catch a glimpse of her, before he drove his own car to work for an eight-thirty start. Clever boy, Henry. The day had already begun to warm its bones, and the low sun shone in Henry's eyes. He was already so excited that he absently touched himself as he waited expectantly on the street. He caught himself doing so and clasped his hands behind his back as the doctor had told him. Even so, his excitement would not allow his erection to subside. This was a good day. Not only was he going to get to teach the little blonde slut held at the farm a lesson, but he was also going to get to see Lucy. Surely the most beautiful girl in the world. Lucy kissed her parents and her brother goodbye, picked up her bag and strolled down the path to her gate. Trudy Giles was already waiting for her. Trudy and Lucy had been best friends since infant school, and they always caught the bus together. Both girls had left home wearing the regulation school uniform that St. Jude's demanded. Yet, as with many teenage girls, that did not mean that certain adjustments could not be applied to ensure the boring dress code could not be made ever so slightly more appealing. Well, to the boys that rode the same bus as the girls each morning. The moment they were out of sight of Lucy's house, the pair began the daily ritual of rolling up the waistband of their school skirts until the hem was thigh height pulling up their school socks so they reached over each knee and opening up their collars. Just two buttons. The girls giggled and gossiped as they walked. Not a care in the world. The moment he saw Lucy Stevenson, Henry's legs began to shake. She walked with another girl. 
both showed off their slender tanned legs. The second girl was pretty, but not like Lucy. Oh, no, Lucy was special, very special. The pair stood at the bus stop chatting, laughing, checking their phones. They were probably on social media, Facebook, Snapchat. Henry was not allowed to look at social media, not allowed to join, because, well, because the doctor said he couldn't be trusted. And what the doctor said. Moments later, the bus arrived and Lucy got on. For a moment, Henry lost sight of her, but only until she was seated. Then he saw her again by the window, looking out into the road towards where he stood, her long blonde hair shining in the sunlight. Beautiful, clean, pure, innocent. Finally, just as the bus was pulling away, he was sure Lucy saw him. Henry smiled and waved, his morning complete. But Lucy did not wave back. And that made Henry very angry indeed. Seventy-five million quid for a fucking centre-back! Phil Grover was reading Sky Sports News from his phone, and Stryker watched the pathologist weigh Miguel Jimenez's brain. And your point there is what? asked Stryker. Grover's thick Scouse accent always seemed to get just that little more impenetrable when he read about his beloved Liverpool FC. The point is, it's fucking obscene, mate. I bet he's on 200k a week and all. You'll still buy your season ticket, though, Phil, eh? Probably just about pays for the boy a wee haircut and his feckin' eyebrows waxed. The police surgeon pushed his phone back into his jacket and shook his head ruefully. No point in talking about the mighty edge to someone who thinks football's played with an oval ball. The next time the Bulls come to town, I'll buy his tickets there, Phil. Show you what a man's game looks like. The two men sat in a glass-fronted viewing room, high above where the post-mortem examination was taking place. Stryker began scrolling through the reports from the officers investigating Jimenez's suspicious death. Did you realise there was drug paraphernalia found in his bedroom, Phil? I left as soon as the body was removed, so no. Stryker nodded. According to this, both used and unused syringes, a glass bowl, pipe, tin foil, and what is believed to be small amounts of heroin and crack cocaine. Grover leaned closer to the glass as the pathologist began his investigation of him and as his neck. The boy didn't strike me as a druggie, he offered. Nice, clean, tidy house and all that. The stuff was probably there for the girls to use when they paid him a visit. Paid him his cut, you mean? Whatever. Either way, we'll get toxicology back shortly, so we'll know for sure then. Phil pressed a button on the shelf in front of him to activate a speaker below them in the path lab. Any signs of puncture wounds in the arms, groin or feet there, Doc? The pathologist looked up towards the viewing room and shook his head. There you go, Stryker. As I said, for the girls. There was a quiet knock on the door of the viewing room, and a petite woman in her forties stepped inside. Tox reports, Phil, she said softly. The doc nodded his acceptance of the thin file, and the woman turned on her heels, leaving as quietly as she came. As if by magic, said Phil with a smile. Stryker waited whilst his friend scanned the report. It didn't take long for Grover to let out a long, low whistle. What? barked Stryker impatiently. Vecchiadonium bromide, said Phil, eyebrows raised in surprise. And what the feck is that? Vecchiadonium is a non depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agent that works by competing for cholinergic receptors at the motor end plate. Speak feckin' English, will you, Phil? Grover turned in his seat and pressed the speaker button again. Doc! The pathologist looked up again. Somewhere on that body's a puncture wound and we need it found. He waved the toxicology report above his head. This is a murder inquiry now. Stryker, Simons, Abbott, Higgins and Grover were perched around a large oval table in the Twelve Tellers on Church Street. It was a new pub situated in a converted bank. All had eaten their fill and each sat on high stools sipping coffee, except Phil Grover, who had gone against team orders and was enjoying a half pint of Spitfire. So you think Miguel was topped then, boss? asked Bob Higgins. 
Tell him, Phil, said Stryker. He'd been injected with Vecuronium, a drug used in anaesthesia to assist surgeons with certain procedures. It prevents patients from twitching whilst under sedation. A ten milligram dose would render an adult male paralysed within three minutes max. Kimenez had been injected at the base of his skull. This was obviously designed to hide the puncture wound. Of course, our killer was relying on us writing the death off as a straightforward accidental asphyxiation. He certainly wasn't banking on a full tox report. Mechuronium is extremely difficult to detect, unless you're looking for it. And what made you look, Phil? said Fliss. Grover shrugged his wiry shoulders and gave Abbott a cheeky wink. The big ginger one's not the only bloke with intuition around here. He laid down his drink. But seriously, I couldn't get my head around how oh, there were no signs of restraint on the body. Kimenez would have had to be totally compliant to that way he did. So it was one or the other, accidental as we were meant to believe, or he'd been drugged with something special. Clever, said Bob. And how easy is this vecuronium stuff to get hold of? Grover shook his head. Not at all, Bob. It's only used by anaesthetists when surgeons are carrying out extremely complex operations. Maureen cocked her head. So the killer has access to a hospital? Or a doctor? added Grover. Stryker held up a hand. Just as important to our investigation as that the house-to-house inquiries turned up a description of a man seen in the street near the deceased's house around the time of the murder. Stryker scrolled his phone. White male, six foot two, heavy set, mid fifties, going grey, carrying a briefcase. No scar, asked Maureen, knowing where Stryker was going with his point. Not that the witness saw, but that doesn't mean he didn't have one. Stryker leaned in. I feel this big guy's our connection to both murders. Fliss tapped the table with a forefinger. Just putting this out there, okay? Nods all round. Let's presume that Scarface is indeed a pimp that specialises in underage girls and always obtains them the same way. By grooming them, offered Maureen Simons. Yes, said Bliss, but via the mother. I think we already got to this, said Stryker. I, I know, said Fliss, undeterred, but this guy moves in muddy waters. The dark web paedophilia child pornography. It's a ruthless world. Big money, but big risk. I think he knows Melissa is dead and that there's an investigation on the way. And now his biggest fear is being compromised. So he tops Jimenez, asked Bob. Fliss nodded. Scarface couldn't risk being identified by him. He couldn't take the chance that Melissa may have confided in her new pimp. He would know that the cops would speak to Jimenez sooner or later. And how would he know about Melissa's murder? The investigation? asked Grover. There's been a total news blackout. Ruby might have told him, said Maureen. Maybe he still has a hold over her. I went to see her this morning, but she's already booked herself out of Avenham House. Quick recovery, offered Fliss. Mm, more needs must, said Maureen. In her line at work, it's hand to mouth. She needs a punter's to pay the rent and put food on the table. I caught up with her at her flat between guests. Nice, muttered Bob. Maureen soldiered on. I asked her about boyfriends. And? questioned Stryker. And nothing. She brushed off my question. Why would she need a man? Blah, blah, blah. She has three or four a day, that kind of thing. You believe her? asked Bob. Maureen shook her head. No. As soon as I described Scarfe, she clammed up. I got the impression she was too scared to even talk about him. The seasoned detective scanned her notepad. However, she was prepared to tell me Melissa always wore jewellery and that she had three items that she never removed. A silver locket with a picture of her mum inside, and two silver rings, one with a green stone. So our killers removed them, asked Stryker. Maureen closed her notes. Looks that way, boss. I took the opportunity to search Melissa's old room whilst I was there. I didn't find any jewellery. She tapped her cavernous bag. But I've collected some recent pictures, some old school books, and a few diaries for us to go through. Stryker nodded. 
Good work. Bob, how did you get on at Car Street? I had a look at the room Melissa was sharing, boss. Other than a few items of clothing, the cupboards were bare. No personal items at all. Seems when she went on her tours the last time, she had no intention of returning. Not much from the staff, either. The care worker who reported Melissa missing has since left her job. Apparently staff retention is a problem. Of the workers that were on duty this morning, only one actually knew our girl. She described Melissa as difficult. However, they all said there was no evidence to show Melissa was using drugs or working as a prostitute. Sounds like an exercise in back covering to me, said Grover, finishing his beer. And me, said Bob. However, I did talk to a girl called Sophie Gilbert. She didn't know Melissa well, but they went to the same school. When I told her that we were growing increasingly concerned for Melissa's safety, she seemed genuinely worried. She knew of Miguel Jimenez and knew Melissa was, and I quote, mad for him. When I suggested that Melissa may have been working as a prostitute, Sophie wasn't shocked in the slightest. Bob shook his head. I tell you, these kids carry more baggage than British Airways, boss. Anyway, what she did say was that when Melissa first arrived at Car Street, she had a lot of nice clothes and was buying fags for half the home. But in recent times, the cash had dried up. That suits our theory, said Maureen. Bob shrugged. Sophie says the last time she saw Melissa was over two weeks ago when she bumped into her in the Bull and Royal pub with Jimenez. She said she looked tired and spaced out. I reckon that's our last sighting so far. Stryker cricked his neck and exhaled through his nose. OK, good. Anything from Prince? Maureen shook her head. Bob and I visited our fingerprint people earlier, like you asked. The only identifiable marks were found on the outside of the envelope, and they were rubies. So nothing there. And, would you believe, we have to buy in handwriting experts, and there is a minimum of a seven-day wait. Stryker shook his head in frustration. Right. Bless how many suspects have you identified from the sex offenders' register? Abbott pulled a file from under the table. Twenty-two, boss. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, sighed Stryker. We're surrounded by sickos. OK, let's get moving. Slight change of plan. We'll split into two teams. One to look at the twenty-two and the other to go through what Maureen has in that bag of hers. I'd be very keen to read Melissa's diaries, said Fliss. I'd like to be out and about, offered Bob. Stryker held up his hands. Fine, the girls can stay home. Bob and myself will make a start of the fine upstanding people on Abbott's list. Chapter 17 It had taken Stryker and Higgins just over four hours to scratch off three of the twenty-two registered sex offenders on Fliss Abbott's list of possible suspects. As they trudged wearily to the lift that would take them to their meagre office, they were met by Detective Chief Superintendent Errol Graham. He gave Stryker a smile, then nodded towards Higgins. "'How are we progressing?' he asked cheerily, stepping into the lift, the presence of the three giant men almost maxing out the elevator's weight limit. "'Slow, but we're getting there,' said Stryker. "'Good,' offered the Chief. "'And how are you, Bob? Wife and kids okay?' Higgins cleared his throat. Uh, yes, thank you, sir. They're, they're all well. Fine, breezed Graham. As the doors opened for his floor, the senior detective's jovial manner failed him slightly. He turned to Stryker. Leave a synopsis of your progress on my desk before you leave tonight, Ewan. I won't make sure it's in a sealed envelope, will you? HQ are determined to keep a lid on this until you have a result. Stryker nodded and the doors closed. Bob turned. Tommy to mind me on, boss, but why are we struggling with just the four of us on this one? I mean, come on, if this is right, this could be one of the highest profile murder cases since the Ripper. You'd think the chief would have half the force working on this. The two men walked from the lift and along the corridor to their office door. Stryker entered the code into the newly fitted lock and pushed it wide open. 
I think you'll find that this job is about who the chief knows he can trust, he said. Inside the room, Maureen and Fliss were furiously scribbling notes on two large pads that sat on easels either side of the crime scene board. But you won't believe this, breathed Fliss, flicking through the pages of a diary on the table in front of her, then turning to the pad and scribbling some more. Scarface is real, all right. He's been having sex with Melissa since her thirteenth birthday. He began selling her shortly afterwards. She refers to each and every punter he sold her to as well, not by name, but by profession. Maureen was flicking through a small notebook. An unlit regal dangled from her mouth. It makes your fucking hair curl, boss. Stryker and Bob Higgins walked over to the boards and tried to make sense of the text. They were trying to get some chronology, offered Maureen, checking a third small book on her desk. Melissa wrote different events in different diaries and notebooks. It's pretty frenzied in places. We're trying to make sense of the whole story. Have we a name for Scarface? asked Stryker expectantly. Fliss shook her head. No such luck, but we do have an initial W. Stryker turned down the corners of his mouth and sat heavily in his chair. What about the other punters? Maureen snorted. The crates and the fucking good, Stryker. Magistrates, solicitors, barristers, accountants, and more than one cop so far. Bob Higgins turned and met Stryker's eye. Good job we had that lock fitted, boss. Stryker scratched his beard. Now you know why we're only four. Hey, eh, Bob? Chapter 18 Henry Stott had made his usual Tuesday tea. Sausages, mashed potato and tinned garden peas, all smothered in rich beef gravy. It was one of his favourites. Sitting at the small table in his kitchen, he felt his legs twitching with excitement as he polished off the plate. Then he washed and dried the pots, put them away and wiped down the cooker. Satisfied the kitchen was clean and tidy, he checked his watch, carefully tracing the hands with his finger to make sure he had the right time. He did. As well as the occasional use of Mr. Pitt's black transit van, Henry had his own car. Well, it had been his mother's, as had the house, but it was all Henry's now. Henry lived on Deepdale, a stone's throw from the football ground. The area was a myriad of small terraced houses with narrow cobbled streets. Some roads had been modified to allow car parking spaces to be built in front of the houses, but not Henry's. However, he didn't mind. As for many years, Henry's mother had rented a small garage, just a short walk away from his house, from a man called Frost. Mr. Frost had never owned a car or learned to drive, and the arrangement had continued, even after Henry's mother had died so tragically. Henry pulled on his jacket, stepped into the street and locked the door. The walk to Mr. Frost's garage took three minutes. He found his keys and unlocked the double wooden doors to reveal his mother's old Ford. It glistened as the evening sunshine caught the recently polished paintwork. Henry ran his hand lovingly across the boot lid, admiring the sheen. Henry loved his car. Henry loved his house. And Henry loved Tuesdays. Careful not to scratch the old Sierra Sapphire, he eased himself between the garage wall and the driver's door, slipped inside and started the engine. Then, just as the doctor had shown him, he checked the fuel gauge. This was difficult for Henry as was reading any device of this nature. As with his watch, he had to concentrate really hard, run his finger across the dial to where the needle was, and then read the result out loud. Three quarters, he said. Easily enough. Another issue was finding his way to his destination. He was fine driving around town and to and from work. He was okay locating the supermarket, where he shopped each Thursday evening, but after that it seemed no matter how many times he visited a place, he needed help. He pulled the sat-nav from the glove box, stuck it to the windscreen and switched it on. From there it was easy for Henry. The machine worked on pictures and letters, and Henry was fine with those. To get to the farm, where the doctor waited for him, Henry pushed the picture of the car on the screen 
then from the list picked farm. Simple. On the way back, after he'd killed the girl and cut up her body ready for disposal, he would start the car again, press the picture of a house on the screen, and it would guide him home. Henry just loved Tuesdays. The doctor wandered around the farmhouse, strolling from room to room, avoiding the makeshift dungeons the smell was overpowering. The mixture of blood, urine and sex was most unpleasant. Tonight was the next piece of the puzzle, another step towards the ultimate goal, another step towards six dead mutilated whores, hacked to pieces and buried in shallow graves on the moorland of Beacon Fell. Six set of photographs, six gut-wrenching high-definition films. Six grieving whore mothers. Of course, the doctor would give the bodies back once the intricate plan was complete. That would be the ultimate accomplishment. The doctor couldn't wait to see the television pictures of the police digging up the arms, legs and heads whilst their pitiful whore mothers watched on in horror. Then, and only then... Could Henry be delivered to the authorities? Dead, of course. Stepping outside and walking to the stable block, the doctor could hear as the captives banged and kicked on the walls of their makeshift cells, hoping somehow to attract attention, to be set free. A pointless exercise so far out in the countryside. Once in the door of the block, the doctor looked at a now cold-plated meal sitting on the floor outside Girl 3's cell, and felt a tinge of concern. Earlier that same day, Henry had insisted he'd fed girls two and three, but as the doctor now noted, he'd obviously forgotten their most recent acquisition. Henry had always been absent-minded. He had been the doctor's patient from the age of sixteen. Stott was a sexual deviant, extremely vicious and sometimes uncontrollable. Henry had displayed all the most disturbing traits of a psychopath from a young age. Hostile and self-confident one minute, racked with anxiety the next. Impulsive, aggressive, and downright evil. And when Henry applied those behaviours around women and sex, his conduct was both frightening and uncompromisingly violent. As a result, the increasingly muscular teen became deeply troubling to those around him especially his mother. The doctor strolled back to the comfort of the main house and considered the history of the matter. Henry's mother had been the start of it in a way, the catalyst, and the means by which the doctor had gained total control of the boy to ensure he would do anything required. Henry had spent time in and out of secure hospitals from age 17. However, when free in the outside world, his conduct had followed set patterns. He could be cool and calm one moment, as pleasant and polite as anyone could be. Indeed, you may even have described him as gentle. But the problem with Henry was he harboured the most dark and disturbing fetishist behaviours, especially around pubescent females. There was no doubt he was a danger to society. As the years passed, the doctor had all but given up on Henry, and may even have considered recommending he never be released into the community again. That was until the doctor realised that Henry was more useful out of hospital. At least, until the master plan became a reality. Henry had murdered his mother a little over a year and a half ago. Unexpectedly, the homicide had coincided with one of the doctor's rare home visits. It had taken a great deal of guile and no small amount of medical expertise to cover up Henry's crime, and from that moment Henry was as good as a slave. A slave that would perform just about any task the doctor required. As the months passed by, with a little help Henry had inherited the family home, car, and all mother's personal effects. The doctor had ensured Henry was given his job at Pitt's funeral home, under strict terms, of course, but a job nonetheless. Henry was the bluntest of blunt instruments, but also a loose cannon, especially around young girls. All the doctor needed from the boy now was for him to keep his prick in his trousers long enough to finish the job.
The sound of a car engine revving hard as it negotiated the steep driveway to the farmhouse increased the banging from the stables. Hearing the noise, the prisoners obviously became hopeful of rescue. Had they known the identity of the car's occupant, and what he was about to do to one of them, they would have saved their breath. Henry stepped out into the balmy evening and admired the doctor's country house. To Henry it was a mansion. Imposing elevations reached out to the heavens, and warm inviting lights shone through leaded windows. Ignoring the muffled cries of the girls in the stables, he strolled to the double oak entrance doors and knocked. They were quickly opened. "'Hello, Henry,' said the doctor, a glass in hand, red-faced from the alcohol. Henry was instantly anxious. The mere sight of his long-time physician made him nervous. There was nothing in Henry's world more terrifying than the doctor. "'Hello,' he said. "'Shall I make a start?' "'Why not?' offered the doctor, taking a sip. "'I'll prepare the cameras. Now you are finally here, that is.' Henry swallowed hard, noting the doctor's rasping tone. This was not a time to mess up. "'I'll go and get the girl,' he said. "'You do that.' said the doctor sharply. And don't forget your cum, Dom Henry. The little bitch could have anything, and I'm not taking you to the G.U.M. clinic again. Henry nodded and turned. He walked to the boot of his car and removed his bag. Inside was his mask, earpiece, weightlifting gloves, pack of condoms, and a set of butcher's knives. Henry liked the mask, liked the smell of the rubber. When he pulled it over his head, it made him feel like one of those superheroes. Batman, maybe. He slammed the boot lid closed and tripped to the stable block. The doctor said that they had once held up to eight fully grown horses. Henry would have liked to have seen that. He liked horses, unlike cats. Henry didn't care for cats. He unbolted the main door. As he did so, despite their gags, the two girls began their vain attempts to shout out. Henry had heard it all before. He'd heard it every early morning when he'd driven to the farm to feed and water them. As he stepped inside, he noticed a plate of food sitting on the floor outside Girl Three's stable and realised he'd forgotten to give it to her. That was because he'd been too busy looking at her nakedness through the crack in the door and masturbating himself. Henry picked up the plate, sniffed at the contents and threw the lot into a plastic bin. The plate smashed and the girls began their muffled cries again. He disregarded them and walked to a large metal cabinet that sat against the far wall of the stable. He dropped his bag to the floor. The cabinet door creaked as he opened it, and Henry reached inside to remove a glass bowled pipe, a square of tinfoil, a darning needle and a disposable lighter. Placing the items on top of the cabinet, he carefully unfolded the foil and removed a rock of crack cocaine. He then placed the flattened foil cautiously over the bowl of the pipe and pushed it down gently with his thumb, creating a small secondary bowl. When he was satisfied that the makeshift screen was in place, he punctured it seven or eight times with the needle, dropped the rock inside, and strolled to Girl Two's door. Girl Two was Megan Farrow. Megan was seventeen and had been working as a street prostitute at the rear of Preston Prison when she had the misfortune to step into Henry's car. She'd seen the old Black Sierra on several occasions driving up and down St. Mary Street, and she'd seen Henry pick up other whores. However, this night Henry had been determined to have Megan, turning down other girls' advances. This had made her suspicious, but not enough to lose the trade. He'd offered her sixty pounds to go back to his house on Deepdale, he wanted sex in comfort, he said. Megan knew full well that she would need at least four more punters to realise that kind of money, and it had been raining and the night was slow, so she reluctantly agreed. Henry had driven to his house and taken her upstairs, but instead of going to his room he'd taken her into a room that obviously belonged to an old lady. She stepped inside to find a dress already lying there on the floral bedspread really old-fashioned dress. Henry had asked her to wear it. Megan had shrugged, 
taken her money and slipped the stuffy, smelling frock over her head. After all, weird was the new norm in her job. She began her routine, lying Henry down on the bed and performing oral on him. There was always a chance that if she did her job well enough, he would ejaculate before he'd got the chance at full penetration. However, it was as she worked on him, things began to get really weird, and he began to call her mother. For some reason, maybe the crack, maybe the weed, maybe the valium, she'd laughed at him. He'd turned from a pliable punter to a pit bull in a split second. He'd held her by the throat so tight she thought she would die there and then. But rather than strangle her, he'd injected her with a drug she'd never had before, and she'd been rendered unconscious. She awoke sitting where she sat now, naked, in almost total darkness on the cold floor of a stable. She'd been gagged with an old smelly rag and her hands were shackled to the wall above her head. On the night she'd arrived, she was certain there were two other girls in the barn. Now there was just one. Megan was scared, cold, and cramping from the lack of a fix. Whatever the other girl had done to be set free by the guy who had beaten and kidnapped her, she was prepared to do too. Megan would do anything. Before she had become a street girl, she'd hoard for a copper called Garrett. Her mum had facilitated the arrangement with him. She'd known Garrett as a child and watched him take his freebies from her mother for years. Then, once Megan began to develop, he'd approached her for sex. He bought her clothes, perfume, CDs, even concert tickets for Take That. He'd been her first. She was just twelve. That was the beginning for Megan. She was then sold on to Garrett's wealthy punters, and the money was rolling in. Her mother was over the moon, owned a Gucci handbag, and was stoned off her tits every day. But at sixteen, Megan grew too old for Garrett's clients. That meant the money had dried up, and her mum began to deal rocks of crack to fund her own habit. In May, Megan's mum had got herself locked up after she was caught with an ounce of beak and was doing a two-stretch-in-style prison for her trouble. With mum in the nick and the rent overdue, what else could she do? Megan began street whoring, and just like most of the girls, she smoked cocaine each night to make it bearable. Megan heard Henry's footsteps and movement from outside. This was strange, as in all the days she'd been in captivity, he mainly visited early mornings to feed her and the other girls. He'd walk in, in near total darkness, undo her gag, pour water into her mouth and then roughly spoon food in. He would change her bucket that acted as her toilet, reapply the gag and leave, always without speaking. Talking was not allowed. Any attempts to do so were punished by a hefty slap in the face. On one occasion, after he'd reapplied the gag, he'd felt her up and she was certain he'd been playing with himself. Once again, this very morning, she'd been sure she'd heard him moaning as if he was in the final throes before orgasm. Megan had wondered if the girl next door had been trying her hand at persuading Henry to release her. Whatever she'd done hadn't worked, as Megan had heard the girl's wretched muffled sobs most of the day. However, this evening was different. The lights were turned on in her cell, and as the upper door opened, she saw Henry standing there, holding a crack pipe and lighter in his hand. Megan thought all her birthdays had come at once. Henry carefully pushed open the lower door and stepped inside. It was the first time Megan had seen the guy when she was sober and in good light. He was tall, over six feet, broad-shouldered with powerful-looking arms. His hair was swept back in an old-fashioned style, as if his mother had made the barber cut it in that way as a child, and he'd never bothered to change it. As he stepped towards where Megan sat huddled in the corner, she noticed his peculiar gait. Henry seemed to roll from side to side as he propelled himself forward. A sportsman he wasn't. He smiled at her. He wasn't handsome, but he wasn't ugly either. Just a normal-looking guy, really. Apart from his eyes. 
and Megan didn't want to look into those. I have something for you, Megan, said Henry softly. I can let you have a smoke if you promise to be a good girl for Henry. Megan nodded furiously. He placed the pipe on the floor next to her, undid her shackles and removed the gag. Megan quickly wiped her mouth and grabbed the pipe. Her dirty nails were bitten to the quick and her hands shook as she held it towards her captor to light. Henry lit the bowl and the girl took the drug down deep into her lungs. The effect was instantaneous. Megan's head fell back against the wall and her whole body relaxed. A thin smile came about her mouth. Nice gear, man, she muttered. Henry let her enjoy her moment. He watched her stretch out her legs and arch her back. She had a nice, firm body. At seventeen she was too old and too well used for Henry's taste, but good enough for his purposes this night. Would you like a hot shower, Megan? he asked, head cocked, eyes exploring her nakedness. You got any more gear? she asked shakily. Whatever you want, Megan. Yes, I have more, but I think you should get clean first. Do your hair, put on some makeup. Megan was stoned. Will you let me go, then? Henry smiled. No, Megan, I need you to do something for me first. I'll pay you, of course. Pay you well, but you must do this one thing for me before I can let you go. That, and of course you promise never to tell another soul what happened the other night. Megan offered the pipe forward for Henry to light again. She nodded a little too quickly. Of course, mate, yeah, anything, man, just... It was a light first, eh? Henry led Megan from the stables, a blanket covering her shoulders. Even in her drug-induced state, she was aware of the opulence in front of her. Nice place, she whispered. Yours? The doctor's, said Henry. But don't worry about that, let's just get you a nice shower. Megan nodded and did her best to focus. Okay. The doctor sat in the camera room. The whole CCTV system had been purchased from a small supermarket that had gone under and was almost new. The operator could either watch all the cameras simultaneously in multi-screen mode, or, as the doctor preferred, watch one camera at a time, zooming in on the action. Alongside the security camera system was a second PC that hosted a video editing program, where the doctor would spend several hours chopping, cutting and pasting together the footage for maximum effect. Once the doctor was happy with the film, eight horrifying stills would be carefully chosen, printed, and then the whole lot posted to Mummy. The system was all ready to go, all checks completed. Turning to the second PC, the doctor pressed the space bar, and music instantly filled the room from hidden speakers. The Four Seasons, the best known of Vivaldi's works, a revolution in musical conception, Flowing creeks, singing birds, barking dogs, buzzing flies. Ideal, thought the doctor, especially the sections written from the prey's point of view. Prey, yes, that is exactly what Megan Farrow was. The doctor reached for the joystick that moved each selected camera, left, right, up, down, closer and closer still. Ah, the delight of it all. Soon the screams would begin, and the prey would beg for her death. All done, asked Henry jovially as Megan stepped from the shower. The girl managed another unsteady smile. I suppose, but what exactly do you want me to do, Henry? You know, before you let me go. Henry handed the girl a white fluffy towel. We're going to make a film, Megan, a naughty film. Porno? Yeah, a porno. The girl furrowed her brow. Uh, I'm not sure about that, Henry. I don't know if I'd like that. You know, just anybody being able to see me having sex, like. Henry helped her dry herself. Oh, come on now, Megan, don't be a prude. I mean, look, even some of the big film stars have done it, eh? You know, a sex tape. Megan cocked her head. And who would I be, you know? Fucking? 
Yeah, I mean, I don't do lesbian like. Henry smiled a big beaming effort and held up the crack pipe again. No, no, of course not. Megan staggered into the dungeon, the blood-red walls adorned with black leather-studded belts, whips, chains, and sex toys she'd never seen before. Fucking hell, was all she managed. Henry had cleaned the room as best he could and removed the swing he'd used from Melissa. In its place on sturdy metal legs he'd placed an X-shaped table covered in scarlet leather. At the end of each leg of the letter was a restraint. Come on, Megan, said Henry quietly. I need you to lie face down on there. I'm going to tie you up and give you a little spank on your bottom to get us going. But first take off your jewellery, please. Megan felt fear creeping up on her. But she was so stoned it clouded the emotion. And after all, what choice did she have? At least the other girl had got away. You want me to take off my rings and stuff? Yes, please. Megan did as he asked. Good girl, said Henry, carefully placing the items in a small box for safekeeping. Now, just one last thing. He held up a notepad and pen. I just want you to write something down for me. Oh, I'm rubbish at spelling, she said. Never mind, said Henry. You can copy. Just turn to a new page first. After three attempts, Megan wrote out the two lines of script Henry had pointed out, then did her best to climb on the table, each leg and arm outstretched. She giggled, the drug addling her brain. It's the shape you do when you make a snow angel, she said. Yeah, said Henry, and you are my angel tonight. It's cold, she complained. Soon be warm, said Henry, fastening her wrists. That hurts, she said. Sorry, said Henry. I'll slacken them off in a minute. You'll see. He walked around to her feet and did the same. I've no one to rest me head, slurred Megan. Don't worry, said Henry, stripping off his clothes, clipping on his earpiece and pulling on his mask. This won't take long. Henry pulled on his weightlifting gloves, tore open a condom packet and rolled it over his erection. The doctor's voice was instantly in his head. The girl still wears a ring, Henry. Remove it, please. Okay, he said out loud. "'Who are you talking to?' asked Megan, unable to turn and see where Henry was. Henry strode up to the girl and began to pull at the small gold ring on her thumb. "'It won't come off,' she said. "'It's stuck.' Henry wandered back to where his bag lay on a table. He selected a paring knife and walked back to the girl. "'I'll get it off,' he said. And the screaming began. Chapter 19 Stryker sat in his nice new Audi that HQ had provided for him. From his position he could see the full length of St. Mary's Street until it turned a slight left before its junction with New Hall Lane. Bob Higgins was mobile, slowly driving the circuit used by the local street girls. He drove a divisional CID car that would be known to every pimp and whore in town. Neither men were under any illusions that their operation would go unnoticed by the main players, but clandestineness wasn't a plan. Stryker held a small pad in one hand and wrote down the registration number of every car that drove slowly around the block, looking for business. Bob counted off the street girls and noted their descriptions. The two cops were hindering the oldest profession in town, and the girls knew it. To them, it was all in a night's work. Awkward cops, drunken punters, danger from all sides. If a John did stop, they simply tipped them the wink, and they quickly went home to wifey. After an hour, Stryker had seen enough sleaze to last him his entire career. He lifted his phone and called Bob Higgins. Let's take a walk, eh, Bob? he said. My Catholic guilt is getting the feckin' better of me. The two men stood on the corner of Fletcher Road and Deepdale. 
Both had an enlarged copy of a recent picture of Melissa Ward. Bob looked down at his. I'm not so sure it should be us two big airy ass cops doing this, boss, he offered. I reckon the girls might have gone a bit better. I'd planned on a bit of both, Bob, said Stryker, stretching the tightness from his lower back. But Abbott and Simons are well on with those diaries, and I didn't want to stop their progress. Bob checked his watch. We've all been on duty for thirteen hours now, boss. Stryker slapped him on the shoulder. Think of the overtime, eh? Buy your missus a nice holiday in the sun. Bob shook his head. If I've still got a wife to go home to after this. As the two cops walked up St Mary Street, one or two girls began to shout abuse in their direction, pissed off at their loss of business. But most were either too stoned or too desperate to bother. As the men got close to the church, two women stepped out from the doorway. They were both in their early twenties. One was an Asian girl. She wore jeans and trainers. A bubble-style jacket hid most of her upper body, but Stryker noticed that she only wore a red brassiere underneath. As they got closer, she opened her coat and flashed. "'Eh, hey, big man!' she shouted in a Yorkshire accent. "'You're looking for business or what?' The second girl, a pitifully thin, bottle blonde, screeched with laughter at her friend's behaviour. She had shocking skin with obvious sores on her arms and bare legs. One of her front teeth was missing. For me, Carly, you're a case you are tapping up a pair of coppers. Wouldn't be the first time I've had one, said the Yorkshire girl. They like a bit of packy over Bradford Way. All right, girls, keep it down, eh? Offered Bob Higgins, his lazy, quiet way instantly calming the two streetwalkers. We just want you to have a quick look at this picture, is all. The skinny blonde was off her face. She grabbed at the sheet of paper, almost tearing it. Steady on, said Bob. I need to show this around. The blonde looked at Melissa Ward's picture. What's she done? Top some punter. You know her? Asked Stryker. She's a working girl. Done this stretch a few times. She's called Melissa. The blonde staggered slightly. Ain't we all them? Anyway, it depends why you're asking. Cause she's missing, said Higgins. Skinny looked at the shot again and shook her head. Nah, thought I'd seen it about what I was wrong, I reckon. Stryker turned to Carla. What about you, love? You've seen her before. We're getting real concerned for her, so we are. Carla took a long look, sniffed loudly and wiped her nose with the back of her hand. I've seen her with Miguel a few weeks back. Maybe she's up at his place. Miguel Jimenez is dead, said Stryker, an edge to his tone and were treating it as murder. He turned to the blonde whose jaw had dropped open at the news. So you, lady, better have another look and think again. The girl glanced at the shot again. Listen, Mr. Stryker. My name is Stryker. Okay, listen, Stryker. There are twenty girls out here tonight. Tomorrow there may be ten, the next night twenty again. Girls come and they go. If she's working for Miguel, chances are she'd be walking further up the stretch towards Fletcher Road. That's his patch like. You might get more luck up there. Stryker nodded. He was about to walk on towards the next set of girls when he stopped. What about weird punters? You know, any of the girls mentioned being shook up by John? Anyone get violent? At that, an old blue BMW crawled by. Despite the balmy night, the driver wore a sheepskin coat. He sported an outrageously bad comb-over and wore thick round glasses. As he noticed the two cops, he sped up and was gone. Carla snorted down her nose. Weird, you say, Stryker. They're all fucking weird. See him in the beamer. Know what he's got under that coat. Women's underwear, that's what. Knickers, stockings, all that. He wants to fuck you wearing that shit. Fucking hell, if you didn't get in a car because you thought a guy was weird, you'd never make a penny in this game. Okay, okay. Striker held up his hand. What about a white guy, say, 25 to 30, well-built, bit of a gym bunny? You mean like you? 
said Blondie with a grin, displaying her missing canine. Come on, girls, said Bob wearily. It's been a long day. Nah, said Carla. No one like that. Don't see many muscle-bound men on this street, offered Blondie. Stryker wasn't done. What about an older man, say, Bob here's age, size and build? Mean-looking, big scar down his face. Carla looked blank. Blondie went a shade or two paler, and Stryker's head began to fill with static. He grabbed her by the elbow. You know who I'm talking about, don't you? Do you know him? What's his name? The girl did her best to release herself. Fucking get off me. I ain't done nothing and I don't know nothing, right? Stryker let go. Blondie rubbed her elbow. Fucking assault eyes, I'll make a complaint, I will. Stryker curled his lip, his blue eyes flashing under the street lamps. Don't fuck with me, young lady. What's his name? Who is he? You know, for sure you know. I can see it's written all over your face. The blonde regained some of her composure. There had been dozens of men that had frightened her in her short life. A handful had beaten her. Some had caused her real damage. But only one had really terrified her. Made her scream in agony. Raped her and sodomized her. A man above the law. She stepped in close to Stryker and looked up into his face. You know, Mr. Stryker, there ain't nothing you can do to me that will make me tell you one word. You want to throw your way around? Go on, then give me a slap. I've had a few of them in me time. Blondie turned and took Carla by the hand. Come on, hon, let's go get a drink. It stinks round here. The two cops stayed on the street for another hour, showing Melissa's picture, asking questions. A couple of girls recognised her but couldn't remember when they had last seen the girl. A few knew Jimenez. No one would admit to knowing or ever having seen the man who the team now knew as Scarface. By the time Stryker and Higgins got back to the Nick, Maureen Simons and Fliss Abbott were in putting all the information they had gleaned from Melissa's diaries into homes. You get anywhere with the street, girls? asked Simons the unlit embassy still dangling from her mouth. Stryker sat heavily. Not much, except that our scar-faced man is very real and not exclusive to daughters of known prostitutes. He's well known and the girls are frightened of him. So scared that no one will talk. Yeah, said Bob. We got the impression that he's been around a long time. He scratched his bald head and muttered half to himself. We must have some intel on him. He must have some form. Phyllis Abbott handed Stryker a slim file. Melissa Ward's clients, she said, in as close a chronological order as we can make out. Stryker flicked through. Looks like she had a lot of regulars. Definitely, said Maureen. There's at least three police officers. One cop she calls the chief, would you believe? He pops up half a dozen times. She first had sex with him at his house whilst his wife was in hospital. She was just turning fourteen. Nice guy, muttered Bob. Oh, yeah, said Maureen. Another guy she calls the Beak. Used her services no fewer than eleven times up until she was fifteen. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, muttered Stryker. I need to speak to DCS Graham. You do, boss, said Maureen. This could be a lot bigger than one guy selling whores to high flyers. If we have a possible six victims, and they're all connected to this man, this is a child sex ring to rival anything with seen in Rotherham and the like. Stryker looked Maureen in the eye. What makes you say that? I mean, we have nothing to suggest this guy is connected to any more girls, and T.C. Abbott's theory is just that right now, a theory. But you think I'm right, butted Abbott. Maureen pulled her unlit cigarette from her mouth and sat wearily. I've been dealing with groomers for the last six years or more. Men like Scarface don't just have one iron in their fire. They practice the craft. They put themselves in the position to get close to these girls. You'll have more. I'd bet me life. Stryker rubbed his face with both palms. 
No wonder none of the girls are talking. He stood. Look, guys, it's been a long day. You look all in. See y'all in the morning, okay? The three detectives shuffled out of the small room, saying their weary good nights. With the door closed, Stryker was finally alone. He opened his iPhone, scrolled his music, selected John Coltrane's iconic album, Blue Train, and set the volume low. Stryker loved Coltrane's hard bop style. As the title track began its long, rhythmical, variegated blues pattern, he let his head fall back and his mind clear. He listened as the sentimental quasi-minor pattern of the tune gradually showed the listener the major key during the first chorus. Stryker considered the saxophonist's massive talent before casting his mind back to the skinny blonde girl he'd spoken to earlier. She, too, had needle marks in her arm, just like Coltrane would have done back then. The smack will kill you, too. He read and reread the notes that Simons and Abbott had produced, then went back to the beginning of the murder file, starting with Ruby Ward's statements. There was something he was missing, something that would lead him to Scarface. The man he was convinced connected the murder of Melissa Ward and Miguel Jimenez together. Was he the man who made that terrible film? Was he the man who was squeezing the last few pennies out of those poor girls' bodies? Stryker just wasn't sure. And now he had another problem. Cops were involved. Senior cops by the sound of it, and Stryker believed that Errol Graham had been aware of that when he'd called by to bring him back into the fold. He stood, paused Coltrane halfway through Jerome Kern and Johnny Mercer's I'm Old Fashioned, and headed for Errol Graham's office. Chapter 20 The chat with Graham hadn't gone well. Stryker was convinced the senior detective was hiding something. Graham insisted he wasn't. Tables were banged, doors slammed. The following days were a mixture of painstaking checks and frustrating dead ends for the team. The remaining 19 registered sex offenders living in the area were visited, interviewed and eliminated from the inquiry. Every registered keeper of the vehicles that Stryker had listed, the car seen cruising the red-light area of Preston, had been visited with nothing to show for the hours of effort. Fliss had worked tirelessly on profiles for Scarface and the muscled male seen on film, raping and murdering Melissa Ward. But they were broad brushes. It was the sixth day of the inquiry, and Stryker was as frustrated as ever. Forensics have nothing from Jimenez's house, he barked, dropping the reports into an overflowing basket of statements and documents waiting to be uploaded onto the Holmes system. Clean as a feckin' whistle. Maureen Simon sat chewing nicotine gum. She hadn't smoked a cigarette since the opening day of the operation. I put the feelers out and I've got a possible sighting of Melissa on the Friday before she was killed, spotted hawking for tread around Fletcher Road and getting into a dark saloon. Who saw her? asked Stryker. A guy called Matty Gunn. Bit of a rogue, to be honest. Openly admits to using the girls from the St. Matthews area on a regular basis. He used to be a snout of mine. I'm due to meet him in the Blackamoor at twelve. Any excuse for a beer? mumbled Bob. Stryker looked at his detectives. Six days in, and each had worked a minimum of one hundred hours. Everyone looked a little jaded. I'm thinking we all need a wee break. Clear the decks. Ooh, I'm up for that, said Fliss Abbott. I could murder a nice cold lager. Right then. Stryker jumped up. Leave all your books and notes, anything to do with the inquiry on your desk. A drink will do us all good. The Blackamoor Head, to give the place its full title, had been a licensed premises for over 175 years. The brewery tried to change its name back in 2005, as they thought it not politically correct. Actually, the name was anything but racist, as the pub had derived its name from a stained glass window depicting its early Moor landlord. Rough and ready, cheap and cheerful, 
The Blackamoor was situated opposite the open market and close to the main bus station, making it popular with thirsty shoppers and folks waiting for their ride home. It also gave shelter to a good few colourful and dubious characters. To add to the long list of ne'er-do-wells, the pub now boasted four very disheartened and tired detectives. Bob sat with a pint of Tetley's, Maureen a G&T, Fliss Abbott had changed her mind on the lager and opted for a large white wine. Stryker, of course, clutched a bottle of Beck's Blue. "'At least you look like you're drinking, boss,' said Bob. "'I don't like to stand out there,' said Stryker. "'I prefer to blend in like so.' Maury nearly choked on a drink. "'Oh, hi, old six foot of you, built like a brick shit house and a fucking ginger to boot. You're a shrinking violet, boss.' There were smiles around the table, and Stryker considered that it was worth being the butt of a joke or two if it raised the spirits of the team. So, he offered, where's your man, Maureen? She motioned to a rather shady-looking guy standing at the bar with two equally nefarious characters. Oh, I think we've scared him off, she said. I'll nip outside and see if he follows. No sneaky fags now, said Stryker. Maureen gave a mock salute. Yes, sir. Sure enough, Matty Gunn followed Maureen out. Minutes later, she was back. The table waited expectantly. He's certain it was Melissa. He's used her services in the last month. Denies that he knew she was underage, of course. Of course, mimicked Fliss. Maureen ploughed on. He also knows Miguel Jimenez and met him and Melissa socially. He says he last saw her on a Friday night, he thinks maybe two weeks ago, so that would make it the Friday before she was killed. That would fit with what Melissa's friend from Car Street told you, Bob, said Stryker. And the car? The punter? asked Fliss. An older Ford, maybe a Sierra or Granada, dark blue or black, but in very good condition. Shone like a new pinhead, he said. The driver was in his late twenties, maybe early thirties, muscular, dark haired. He said Melissa did quite a bit of negotiating before she got in. That's what made him suspicious. Bingo, said Bob. At last something to go on. The striker held up his hands. Let's not get too excited here, but I agree. There can't be too many Sierras and Granadas left knocking about, certainly in that condition. Stryker felt his phone buzz in his pocket. He pulled it out and hit the call button. Stryker, he said. He listened for a moment. The table went silent, all eyes on the big man's expression. He closed the call. There's been another, he said. Style Prison occupied some of the former buildings of Style Cottage Homes, an institution opened as an orphanage for destitute children from the Manchester area in 1898. In 1956 it closed, and the site reopened as a women's prison in the 60s, the female inmates being transferred from the shockingly overcrowded HMP Strangeways. It then went through a somewhat chequered history as both a remand centre and prison, with a reputation for bullying and high suicide rates. In recent times, the prison seemed to have got over some of its worst traits, and even boasted a mother and baby unit together with a restaurant that the public had access to, called The Clink. This was run by the inmates, who were working towards catering qualifications as part of their rehabilitation. Megan Farrow's mother had no need for the baby unit, and had no interest in making a new life as a chef. No, Sonia Farrow simply sat in her cell, chain-smoked, and waited impatiently for her release. Other than legal correspondence, all mail sent to the prison was vetted. So when a package arrived that was somewhat bulky and obviously contained a small, solid item, there was no way P.O. Stephanie Harris was going to allow it through to Sonia unchecked. The brown envelope had been delivered via Hermes, and it had sat alongside the dozens of other letters and parcels received by the prison each day, awaiting processing. P.O. Harris had opened the package just after midday. She wished with all her heart that she had not. The package contained eight pictures, a memory stick, and a slip of lined paper with a handwritten message. When I was two, 
I was nearly new. In her seventeen years at style, P.O. Harris had seen it all. Self-harm, suicides, beatings, stabbings, and some pretty strong pornography posted for the women's benefit. But this, this was way off the scale. The prison staff, of course, knew who the package was destined for, and as P.O. Harris had supervised several visits between Sonia and her daughter Megan over the last few months, she knew the identity of the poor girl, too. Within minutes the governor had been informed, Sonia Farrow's file had been pulled, and the address of Megan obtained. From there it had been a simple process of finding the right station to call. Stryker and Simon sat in the governor's office. A very pale-looking P.O. Harris occupied a chair to the right of his desk. I called D.C.S. Graham personally, offered Governor McCann, Errol and his wife are personal friends of ours. I knew him from my time in Brixton. Errol was part of the Operation Trident team, smashing chap, lovely family. You know him better than me then, so, said Stryker, eyeing the envelope and contents sitting on McCann's desk. "'shocking contents protected by evidence bags. "'Could I see the pictures, please?' "'The governor nodded solemnly. Mm, "'As you wish, Inspector Stryker, "'but I must warn you, it's pretty disturbing stuff.' "'Stryker let out a sigh. "'I'm not an inspector, I'm a sergeant, "'but I prefer it if we just stuck to Stryker, sir, "'if that's okay with you there, so.' "'McCann shrugged, picked up the sorry pile and handed it over.' Stryker studied each shot before passing them to Simons. The room was silent throughout the process. Finally, Stryker passed Maureen Simons the note. She considered the text, looked up into Stryker's face and raised her brows. Without saying a word, Maureen confirmed what he'd already detected. The note was written by a different hand. Stryker placed the items back on McCann's desk. And what does Sonia, the mother, what does she know? The governor shook his head. As we speak, nothing. We were considering our options. You see, Sonia is a difficult inmate detective. She has no interest in any activities, no interest in rehabilitation. She has managed to smuggle contraband into the prison on three occasions. Drugs, piped up P.O. Harris. Crack a cane and heroin. McCann turned and gave Harris a withering look. We, of course, have strict policies here at Style, Detective, but with dozens of visitors each day and the ever-increasing use of drones, keeping the prison clean is a near impossibility. He leaned forward and clasped his hands together. However, Sonia has not done herself any favours. As a result of her poor behaviour and her continued refusal to enter into any drug programmes, I can see her serving her full time here, and on release there is little or nothing to prevent her from falling straight back into the life she'd led before jail. He tapped the plastic-clad photographs. And this horror will not help the situation. Of course not, said Maureen Simons, pulling herself together after witnessing the contents of the second envelope. But we would consider it a professional courtesy if you would keep the gory details of this inquiry to yourselves for the moment. I mean, the nature of the killing, the brutality. Stryker noticed Stephanie Harris wriggling her seat and caught her eye as she did so. I take it that ship has sailed, he growled. Harris went from pure white to bright pink. When, when I opened the envelope, she stammered, I was, well, I was sick. And I mean, the mailroom isn't the quietest of places there are people about. Not a P.O.'s, a couple of trustees. The governor went as red-faced as his officer. We I believe we have a lid on the identity of the girl. Only Harris got a good look at the material, but the general population will be aware of some wrongdoing. Stryker's infamous temper was beginning to prickle. And as soon as Sonia is informed, the whole Nick will put two and two together and it will be all over Facebook before tea time. The governor frowned. Mobile phones are not permitted in this facility, Stryker. 
Maureen Simon stood. Neither is bloody crack cocaine, Mr. McCann. I suggest we get the poor woman tall before someone else does. Chapter 21 Will Garrett rolled off the girl, his body bathed in sweat. On the bedside cabinet were a pack of Lambert and Butler. He removed one, pushed it into his mouth and lit it. Didn't hurt this time, did it? he asked. The girl shook her head and smiled, eager to please. Garrett took the smoke down deep into his lungs and exhaled. Remember, I told you and your mum that I'd look out for you. I remember, said the girl in heavily accented English. Well, this is where it starts now, Elizabeth. This is where the good life begins for you and your mum. No problems with the Russians, no more running, no more living in bad places. The girl turned on her side and grabbed Garrett's cigarette. Hey, he said, you're not old enough to smoke. In my country, old girls smoke at thirteen, said Lisbeth, taking a drag and falling back onto her pillow. Well, I'd rather you stopped, said Garrett, stealing back the cigarette. The man that I'll send to you will not like a girl smelling a tobacco smoke. I told you, they want you to look and act your age. If you do as I say, they'll pay good money and you and your mum will be rich, Elizabeth, rich. But I like to smoke, William, said the girl petulantly. Maybe I will wear that uniform for the men, the one you brought for me, and that will please them, make them forget the smoke. Garrett's mood turned. Just the way Elizabeth had seen before. His eyes grew dark, like the storm clouds rolling in from the Baltic in winter. His face had lost its flush from the sex, the blood rushing elsewhere to feed his fury. The long, ugly pink scar that ran down his cheeks, standing out angrily against his pallor. Elizabeth was very scared. The last time she had seen William in this mood was over a month ago, when he had beaten her mother so badly that she needed to visit the hospital. Elizabeth felt Garrett's left hand grip her throat. He held her so tight she thought she would never take another breath. In his right he held the cigarette. He took the longest pull on it, ensuring the tip was glowing as red as the Russian flag, then held it to her cheek. She could feel the embers against her pale, flawless skin. "'Please, Will,' she croaked. "'Please don't burn me,' Garrett whispered his words calm yet menacing, the smoke falling from his mouth like a ghostly waterfall. I will push this fucking tip into your eyeball and boil your stupid brain if you ever go against what I say again. Understand? Lisbeth did her best to nod. Yes, sorry, William, sorry. Garrett released the girl, sat up and stubbed out the cigarette on a nearby plate. That's better, he said his temper subsiding. Now, go and change into that uniform and put your hair into pigtails the way I showed you. I want to tear your picture. Lisbeth stood, revealing her nakedness, then tripped dutifully over to her small wardrobe. She was Estonian, born in Tallinn. Despite the country's EU status, she and her mother had been brought to England by a Russian trafficker. They had been promised a good life, steady work for her mother, a good education for Lisbeth. Instead, her mother, Katya, had been sold to a small-time Russian pimp in Blackpool, and she and Lisbeth had been held virtual prisoners in a disgusting old house off Central Drive. Garrett had turned up at the brothel one afternoon. He'd had sex with Katya. He'd liked her, her slim, lithe body, her long blonde hair. He told her he was a policeman, a very powerful policeman, and she, in turn, had told him of her troubles. More importantly to William Garrett, she had shown him a picture of her beautiful thirteen-year-old daughter. And so it began all over again. Garrett had returned to the brothel, beaten the pimp half to death, and set fire to his premises. The next day Catcher and Lisbeth were in a nice, clean, warm flat, had food on the table and a television to watch. Over the next few months, Garrett organised clients for Catcher and began the long, persistent grooming of Lisbeth Janssen's.
Lisbeth stood at the end of the bed wearing the schoolgirl outfit Garrett had requested. Her white blonde hair braided into two pigtails. Garrett had dressed and sat smoking another cigarette. He grabbed the girl by her hips and turned her round full circle. "'You look beautiful, Lisbeth,' he said. "'It's like a real English rose.' He stood and pulled his phone from his pocket. "'Now, let me take a few pictures of you, and then I have a very special surprise.' Lisbeth could hardly contain her excitement. "'Oh, really, William, what is it? Please tell.' Garrett snapped away. "'Give me a nice smile. Oh, yes, that's it. Lift your skirt a little, Lisbeth. Good, good girl. Oh, you will be a very popular girl. I'm so pleased with you.' Garrett pushed his phone into his jacket, delighted with his day's work. He then fished inside his coat for a small packet. He patted his knee. Come here, sit, Lisbeth. The girl did as she was asked and watched excitedly as he opened the paper envelope. There, said Garrett. Two tickets to see Swan Lake at the Palace Theatre, Manchester. Lisbeth let out a shriek of delight and wrapped her arms around Garrett's neck. Oh, William! I do love you so much. I love the ballet. I know, said Garrett. I know. Parked across from Catcher and Lisbeth's modest flat was a new BMW SUV. The doctor sat in the driver's seat, watching, waiting. On the stroke of three o'clock, out stepped Garrett, his jacket slung casually over one shoulder. The doctor smiled as the ex-cop strode to his car, found the keys and drove away. Yes, thought the doctor, Henry would enjoy a few days in Blackpool. He would love the company of the Chinese twins, and Elizabeth Janssen's at just thirteen years old would be the icing on the cake. Girls four, five, and now finally six were chosen. You'll pay dear for your crimes, William Garrett said the doctor. Very dear indeed. Maureen Simons drove Stryker's Audi as he studied the shocking content of the second envelope. He'd already given Fliss Abbott the heads up, and Bob Higgins had been dispatched to Megan Farrell's last known address. The pictures were just as disturbing as the first set. The sex swing had been replaced by a weird X-shaped table, but the outcome was the same. The girl had been viciously raped, tortured and murdered. Stryker held up the evidence bag that contained the memory stick and shuddered at the thought of putting the team through another gruesome showing. Maureen read his mind. "'It won't get any easier, boss,' she said. Stryker let out a long, pained sigh. "'I realise that, Simons. Anyway, what did you think of the mother's reaction? That sort of stoic indifference?' Maureen shrugged. We're none of us the same, Stryker. We all take bad news in different ways. I remember when I was a young probationer, I had to tell a guy his daughter had passed. Nice house it was, nice family. The girl was just fifteen. She'd been at a party a couple of doors down. Her and a mate were upstairs in a bedroom sniffing the gas from an aerosol. Someone at school had told them it would get them high. She sniffed the spray, but the gas re-liquefied inside her lungs and burnt two holes in them you could push your finger through. She was dead before the paramedics started their engine. I remember I stood in the hall of that nice three-bed semi and gave the guy the news. You know what? He attacked me, physically, screamed at me, called me a liar and worse. His wife, the mother, was full of apologies, made me a cup of tea and never shed a tear. Like I said, we're all different. Stryker seemed resigned to the fact that Simons had a point and changed the subject. Our perps are picking girls from exactly the same background. He scrolled his phone. I mean, look here. Sonia Farrow, eight convictions, three for soliciting, one theft, one criminal damage, three for possession of Class A drugs. He switched screens. And now the daughter, Megan, two convictions both for possession of cracker cane, but also stopped and searched three times in the last twelve months, all in the St. Matthews area of town. So Megan was a working girl like her mother. 
Just the same as Melissa and Ruby Ward. So now you agree with me. This is another of Scarface's girls. I bet the shirt off my back. Maureen signalled into the services. I need a pee and a coffee, she said. Stryker just grunted, found a CD in the glove box and pushed it into the car system. Maureen pulled a pained face. What the hell is this? One Quiet Night by Pat Matheny. Who? The album won a Grammy Award. Really? Stryker nodded. I'll listen while you buy the coffee. He wagged a finger. And steer clear of the markers, Simons. Think of all those calories. Maureen returned to the car to find Stryker with his head back and eyes closed. Matheny's baritone guitar soothed him. He opened his eyes and grimaced as she unlocked the door. You took your time, he grunted. Maureen managed to smile. There you go, boss. Double espresso for you and a flat white for me. Stryker turned the stereo down, took the small cup between thumb and forefinger and rested it carefully on the dash. Thanks, Simons. Listen, something has been bugging me for days and I haven't been able to work out what it was. Go on. Well, Ruby Ward said that on the day the package was delivered, she'd been out visiting a client and she'd got back to her flat to find it posted through the door, okay? Okay. And that was seven, maybe eight o'clock. That's what she said. And then she got a taxi to the station and handed over the envelope to the inquiry desk assistant. Go on. So let's say it was eight o'clock and let's say that with the shock and all, it took her a while to get her head together, call a cab and get to the nick. I'll go with that. Well, pointed Stryker, bearing in mind it's no more than a five-minute cab ride. How come she didn't make the station until three minutes to midnight? Maureen took a sip of her coffee. How come indeed? Stryker knocked his coffee down in one. We need to find out which cab company she used. Simons fired up the car. Wish she's hiding something she'll say she can't remember. Stryker opened his phone. Maybe we don't need to ask the question. The pair made it to the office just as Bob Higgins was struggling to open the door, arms laden with all manner of books and paraphernalia he'd recovered from Megan Farrow's flat. All three stepped inside to find Phyllis Abbott arranging the small room, ready to view the latest film. Bob began to lay out Megan's possessions. There were signs of drug use at the gaff, he said flatly, watching Abbott erecting the screen and feeling his discomfort rise by the second. Mum had lived there up until her incarceration in style. I had a quick route in a bedroom. Typical stuff, really. Megan seemed like she'd been coping pretty well on her own. The place was clean enough. There was food in the fridge. Neighbours say they hadn't seen her for at least a week. The old girl next door was almost certain it was longer. Ten days, maybe a fortnight. I'd go with her, to be honest, looking at the used buys on the food. With Mum and Nick, there was no one to report her missing, see? I asked about any other visitors, but it was all vague. Mum used the flat as a place of work, so there were lots of comings and goings. No mention of Scarface? Asked Stryker, hopefully. Bob shook his head. Sorry, boss. Stryker began the grim task of photocopying the eight photographs of Megan Farrow's murder. Finally, he enlarged and copied the two lines of written text. Before he could attach the page to the growing wall of horror, Maureen grabbed it and held it against the note sent in Melissa Ward's package. Totally different, she mumbled, shaking her head. The team looked on as Simons rummaged through Melissa's diaries, opened the page and compared the handwriting. Mmm, she said. Bob, you got any handwritten materials from Megan Farrell's flat? Higgins pushed a small pile of old school books across the desk. Knock yourself out. Simons found what she wanted. Well... We don't need a handwriting expert, that is for sure, she pronounced. Take a look. How a killer gets the girls to write the note themselves. All four detectives huddled around the desk. Definitely, agreed Abbott. Why do that, then? asked Bob. To avoid detection, said Maureen. Control, offered Abbott. Or maybe one of our killers can't write, said Stryker. 
Abbott hunched her shoulders and lifted her palms upward. Well, whatever the reason, the notes themselves are now moot point. You won't find any forensic O.O. fingerprint evidence on them, that's for sure. However, my theory on there being six victims looks all the more likely. Which is a real worry. Tell me something I don't know, said Stryker. The whole thing just doesn't make sense, said Abbott. As I've said before, serial killers don't stop at the set number of fatalities. All the evidence, all the years of research points to the fact that a serial killer or killers only stop when they are caught or die. Stryker rubbed his chin. So what you are saying is our perps are not serial killers as we know them? They don't fit the profile? Fliss cocked her head and removed her glasses. Well, at least one of them doesn't. I'm not too sure about Gimp Mask Boy. Stryker blew out his cheeks and picked up the evidence bag that contained the memory stick. He turned to Detective Higgins. Bob, I need you to find out which taxi company Ruby Ward used to bring her here to the Nick on the night she received her package. I'm pretty sure she went somewhere else first. Bob caught Stryker's eye. He knew what his boss was doing. He knew Stryker was trying to spare him the revulsion of watching another young girl plead for her life. You don't need to do this, boss, he began. Stryker held up a hand. This won't wait, Bob. Tomorrow at least two of us will need to take a day off. We're running on empty here. Just do as I ask, please. Bob pulled on his jacket. I'll check our CCTV right at the nick first, he said quietly. Stryker nodded. Go see Sergeant Stewart in admin. I gave him a call on the way here. He should have the footage waiting. The three listened as Higgins' footsteps grew ever quieter and the lift doors opened. Maureen Simons popped a piece of gum into her mouth. Nice touch, boss, she said. Felicity Abbott paused the film. Both Stryker and Simons were very grateful. Abbott rewound the section and played a ten-second clip over again and scribbled on a pad. Stryker was amazed at the young detective's detached tenacity. The pattern is exactly the same, said Fliss. The film is edited to exactly the same length, the time stamp left for us to mull over. So the time isn't important, then, offered Maureen. Fliss sat. Not in the way you think, Mo, but there is no doubt that it is to the filmmaker. He's showing off, goading us even. I mean, the times are almost identical. Again, a Tuesday, again, the film begins around 1900 hours and ends in the early hours of Wednesday morning. It's a statement. It says, look, I can do this exactly when I want to. It says, even though I've told you how many and even though I've told you when, right down to the minute, there is nothing you can do to stop me. So they killed the next girl the same time next week, asked Simons, exasperation in her voice. Fliss shrugged and turned down her mouth. If they continue to follow this pattern, the next girl dies in a little under seventy-two hours. Everything is the same, said Stryker. Same M.O. for the postage, too. Sent Friday via Hermes for a Saturday delivery. One thing bothers me about that, said Maureen, rooting in her considerable shoulder bag for more nicotine gum. How did the perps know where to send the package? How did they know that Sonia was in style? Maybe Megan told them, said Fliss. She would have done or said anything to be released. Stryker leaned forward, inspected the frozen picture on the screen and tapped it with his finger. Maybe she told your man there when he cut off her feckin' thumb. Fliss and Maureen took a second look. Jesus H. Christ, said Simons. I hadn't seen that. I mean, there's so much blood and gore I'd missed it. Maybe a ring wouldn't come off, said Fliss. Fucking hell, said Maureen, chewing furiously. Haven't they heard of a bit of soap? Why take off all the girls' jewellery anyway? Fliss pushed her hair behind her ears. Serial killers like to take trophies. Robert Hansen killed at least 17 prostitutes, bartenders and waitresses before being caught. When he was finally arrested, he was found to have a large collection of trophies he'd taken from the women including numerous pieces of jewellery. Joel Rifkin murdered over a dozen prostitutes. When he was nicked, they found a haul of trophies from his victims, 
including panties and bras, driving licenses, jewellery, oh, and a particularly decomposed body in his car. Sick fuckers, muttered Simons. Stryker sat back, his head full of data, the familiar electrical impulses jolting his brain into action. Finally, he opened his eyes and caught Fliss Abbott's gaze. You say the one thing that doesn't add up here is that serial killers don't tell you how many victims they will kill because they don't know themselves, correct? Fliss nodded. Okay, said Stryker. Now, did you know that, Simons? Not until today, said Maureen. Well, neither did I. If it wasn't for Abbott here, we would be in the dark. Stryker stood. I think our perps want us to believe this is a serial killing spree. The goading, the calling cards, the trophies. But in actual fact, there is another reason behind it. Like what? said Maureen. Like the guy behind the camera is pushing all the serial killer buttons, but will simply walk away when he has completed what he has started, said Stryker. He tapped the table. Look, our killers knew where Sonia Farrow was, not because Megan told them, but because each victim has been pre-chosen. Each girl has been selected because they have a connection to each other. And that connection is Scarface. Both women nodded. Stryker took a breath. And I think this Scarface is a powerful guy, a solicitor or a judge, maybe even a cop. That's why all those customers of Melissa's diaries are connected to the legal profession. If he's not directly involved in the murders, someone is telling him his days are numbered as a pimp. Either way, he's our priority. I'd have thought your priority would be to stop the next kid being butchered on Tuesday night. All three of the team turned to see DCI Alan Blunt standing in the doorway. When Bob Higgins had left the room, the door had remained slightly ajar. Obviously, Blunt had been earwigging before making his entrance. "'I reckon it's best you trot on back to your office there, Chief,' said Stryker menacingly. Blunt ignored the thinly-veiled threat and walked over to the storyboard. "'Another one, then. Megan Faro, you see,' he mused, examining the shocking display. "'Name rings a bell.' Maureen Simon stood nervously. Well, she has a bit of form, sir, but if you don't mind, we need to get on, and as you know, this investigation is very delicately balanced, so if you don't mind... Blunt turned his head sharply. But I do mind, detective, he spat. I mind a whole fucking lot, and listening to your glorious leader's ramblings just then, I'd say you need all the help you can get. Seems to me you have the square root of fuck all between you. I reckon that this time next week you'll be looking at another set of dead kids' pictures and you'll still have your thumbs up your arses. Stryker felt his temper start to get the better of him. You're entitled to your opinion there, Blunt. But it's just that, your opinion. And as you have no authority in this office, I suggest you leave before I throw you out. Blunt formed a narrow smile. I don't think so, Stryker. You played your ace the other night and won the hand. Play the same cards again and it will be the end of your career. He pointed and hissed. I'll make it my life's work. Blunt wandered to the table where some of Melissa Ward's effects were stacked in plastic crime scene bags. Young Melissa kept a diary, you see. Stryker's head felt like it may explode. He eyed Blunt carefully, watched his movements, his eyes... The way they darted between the naked images on the board, the diaries stacked neatly on the desk, and the two easels showing the nicknames and chronology of Melissa Ward's clients. Blunt was snooping for a reason. He wasn't shocked by the images. In fact, Stryker was sure in some sick way he got a kick out of them. But there was something more. Deep inside that hard-nosed facade lay fear. It was well hidden. But it was there. How well did you know Melissa so? Asked Stryker, catching Blunt off balance. The DCI quickly recovered his composure. I didn't. I spoken to the mother a couple of times over the years is all. Stryker curled his lip. And you wouldn't be knowing a man with a big scar on his face. A man, say, 
55, heavy set, a pimp specializing in underage girls, provides them to lawyers, magistrates, cops even, including one calling himself the chief. Blunt screwed up his nose as if there was a bad smell in the room. He pointed at the easels. You aren't suggesting I'm on this list, are you, Striker? The detective sergeant shrugged and caught Blunt's eye. All manner of explosions went off in his head. She calls one of her regulars just that. Funny that, eh? And you identified her from a quick glance at those pictures. Not easy. Blunt stepped closer to Striker, but not close enough to be in touching distance. Be careful there, Sonny. Be very careful what you say. Fliss Sabbath couldn't contain herself any longer. There will be more, sir, she said with a hint of nervous tremor in her voice. More victims, I mean. And you're right, I would doubt that we will be able to prevent the next one without a massive stroke of luck. However, it is interesting that the profiles of Melissa's clients are all similar. Mid-forties to early fifties, professionals with enough cash to splash around, all probably married too. Definitely all from the Lancashire area, all connected to this Scarface guy. All paedophiles, of course. Blunt swung around, his face contorted in a vicious sneer. Don't come out with me, young lady. Keep a psycho babble for those who are naive enough to fall for it. Fliss had found her voice and with it her confidence. Psycho babble, is it, sir? Profiling isn't just for the perpetrators, you know. It isn't just for that sick fuck in the gimp mask or the guy pulling the strings behind the camera. No, sir, it's for the victims and the associates of those victims, too. In Melissa and Megan's case, that means the men that paid to sleep with them when they were still children. Blunt began his tactical exit. He was red-faced and sweating. He stood at the door, hand resting on the handle. I'll have you know, I'm a happily married man with two daughters the same age as those two poor girls. I came in here to see if I could help you. Give you the benefit of my twenty-three years of experience and all I get are these ridiculous suggestions. He turned and slammed the door behind him. All three detectives looked at each other in silence. Finally, Maureen Simons broke it. You think he's in those diaries, don't you, Stryker? Don't you? he said. Chapter 22 Alan Blunt half walked, half ran to his car. By the time he sat in the driver's seat, he was breathing hard, his shirt sodden with perspiration. Finding his special mobile, he dialed Garrett and waited. Will answered on the fourth ring. Blunt detected a hint of irritation in his voice. Is your dick always hard, Blunty? The DCI was in no mood for frivolity. Listen, Will, for fuck's sake, listen. There's been a second murder, another of, of your, our girls, that Megan, the one from a couple of years back. What the fuck is going on, Will? Garrett sat in silence, his mind a whirring turmoil. Meet at our local, he said, and delete this number from your phone. The line went dead. Blunt started his engine and drove towards the flying fish. The two men sat in the corner of the tap room, the traditional open fire and range redundant during the summer heat. Did you do as I asked? questioned Garrett. Blunt nodded and took a long drink of his bitter. I ditched the phone altogether, as I pay as you go anyway. It's best, offered Garrett, until I sort out this mess. What will you do, Will? We shouldn't blow the whistle and frighten all the chaps after death just yet. It could be pure coincidence. Let's face it, Ruby and Sonia have been whoring for a fucking long time and there are a lot of sickos out there. So you don't think it's personal? Garrett was convinced it was personal. Very fucking personal indeed. And when he found out just who was trying to ruin his business, he would make it even more personal. Blood would be spilled and it wouldn't be teenage girls doing the bleeding. However, he held his water. Maybe not, but it's possible, he said. I'm really worried, said Blunt, holding up a hand. No, well, I'm in it this time. This striker guy, he's on to me. I know he is. I could see it in his face. He bit his lip. That Melissa, she kept fucking diaries. 
Garrett's dander was instantly up. She named names. Blunt shook his head so hard his jowls wobbled. No, thank fuck. She used nicknames like the Chief or the Beak. Not hard to decipher, eh? Garrett calmed and sipped his beer. But it's nothing but conjecture and assumption, Blunty. What they suspect is one thing, but what they can prove is quite another. Ask the IPCC. They found nothing. Even so, I think we need to strike it off our backs. Garrett sipped his own pint. Surely you have some connections there, Alan. I mean, look at what you and a few of your pals achieved when the Complaints Commission came sniffing around a while back. Compared to them, this striker is small potatoes. From what you're saying, he isn't setting the world alight. Two dead teenage girls, no bodies and no clues. I reckon the suits upstairs will be getting a tad twitchy, don't you think? Why not get him potted, or moved at least? That's just my point, Well, I've put the feelers out in the usual places and everyone's mouths are sealed tight as a drum. Maybe that IPCC thing has given them the yips. Blunt's eyes watered as he spoke. I think they brought in Stryker from the cold because he doesn't have any axe to grind. Graham trusts him. I mean, have you ever come across any of his team? Bob Higgins, for instance? Garrett shook his head. What about Maureen Simons? What on rape crisis? Or Fles Abbott, young kid, psychological profiler, apparently. Clever little bitch. No, never heard of him. I spent most of my service on the file, Alan, you know that. And unlike some always kept me head down. Well, they've got the four of them locked in a little office, all as secretive as you like. There's no press coverage and no support from Section CID old uniform. Will took another drink. He didn't like the fact that Blunt was so twitchy. It was a time for calm heads. You always played by my rules, didn't you, Blunty? No souvenirs, no pairs of little white panties stuffed in a drawer somewhere, no pictures for your private collection. Of course not. I'm not daft, Will. And I can't see any of the other lads letting anything slip either. I mean, everyone in the group has an awful lot to lose. Garrett appeared calm, but he felt like a swan on a pond, serene and composed above water, but paddling like fuck below. Tell you what, Blunty, why not leave all this to me? Let me deal with this paddy bastard striker, and I'll have a sniff about the girls, see if anyone's been a bit too talkative. I can't have some mad Russian bastard or whoever slotting my girls and ruining my business now, can I? Sooner or later, it will hit the press, and I'll have every whore with a kid thinking they're next on the list. Garrett grabbed Blunt by the wrist. The fact that Melissa kept diaries was news to him. Blunt may know some of what was contained in those pages, but not all. That, in itself, was a major issue. But with Alan Blunt shaking like a shitting dog, Garrett had to take action before things got out of hand. Scared people do stupid things. Listen to me, Blunty. I know I asked you to keep an eye out, but things have changed now. So no more snooping in their office, OK? Steer clear. In fact, why not take a little holiday, eh? Treat the missus to a trip abroad. The DCI didn't look too pleased. Oh, come on, well, I can't stand to be around on more than an hour or two, never mind a full week. Whenever Garrett needed the DCI to play ball, he always played his ace card. Weakness was the reason he'd made so much money over the years. Weakness and lasciviousness. And Blunt was the epitome of both. He leaned in and took out his phone. He opened the pictures of 13-year-old Lisbeth Janssen posing in her school uniform. Take a look at her, Blunty. What do you think, eh? Pure as the driven snow. Despite everything... Despite the fear of being caught, the investigation, the diaries, the two dead girls, Blunt couldn't take his eyes from Lisbeth. His addiction, his sickness, overpowering him in an instant. Oh, my, well, oh, my. How old? Come on, be truthful now. She don't look of age, nowhere close. Will slid his arm around Blunt's shoulders. I've always looked after you, ain't I, Blunty? Always been there when you needed your fun. Blunt wiped his top lip. Yes, well, 
Cost you have. Well, let me say this. You keep your head down for the next few days, and when you come back from your little trip, I'll let you be the first to have this little one. Take a cherry. What do you say, eh? Garrett wandered to his car. The solution to his problem was twofold. Find out who was trying to ruin his business and stop the investigation in its tracks. Whoever was picking up his old girls and sending those pictures to Mummy intended him harm, no doubt. Well, they'd picked on the wrong guy. Someone in the dark world would know something, and he knew everyone that mattered. And as for that cop striker, well, he wouldn't know what hit him. Errol Graham's lounge was cosy, all soft lines, big cushions and woollen throws. A log burner filled an open hearth, and Stryker considered that the rune would be at its best in the winter months when it blazed away. Errol's wife, Emily, was in the kitchen preparing chicken rice and peas, and Stryker's stomach rumbled in anticipation. Graham was reading Stryker's update on proceedings. "'This is terrible, Ewan,' he began. This suggestion that police officers are involved in a child sex ring is shocking. I have to say, not altogether surprising. Stryker let out his long trademark sigh. It was a sound of a man pained. He'd kept his feelings about Blunt's possible involvement out of the report for now. Even he didn't trust his so-called gift enough to drop a DCI in the frame without stronger evidence. But it was time for some home truths. Well, my concern is that you are not altogether surprised. Is that why we're being kept in the dark? Is that why we are running what could turn out to be the biggest murder investigation since Brady and Hendley on a shoestring? Graham rubbed his face with both hands, then caught Stryker's eye. I invited you here to tell you the full story, you and I hope then you'll understand why, you know, where we are. But what we discuss here stays here, okay? Stryker nodded. Graham pursed his lips. Several months ago, the IPCC began an investigation into allegations of a child prostitution ring involving serving officers and other senior figures in the legal professions. I think we've got to that, muttered Stryker. Graham pulled a face and ploughed on. The lead investigator believed that the team were close to identifying some of the offenders, yet the commission still closed the book on the job. No charges, no names, no pack drill. Now, as you can imagine, with the recent events over in Yorkshire and Greater Manchester, this was a worry to the Chief Constable. The last thing the force needed was to be in the same boat as those forces, and he wasn't convinced there was no fire to go with the smoke. I'm sensing a big butt here. Oh, there was. Despite the suggestion that one of the lead investigators had been got at, the official IPCC report branded the whole case to be a fantasy. Street talk amongst the local prostitutes. Finally, the chief gave in and the case was closed. I smell bullshit. As did I. And despite much desk banging, the investigation was in danger of being swept under the carpet. Graham lowered his voice. The instant we received the package of photographs depicting Melissa Ward's murder, everything changed. You see, before things went balls up with the IPCC investigation, their inquiry had suggested that this child prostitution ring was being organised by a solitary, as yet unidentified police officer. A man who had been grooming young girls over many years and selling them on to other members of the ring he had created. Their information pointed to the possibility that these girls were sold with their mother's consent and that they were the daughters of known prostitutes. The moment I showed those pictures, together with Ruby and Melissa's antecedents to the chief, he agreed with me that the murder and the IPCC investigation were inextricably linked. It was his idea that we form a special unit to investigate the case. And keep the rest of the force in the dark. Exactly, Ewan. And now, except for you and the three cops in your team... We have no one to trust. 
I hate to tar all the force with the same brush, but until this man is identified and we know the full extent of these allegations, that's the way I and the chief con, for that matter, want it played. Stryker scratched his head. So this IPCC file, the one with the suspects they were investigating. Where is it? Graham shrugged and shook his head. It's a close file. You know the way they work. They're a law unto themselves, you and... Not even the chief has seen the details. Emily made a light coughing sound as she entered the lounge carrying two steaming plates of Jamaican food. She'd obviously been required to announce her arrival in her own front room on many occasions, and this was her coded message to her husband to stop talking shop. Thank you, Mrs. Graham, said Stryker, resting the plate on his knee. It looks delicious. Emily's jerk chicken was famous back home in Port Antonio, offered Errol biting into a drumstick. And I can see why, said Stryker. I removed the fat and the skin from the chicken, you would, said Emily with a smile. I know you are health conscious, and I think my adult could do with losing a pound or two himself. Stryker watched Emily turn back to the kitchen to collect her own plate. She was a handsome woman, with wonderful skin and a fabulous smile. You are a lucky man there, sir, he said. Graham wiped his mouth with a napkin. As fine a woman you could never come across in ten lifetimes, he said. My God, I chased her around the whole of Jamaica. Emily walked in. And he finally caught me and brought me here to England. I should kill him. There were smiles all around, and for the time it took to eat well and down a cold sarsaparilla, all talk of murder and depravity was put aside. Stryker stood on the doorstep and shook Errol Graham's hand. Thanks for the dinner, sir. I don't get to see much company myself. Well, maybe you should do something about that then, Ewan, offered the senior man. Stryker shrugged his massive shoulders. I might do that. Thank Emily for the food, he said. Chapter 23 Fliss Abbott opened her flat door, dropped her bag and shuffled towards the kitchen. She was exhausted. She, Simons and Stryker had watched the second film over and over. If it were possible, she considered it even more graphic and depraved than the first. As the sun began its descent, Stryker had dismissed the team for the day and given her and Maureen the following day off. As she leaned against the fridge in her meagre kitchen, she could see her bag sitting on her carpeted hallway, bulging with files and notebooks. Some day off... She opened her refrigerator door and examined the contents. One pack of cooked ham opened and curling at the edges. One tub of coleslaw, four days out of date. A shriveled red pepper and half a tomato. She pulled a carton of skimmed milk from the door recess, unscrewed the cap and sniffed. Not good. Fliss turned her attention to the freezer, removed a ready meal that announced it contained chicken tikka masala and basmati rice, and pushed it into the microwave. Then, returning to the fridge, she found the one consumable item that remained. A bottle of Chardonnay. Result! Pouring a large glass, she sloped to the bathroom and ran a shower. Five minutes later, she sat at her small, round kitchen table in a pink, fluffy dressing gown, one that her mother had bought her for Christmas, sipping her wine and chasing reconstituted lumps of bright red chicken around her plate. This Abbott is no life. Fliss flopped on the sofa and surfed the Saturday night channels. As any form of pay TV was out of the question on her wages, it quickly became apparent that if she wasn't interested in a singing contest or celebrities trying to ice skate, there was nothing to watch. She fought with herself for a full fifteen minutes before collecting her swollen bag from the hall then sat cross-legged on the floor of her small lounge, surrounded by small piles of paper, ordered in a system that only she could fathom. During her second glass, there was a knock at her door. She picked herself up, wrapped her dressing gown tightly around her nakedness, and peered suspiciously through the spy hole. She recognised her visitor immediately. "'What do you want, Tim?' she shouted. 
"'Come on, Fliss,' he replied, the merest hint of a slur in his voice. "'Open the door, at least. I just want to talk to you.' "'We've nothing to talk about, Tim,' said Fliss, leaving the door firmly closed. "'Look, I need to see you. But I don't want to see you, Tim. We're finished, you know that, after what happened.' Come on, Fliss, please. It's five minutes. I'm getting home now, you know. I've changed. But you were still drinking, aren't you, Tim? I can hear it in your voice. Now go away or I'll call the cops. Oh, no, Fliss, please don't do that. Look, just two minutes of your time. Let me tell you what I've been doing, the help I've been getting. Fliss, please don't push me away. We were so good together. Felicity Abbott had known Tim Brandt since her time at university. They had fallen madly in love and seemed a perfect match, both physically and intellectually. But during her scholarship at Quantico, Tim had become increasingly jealous. He'd found the separation almost impossible to bear, and each time she had returned from the States it had been one long diatribe about who she had been seeing— who she'd been for a drink with, who she'd allegedly slept with. The truth was, Fliss Abbott hadn't been seeing anyone, or been in the slightest unfaithful. But it was no use. Tim was convinced. Once the scholarship was over, they'd moved to Lancashire. Fliss joined the police force, and Tim began working as a biology teacher in the local high school. Things appeared to be on an even keel. However, on the nights Tim drank, he would always bring up Quantico. Over the following months, things deteriorated and he became increasingly aggressive, until one drunken evening he lost all control and beat Abbott badly. Her nose was fractured and she needed hospital treatment. Fliss knew all about violence. She knew all about wife-beaters, the way they worked, the way they balanced their behaviour in their heads. She also knew they rarely changed. She'd kicked Tim out that same night. Despite her breaking heart, she'd thrown all his clothes and possessions into black bin liners and dumped them outside her flat door. Thankfully, she had never seen him since. Until now. I mean it, Tim. I'm dialing the police now, she lied. No, no, don't do that. You don't understand, Fliss. I'm destitute. I lost my job. I have nothing and no one. All I ask is that you let me talk to you face to face. Come on, Fliss, I'm begging you. She was close to opening the door until she detected a change in Tim's tone. It was all about you, he whispered, all for you. Don't you understand that? I did what I did that night to help you. "'to make you see where you went wrong, "'to show you the error of your ways.' "'Fliss snorted her derision. "'So you broke my nose to teach me a lesson. "'Show me my place. Is that it, Tim?' "'Fliss found her mobile in her dressing gown pocket. "'Look, go now, Tim. Now. I mean it, or I'll call the cops and have you arrested.' "'She heard him kneel, so his mouth was next to her letterbox. "'You won't do that, Fliss.' Oh, I will. No, no, you won't. And do you know why you won't? Fliss was silent. Because deep down inside you still love me, Fliss. There's never been anyone else since we split, has there? No men in your life. You sit alone every night with a TV dinner and a bottle of prong to make you sleep. You work eighty hours a week for a pittance and you call it a career choice. Abbott opened her phone just as she heard the noise outside. There was a grunting sound and a loud thump. This was followed by several smacks and thuds. Seconds later there was silence. She looked through the spy hole again to see Stryker standing there holding Tim by the collar. You want him lifted, or shall I just throw him out? She fell back against the wall and closed her eyes. Just get rid of him, please, Stryker. There were more grunts and the odd cry of pain from Tim as Stryker Man handled him out into the night. Moments later, Fliss stood at her open door and Stryker appeared, wiping claret from his jacket. 
You okay? He said. I I I'm fine. Could have handled it myself, actually. Striker shrugged. You got any coffee? I need to pick your brains. Nescafe? You mean instant? Striker shook his head. Best you get dressed and come to mind then, so. People might talk, you know, getting the wrong impression. Why, because I like good coffee? No, because it's getting late. I won't tell if you don't. Bob Higgins had viewed the footage of the cab that brought Ruby Ward to the Nick that fateful night. It was easily identifiable as the logo and office number were plastered along the side of the VW Passat that she'd stepped out of. He'd chosen to walk to the taxi office, as it was only ten minutes away, and he felt he needed the air. Have a Cab was situated at the top of Corporation Street, next door to a fast food outlet. Bob stepped inside and was immediately greeted by the woman behind the counter. "'Well, if it isn't PC Higgins,' she said. When Bob first joined the force, he'd walked Corporation Street as part of his foot patrol beat. Have a Cab was a popular brew stop for the local beat cops. Shelley Green had worked the evening shift in that same office since 1995 and had revived many a cold and wet foot patrol in her time, including a young Bob Higgins.' "'Bloody hell, Shelley,' smiled Bob. "'You still here, love? "'But you've got shares in the gaff, eh? "'I wish, Bob. "'Copper?' "'The ageing detective nodded. "'Shelley opened the staff door and let him inside. "'The office was uncomfortably warm, "'and a small fan whirred in one corner, "'fighting a losing battle against the evening humidity. "'Bob sat in an ancient chair, "'the fabric so warm the stuffing was visible through each arm.' See, old Marty still hasn't put his hand in his pocket for some new furniture, he said, picking at the chair's filling. Shelley boiled the grubby white plastic kettle and found a semi-clean cup. Fucking hell, Bob, you know Marty, he wants where the penny where I he will do, pal, even if he is a millionaire. That's why he's a millionaire, eh? offered the detective. Shelley rested the cup on the arm of the chair. Anyway, what brings Bob Higgins here? I heard you was a murder detective these days. No one's been topped, have they? Bob sipped his tea. Don't panic, love. Nothing to worry about. He fished in his jacket and pulled out a still from the station CCTV system. It clearly showed the havoc cab vehicle Ruby had used, parked outside the nick. I need to know where that driver picked up his fare from, love. Time and date are stamped on the picture at the top. Shelley picked up her readers and peered at the photograph. Hmm she said, tapping her way at her computer. Cab was for, um, Ruby. She's a regular. You know, she's a sort, right? Bob nodded. Not interested in her, just where she was picked up from. Shall he tap some more? Golden Ball Pub, Longton. Time? asked Bob. A quarter to twelve, love. Higgins made a note in his book. I don't suppose you could see if she did the outward to Longton in one of your cabs, could you? Shelley pulled her face. Mm, not so easy if we don't have a rough time. Between seven and eight, we reckon. I'll have a search and get back to you on that. Could take me a while. OK, said Bob, draining his brew. How long? Shelley smiled as the phone started ringing. It's Saturday night, Bob. I'm here on my own till eight at least. I'll bell you if I find anything. Promise, love. Cheers, Shell, said Bob, pulling his large frame from the depths of the chair. I'll be about till late. Shelley eyed Higgins. You look all in, mate. I reckon you should buy yourself a kebab from next door and get home to your cat quick sharp. Bob managed to smile. Yeah, probably right. But you won't. Bob shook his head. This is important, ain't it, pal? said Shelley, ignoring the ringing switchboard. Bob didn't answer. Thought so, she said. I'll call you soon as, love. Chapter 24 Henry had returned to the farm in Pitt's transit. He'd made an out-of-hours collection from Fullwood, dropped the body back at the funeral home and decided that the van would be the best vehicle for the job. After all, it had the very latest satellite navigation system installed, 
and Henry couldn't find his own backside without that. He'd slipped Megan's limbs, head and torso, into plastic bags and then pushed those into a body bag that was always kept in the vehicle to move the dead from the place of their demise to the funeral parlour. It came in rather handy. During the process of dismembering the girl, Henry had been forced to put a carrier bag over Megan's head. Despite his best efforts to close them, her eyes had remained stubbornly open and she'd stared at him the whole time he was cutting into her. Henry didn't mind the blood or the cracking bones, but he didn't care for being stared at. As he drove from the farm to the burial site where he would dispose of Megan's body parts, Henry considered that using Pitt's van for this task was quite a clever idea. Should he be randomly stopped by the police, they would not think to examine the contents of the body bag. Simply knowing the van was registered to the funeral parlour would be enough for them not to disturb the dead. All Henry had to do was keep to his story that he'd just collected a corpse and was in the process of returning it to his place of work. Clever boy, Henry. It had taken him over an hour to bury the various limbs on the moors, cover his tracks back to the van, and another two hours at the parlour to clean the vehicle inside and out until it shone. Henry ran his finger across the face of his watch. Yes, he thought, he still had enough time. Leaving the van at the parlour, he slipped into his own car and drove to Ribbleton. Even though it was only a few minutes' drive from the parlour, and he'd been before, he still got lost once. Finally, feeling ever so frustrated by his lack of sense of direction, he parked between two other vehicles on the street. Henry then turned off the motor and sunk down in his seat. From his position he had a clear view of the upstairs rooms of Lucy Stevenson's house. All he had to do now was wait and hope. A little before eleven, Henry got his wish. A light came on in the left-hand bedroom, and there she was. Lucy wore pink pyjamas. Her hair was tied back in a ponytail, and she stood looking out into the night. She stretched upwards to open her bedroom window. As she did so, she briefly revealed her bare, flat stomach. Henry rubbed himself. He couldn't take his eyes from her. She was the most beautiful girl in the world. Clean, innocent, untouched. Henry knew what the doctor would say. What the doctor may do if he broke the rules. But Henry wanted Lucy. He wanted her virtue, her naivety. Henry knew that the doctor had chosen the last three girls. Two sisters, both whores, and one other young blonde, but she too, despite her tender age, was a common prostitute. Not one of them could hold a candle to Lucy Stevenson. Lucy would be girl six. Henry would make sure of it. Henry was a clever boy, see? Do you always sit on a fecking floor so? asked Stryker as he watched Fliss Abbott studying her bag of notes and files. I've perfectly good armchairs available. She took a sip of very nice shabbly that, to her surprise, Stryker had chilling in the fridge. I've always done this. I like to be able to spread out the information in a circle around me. It's a technique I use when trying to solve anagrams, too. I write the letters in a loop. Sometimes it makes everything easier to spot. Stryker lifted himself from the chair and turned over the album playing on the turntable. And the music doesn't disturb you there? Fliss shook her head. Not at all. It's actually quite nice. I've never heard music like it before. But it's, it's kind of cool, I suppose. Who is this, by the way? A band called Return to Forever. Stanley Clark, Chick Corea, Lenny White and Al Mayola. Before my time, I suppose. And mine there, Abbott. This was recorded in 1976, when Clark was studying jazz at Barclay. He later told a reporter that during this period the band members were actually writing music so complex that none of them could play it. They seem to be managing. They are, indeed, said Stryker as he picked up his coffee. So, where are we up to in the psychological profiling world? Why has our killer selected Melissa Warden Megan Farrow as the first two victims? 
Liz spun herself around a half-turn and selected two piles of paper. Then she looked up. You need to sit down. I can't show you with you towering above me. Stryker looked ever so slightly uncomfortable, but still sidled up alongside the young detective. Despite his sitting position, he still dwarfed her. Fliss didn't appear to mind his close proximity. However, she blushed slightly as she spoke. The girls were born twenty months apart, both to known prostitutes, both fathers unknown. There isn't the detail in Megan's notebooks and diaries that we found in Melissa's, but it doesn't take a genius to see the same patterns evolving from around the age of twelve or thirteen. From there, diary entries all become excitable rants, even a trip out to the MEN to see Take That. Stryker looked puzzled. Who? Fliss smiled. Slightly more famous amongst teenage girls than your return to what's it? Forever, he corrected. Yes, said Fliss. But this concert was just one of several expensive gifts given to Megan between reaching puberty and passing sixteen. From there it all follows the same pattern. Less money, more talk of other boys and her mother's habit. The end of the gravy train. Anything else? Megan's last entry in her diary is a doctor's appointment, eleven days ago. If I were a betting sort of girl, I would suggest she didn't make it. I think our perps had been holding her for at least that length of time. You'd think she was picked up off the street by our guy in the black shiny Ford. Fliss dropped the papers on the floor. All I can say is that our killers are very, very particular extremely careful, and both are enormously intelligent. Meaning? Meaning, if something works for you, then why change the M.O.? So I think Megan was picked up by our gimp mask boy on the pretext of him being a punter, and held until her death on Tuesday night. And it wouldn't surprise me if all six girls have already been selected. Some may already be imprisoned, awaiting their fate. But you've still not told me why. Fliss let out a long breath. The guy you bounced out of my apartment block tonight broke my nose. He did it because he was jealous of other men he believed were in my life. He was misinformed. Everything he believed was no more than a complex set of imaginary circumstances he convinced himself were true. However, should you have taken the time to ask Tim why he'd assaulted me, he would have given you that same answer. I should have hit him harder, muttered Stryker. Fliss shook her head. Look, men like Tim believe that by punishing the people they care about, they're in some way helping them, showing them where they went wrong, the error of their ways. But women like Ruby and Sonya have very little choice in their lives. True, but the ones they made were bad ones. You think our killers are punishing the women, the girls and their mothers? Fliss nodded slowly. It's a strong possibility. Them or Scarface. Maybe even all three of them. Stryker crossed his legs and leaned forward. So, other than a delusional woman beater, who was the guy at your door? Fliss sat back using her hands for support and scrunched up her nose. She wore Levi's and a bright red T-shirt, devoid of any makeup, her hair somewhat wayward. Stryker thought her even more attractive than usual. Her eyes glistened behind her glasses. Long lost love, she offered. His name, as I mentioned, is Tim. Tim Brandt. We met at uni. He was my first real boyfriend, I suppose. She smiled, and Stryker thought she looked very beautiful. My last two, so far. It was over between us a long time ago. Like I said... He has problems. I gathered. Fliss took another sip of wine and changed the subject. Tell me something then, Stryker. He shrugged those shoulders. Go on. Why would a guy who is teetotal with no girlfriend have such a nice bottle of wine chilling in his refrigerator? I was a Boy Scout. Fliss let out a small laugh. Oh, I see. Be prepared and all that. Yeah, something like that. My dad, he never drank all his life. 
My old mum liked a glass of Guinness, but wasn't a drinker. Even so, we had a cabinet full of booze for guests. Fliss looked shocked. Are you telling me both your parents are dead? Oh, my, I'm sorry. They must have been quite young. Stryker nodded. My dad was a U.S. Navy SEAL. He was seconded to the British SBS over in Belfast. That was where he met my mother, Margaret Mary. He fell in love and my mom became pregnant. Being a Catholic in that part of Ireland and having an illegitimate child was a big thing back then, so they moved to the States, my dad's hometown, Chicago. I came along, they later married, and everything was good. Then my dad got sick, eating cancer. We lost him when I was seventeen. Mom and me returned to Ireland soon after. She was killed by a hit-and-run driver two years later. That's awful. That's life, Abbott. And now you keep the wine for your long line of guests, is that it? Mm, not exactly. Okay, how many visitors in the last year? Including you? Uh-huh. Three. Fliss looked into Stryker's face. No one could ever call him handsome. His eyes were deep-set, and although they were a fine shade of blue, they had that edge of unpredictability to them. There were numerous small scars around his brows, the kind you see boxers sporting after years in the ring. He was definitely a man who cut his own hair. Somewhere in the house were electric clippers set to number one guard, and Fliss considered that they got used each morning on his head and beard to prevent the appearance of wayward curls. But what Stryker lacked in the classically handsome department, he more than made up for in other ways. There was a gentleness about him that belied his size and tremendous strength, easily missed by the casual observer. But Abbott could see it. Let me guess, she said. So, me, D.C.S. Graham, and... Who? A shadow seemed to fall across Stryker's face. That would be Tag Westland, he said quietly. Ah, said Fliss, and you carry that guilt like the good Catholic boy you are. Is that it? I haven't been to church in a long time. But yeah, I feel the responsibility. Fliss looked into his eyes. It wasn't your fault, Ewan. She edged ever closer to him. And I think you're a good man. Fliss was so close that she could feel the warmth of Stryker's breath against her lips. I always said I'd never get involved with a cop, she whispered. He stroked her hair so gently. Is that what this is? Involvement? I'm not sure. Not sure of what? Not sure this is my best idea, she breathed. It's your best tonight so far, said Stryker, pulling her to him. Chapter 25 Bob Higgins sat in the Deepdale Café, tucking into a full English. Stryker watched him eat. You always have this for breakfast, Bob? he asked, eyeing the grease solidifying around the edge of the plate. Bob shook his head. Once a week treat, Stryker. You can feel your arteries hardening with each mouthful, but it's bloody good. I'd give it a miss myself there, so I don't eat anything fried. You have to have some fun in your life, you know. Stryker stifled a yawn and considered that with just an hour's sleep last night, he was having enough fun for the pair of them. He sipped truly awful coffee. So how'd you get on with the taxi for him? I did try and ring your boss. It was about eleven o'clock. Suppose you was in bed. Stryker almost smiled. I was, yeah. Well, the upshot is, Ruby is a regular with Have a Cab. She uses them to take her to and from her weekend clients. They say she was picked up from home and dropped off at the Golden Ball pub in Longton just after half eight. She was then collected from the same place around 11.45 and dropped at the Nick. I spoke to the driver. He said she seemed very upset on both journeys, and 
that on the way back she was piss wet through. Well, that fits, said Stryker. That Saturday night it fecking through it down. So she walked somewhere, offered Bob. Stryker pushed his coffee cup across the table, unable to finish it. Definitely. A quick question for you now, Robert. He leaned his elbows on the table. Where do you live? Bob looked puzzled, but went with the flow. New Longton. The next village to where the pub is? In a way. Close to the police HQ? Yeah. I thought so, said Stryker. How many serving or retired cops do you think live in that area? Bob blew out his cheeks. Hard to say, but because of the colony, I would hazard a guess it dozens. The colony? Well before your time, Stryker. But in the days when cops weren't allowed to buy their own houses, it was the responsibility of the constabulary to provide them with accommodation. Obviously, when HQ was a full-on training school, there was a need for a good few houses, so they built an estate adjacent to the complex. He got the nickname The Colony. They've mainly been sold off now, but I reckon there are still quite a few cops there. And in Longton, walking distance from the Golden Ball. Popular with senior officers, a bit on the pricey side for PCs, but I reckon there'll be a fair few cops in that area, yeah. Stryker spoke half to himself. If you'd been reliant on a guy like Scarface for half your life, had a relationship with him, even allowed your own daughter to be groomed by him, and you received a package like that, who would you turn to first? The cops or him? Him? Why? Ask him what to do. Uh, no, too scared to go to the cops without his say-so. Stryker pointed. Correct. And I'm thinking Scarface is definitely a cop. A cop that lives within walking distance of the Golden Ball. I think, in pure desperation, Ruby went to his house. However, even in her hour of need, she would have been too scared to go knock on the door. Maybe Scarface is married, kids, who knows. He's obviously got a terrific hold over his girls. They must be terrified of him, or we'd know his identity by now. So, Ruby hangs around waiting for him to leave the house. Or come home. True. Which is why she was soaked to the skin. But finally, somehow, she meets him, and he gives her the nod to come to the nick. Stryker scratched his head. And if that is so, it makes me think that he isn't directly involved in the murders. Makes me feel like D.C. Abbott's theory is on the money, and he's the one the killers want to hurt. Like they're out to destroy his business. Maybe the man behind the camera is a rival pimp? Either way, Ruby was still scared enough to cover her tracks and walk back to the pub, rather than be collected from Scarface's home address. I'll bet that's something she does all the time, offered Bob. You know, to protect the client's identities. Discretion is a must in her game. Stryker tapped the table. So, I want you to get a list of all serving and retired male police officers of any rank living in that area. Even if this guy is not our cameraman, he could lead us to the next victim. But I'd just love to slam that cell door on the sick pedo bastard. Bob sat back in his seat. I'm with you on that one, boss, but... There's no chance of obtaining that kind of info, not on a Sunday. The lads still serving will be listed at HQHR, and the retired officers will be recorded at Lancashire County Hall, the pension service. They're all nine-to-five SO guys in those places. Stryker snorted his frustration. SO? Every Saturday and Sunday off, explained Bob. Stryker shook his head. OK, so what about the list of black-coloured Sierras, like the one we reckon Gimp Mask Boy was driving when he picked up Melissa Ward? We can have a go at them today, can't we? Bob nodded. I printed it off just before I left last night. It's in our office. How many? It was Bob's turn to laugh down his nose. You wouldn't believe it, boss. He pulled out his notebook. The Ford Sierra Sapphire was manufactured between 1982 and 1993, 
the Granada between 1972 and 1994, although the Mark Ones were quite distinctive, so I've discounted anything before 1983. I also figured that the Orion model should be thrown into the mix, as it would look similar from a distance in the dark. They were made from 1983 to 1993. You've still not said how many, Bob. I searched postcode locations for Blackpool and Fylde, Lancaster, Preston, Blackburn, Burnley, Chorley and Skelmersdale. Stryker let out a long, pained sigh. And... 207. Feck. Feck indeed, boss. We need another pair of hands each. Henry stood outside the newsagent's shop. To his left he could see the floodlights of Bloomfield Road football ground. To his right, Blackpool Tower. Henry liked Blackpool. He liked the fun fair. He especially liked it on sunny days like today, when the girls wore short skirts and cropped tops. But Henry was not in town for fun, at least not the kind provided by the Big Dipper or the Hall of Mirrors. He peered in the shop window, the one the doctor had told him to look in. Attached to the inside of the glass were several handwritten cards. Cindy, high-class escort, the first said. Mistress Dominatrix, announced another. Finally he found the one he wanted. Tie two girl massage. Henry carefully punched the phone number from the card into his mobile and dialed. Twenty minutes later he found himself sitting in a small tidy lounge, but not in front of two tie twins. Instead, he sat across from a woman wearing a silk kimono and little else. Henry felt the fear dragon creep up his spine. This was not in the plan. The doctor never mentioned another woman. It was the twins. Just the twins. Go to the house, fuck them if you want, drug them and bring them to the farm. Simple. He could feel the dragon's claw on his skin his self-control slipping through his fingers, the anger rising in his gut. The woman was dark-skinned, Arabic, maybe Iraqi or Syrian. She was attractive, but far too old for Henry. She was the type that would judge him, maybe even laugh at him, and that would never do. He counted the flowers on the curtains behind her. One, two, three, but the doctor's strategy wasn't working. "'You want to go special?' she said, her accented English jolting Henry back to reality, back to his ever-increasing and unstoppable rage. Henry nodded and felt himself smile. The woman put on a serious face, unsure about Henry's odd behaviour. She held out her hand. "'Eighty pound,' she said sharply. "'Can no funny stuff, no kino shit and condom all time.' Henry felt his muscles twitch under his skin. Okay, he said. The woman turned. Follow me. Henry knew he should walk away. He should call the doctor and ask for advice. He knew. He always knew. But he never, ever, ever did. Henry grabbed the woman by the hair, snapping her head back. He smothered her cries with a beefy palm and dragged her backwards into the room. The woman found strength from her fear. She kicked out at Henry, but he was too powerful, too determined. He twisted his body and pushed the woman down onto the sofa. He could feel his erection growing as he exerted his superior strength over her, dominating her. He slipped his hand from her mouth to her throat in one swift, practiced movement. Her eyes bulged, her arms flailed as she tried to scratch his face. She lifted her knees, twisting her half-naked body desperate to land any kind of blow on her attacker. Henry didn't feel a thing. He didn't notice. His only sensations were those of ecstasy, pure, unadulterated joy. A broad smile spread across his face as the woman fought for breath. He cocked his head and examined her quizzically. "'Shh, now,' he whispered. "'It will all be over soon.' The woman opened her mouth in a silent scream. Her chest burned from lack of oxygen. She could feel the darkness drawing in, the ever-narrowing tunnel of light shrinking, dwindling slowly as her world faded to black. 
Seconds later, she was gone. Henry sat next to her for a few minutes, studying her body. Her dressing gown had been torn open in the struggle, and he examined her bare breasts. Henry flicked each of her nipples with his finger. Boop, boop, he said, laughing to himself. Just like mummies, all wobbly. Then he remembered. Ah, uh, yeah, the twins. Henry walked upstairs and along a long, narrow corridor. He opened the door at the end. Sitting on a large double bed were two girls. Henry couldn't tell them apart. They were mirror images of each other. Both were young and pretty and had long, straight, jet black hair that fell down their backs. They wore identical outfits of red and black plaid skirts and white blouses. One smiled and patted the bed at the side of her. Come sit, she said. We won't bite. Henry stood for a moment. You don't like us, said the second girl. Oh, yes, I do like you, said Henry. I like both of you. I want your very special massage. Take off clothes, said the first girl. We give you a nice massage. Henry took off his shirt and pulled what looked like a standard joint from his jeans pocket. He smiled, a satisfied smile. You like to party, girls. Will Garrett had driven along the M55 towards Blackpool a little too fast. He'd almost come a cropper with another BMW driver who was being equally reckless in the outer lane. Both men had made the usual shaking the bottle signs at each other and screamed a few obscenities before resuming their determined assault on the motorway. Garrett's head was spinning with a mass of muddled thoughts. He'd spent the morning doing the rounds of some of his old haunts, first organising Ruby Ward for a little task he had in mind for her, before moving around the town to check on some other girls from the past. To his horror, he'd discovered that Tina Simpson, the girl who'd been immensely popular and profitable up until her sixteenth birthday, hadn't been seen by her mother in almost a fortnight. When he'd asked Mary Simpson why she hadn't reported her daughter missing, she'd simply shrugged and reached for the crack pipe. That made three in his book. Melissa Ward, Megan Farrow, and now Tina Simpson. As he sped towards the filed coast in search of Polish Jack, the well-known pimp and Garrett's prime suspect as the man who would profit most from the decline in his business, He'd received a panicked call from Yu Yan Wong, the mother of the Chinese twins. Her girls were gone and his madam in charge of the house was dead. Within twenty minutes he stood over the ever-bloating corpse of Latoya Aslam and felt his rage rise to another level. He turned to Yu Yan. And where the fuck were you when this happened? He spat. The woman was beside herself with worry about her daughters, yet equally concerned for her own safety. She had suffered several beatings at the hands of Garrett and had no desire for a rematch. I was out on calls all morning, Mr. Garrett. I come home, find Miss Latoya like this, and my baby's gone. Please, Mr. Garrett, you can help me. I know this. You big, important policeman. You can find my girls. Bring them back safe. The three had become five. I'll find your girls, he muttered half to himself covering up Latoya's nakedness. I'll find them and the bastard who's trying to ruin me. He turned on his heels. Yu Yan Wong plucked up all her courage and stood in his path. She was pretty and slender. Her usually clear alabaster skin was mottled by her tears. She straightened herself and wiped her eyes. What I do now, she said, gesturing towards the body of Latoya Aslam. Latoya had been a good servant to Garrett. He'd found her on the streets, a refugee, sleeping rough as a fifteen-year-old. It hadn't taken much persuasion to bring her into the fold, and she'd been a popular addition to his stable. Once she'd grown too old for his more discerning clients, she'd worked alone in the house he now stood in. She'd still take the occasional punter, but in more recent times looked after any new girls that Garrett brought to the premises. Put her in the big freezer in the outhouse, he said coldly. I'll be back to move her in a day or two. In the meantime, lock the doors and don't answer the phone unless it's me. Got it? 
Yu Yan looked at Latoya's corpse and shivered. Okay, Mr. Garrett, I move her. But please, please, don't let my babies be like this. Garrett pushed past her and grabbed at the door. Don't forget what I said. Keep this locked and don't answer the phone. Garrett slipped into his car and opened the glove box. He pulled his Smith & Wesson 500 from inside, opened the cylinder and checked it over. The five-shot revolver had just a four-inch rifled barrel, but could quite easily hold the title for the most powerful handgun in the world. The rifling also made the 500 incredibly accurate over distance compared to the average pistol. Garrett hoped he wouldn't have to use his gun. In his experience, shooting rival pimps started disputes that nobody won. Either way, things had got out of hand. He needed answers, and quick. Garrett's prime suspect, Polish Jack, was neither a Pole or named Jack. He was, in fact, Hungarian, and was born Yazja Naj, his surname meaning tall, or the big one. Yazjan lived up to his appellation, standing well over six four in his stocking feet and weighing in at a trifle over twenty stone. On arriving from his homeland, Polish Jack first made his money from his muscle, working the doors of some of Blackpool's more infamous nightclubs. Yet within a year he began his pimping business, first renting some of the small dingy guest houses, laid empty in the winter months in the south of the town, his girls offering a wide range of services to their punters from each meagre room. This behaviour would never have been tolerated by the Blackpool landladies of old, but in the days of cheap foreign travel, recession and unemployment, few could turn down the day rate Jack was offering for the rooms and the owner's total discretion. Jack immediately grabbed the attention of the local Blackpool pimps. As with any business, Competition is not always a welcome addition, unless you happen to be the customer. Jack was driving down prices and taking more than his fair share of the punters. A war ensued, which Jack won hands down, leaving one competitor dead and a second in intensive care. Garrett knew Polish Jack as well as anyone in the town. During his time as a detective, he'd visited many of Jack's girls, always taking his pleasure for free, of course. This was eventually brought to the attention of the Hungarian, who finally lay in wait for Garrett, determined to stop any further loss in his profit. Despite Jack's great size and strength, the monumental brawl had ended with Garrett as the victor. Of course, it was not merely Will's great prowess with his fists that had kept him so revered by the criminal fraternity throughout his career, but his brain and common sense too. Garrett knew that the Hungarian would eventually find out about his other, more profitable, extracurricular activities. Therefore, a truce was called. No toes would be stepped on. There was enough business to go around and keep all happy. And that was how it had been ever since. Seven years of peace and prosperity. Jack taking the lion's share of the town's business, Garrett cherry-picking the odd younger girl for his houses and taking his freebies as and when the mood took him. It had been a sound relationship. Until now. Garrett pulled up outside the large double-fronted detached house in Lytham St. Anne's. A Bentley Continental convertible nestled in front of a large double garage. Jack was home. Will pushed the Smith & Wesson into the back of his trousers and strode up the drive. Before he reached the front door, it was opened by the man himself. Jack stood barefooted in the entrance hall, wearing a shiny tracksuit of debatable origin. In one hand he held a fat sandwich. He chewed noisily as Garrett approached. "'I presume you have very good reason for calling at my home,' said the Hungarian, a mixture of his accented English and the mouthful of sandwich making him difficult to understand. Garrett had his drift. "'And I hope you can put my mind at rest as to who is trying to ruin my fucking business.' Jack furrowed his brow, his large round head and deep-set eyes giving any onlooker the impression of a bull breed. "'And why should I know of this?' offered Jack, puffing out his chest. Garrett stopped just out of reach of the massive Hungarian. 
Because, Yazjin, you have the most gain from my demise. You use my homeland name, Garrett. It is Sunday, I suppose. But not a day for rest. Polish Jack eyed Garrett for a moment. You better come in. You'll make my place look untidy. The Hungarian turned his back and walked down his hallway. Will took this as a message. One that said, I have nothing to hide. I do not fear you. You will not attack me. The big man was wrong, of course. But Will wanted answers before blood. So his gun stayed firmly in his waistband. As Garrett stepped past the first entrance to the left of the hall, he realised why Polish Jack was so confident. Standing just out of sight from the front door was another equally large man brandishing what looked suspiciously like an assault rifle. Garrett had been a soldier, but he was out of touch with makes and models of Eastern European weaponry. Either way, he considered himself vulnerable. "'You want a gunfight in your own home?' he asked to Jack's back. The Hungarian pushed open his kitchen door. He didn't bother to turn. "'Alo Hoist will lay down his weapon when you remove that silly pea-shooter you have in your belt, William.' Garrett took a deep breath, pulled the Smith & Wesson from his trousers, and lay it on the kitchen table. Jack slowly picked up the pistol and moved it to a nearby work surface, well out of Will's reach. "'For insurance purposes,' he said with a fake smile. "'Now, can I offer you a drink?' Garrett shook his head. I'm looking for answers, Jack, not a hangover. The Hungarian gestured for Will to sit, and both men faced each other. I do not interfere with your business, Garrett. You should know this. Should I? Jack shrugged. I have no need to do this, William. He waved an arm around his huge modern kitchen. I have all I need. I've been around long enough to know people get greedy. I am not one of those people, Garrett. I am happy. I live a quiet life these days. You have a guy with a machine gun in your front room, Jack. We all need insurance policies, Will. Well, if you aren't to blame for what's happening, maybe you need to increase your own security. Meaning? Meaning that just three doors down from one of your houses... My madam has been strangled to death and two of my best girls have been taken. Jack sat up at that. Which house? Bloomfield. So, the two Chinese beauties. Will nodded. Jack shook his head. Too young for my taste, but I'm sure they make you money. They did. Jack eyed Garrett knowingly. Yes, of course, I understand. But I always think that the kind of man who lays down with a child cannot be trusted. It's purely business, said Garrett. You know how it works. Yes, I do. I know the dark web, the secret clubs. These are dangerous places, Will. But you've had no issues, no problems at your places? Jack shook his head. Nothing out of the ordinary, the ordinary. Nutter getting violent with the girls for not performing some weird act or other, but hey, that is the way of our world, their world, huh? Garrett lay his hands on the table, and immediate thoughts of a vicious conflict with the big Hungarian pushed to the back burner. He lowered his tone. I've had two of my old girls murdered over in Preston, too. The killer sent pictures of their work to the mothers, and a fucking video. Jack raised his eyebrows. And I take it you had prior knowledge of the family? A mother? Like I said, you know how it works. I know how you work, Garrett. Sounds like someone is sending you a message. Will snorted. Oh, don't come the holier than thou bit with me, Jack. How old are some of the girls you traffic? I thought you came here for answers. Will took a breath and nodded. I did. Look, I know you branched out over into Preston and Blackburn. A couple of massage parlours and other three or four houses. Sure you haven't had any issues nor weirdos knocking about? 
The Preston operation is run by Alachos, his cousin, Benedict. Let me call him. You sure you don't want that drink whilst I ring? Garrett shook his head and waited. Other than the word OK, the Hungarian spoke in his own language throughout the call. Finally, he closed his phone and sat back down. He says they had one guy a few weeks back that made a real mess of one of the girls. Beat her quite bad. She couldn't work for two weeks. Apparently, he wanted her to wear some old dress and fuck her in the ass. She refused. Benedict had to throw him out. Says he was a real handful. Young, maybe late twenties, very, very strong. Muscle-bound fucker. He says the guy seemed crazy, like mentally ill or something. Garrett thought back to the pictures that Ruby brought to his house that fateful night, and the muscular young man in the gimp mask. Anything else? A name? The girls say he called himself Henry. Chapter 26 Maureen Simons had fed Felix and Tom, cleaned the house from top to bottom, and even cut her tiny lawn that lay at the rear of her modest cottage. Throughout the whole process, she could only think of one thing. Cigarettes. It appeared that no amount of nicotine replacement was going to hack it this Sunday afternoon. Grabbing her car keys, she headed for the local shop and a pack of Regal. Fuck this for a game of soldiers. She just pushed her micro into gear when her mobile rang. She didn't recognise the number and stared suspiciously at the screen as the unit buzzed in her hand. A detective had finally got the better of her. Maureen pulled on the handbrake and accepted the call. Simons, she said briskly. The voice on the other end was female and shaky. M Maureen, stammered the voice. Yeah? Maureen the copper, the detective. Simons was already losing what little patience her lack of nicotine was allowing her. Yes, I'm Detective Simons. How did you get this number? Eh, hey, well, you gave it to me, said the voice. A light came on in Maureen's head. Ruby? Ruby Ward? Is that you? Yes, yes it is. All longing for packets of regal left Simons' mind. Where are you, hon? she asked quietly. I'm in the cafe, the one on Lancaster Road. I just, I just wondered if I could talk to you, you know, face to face. What, now? Yeah, please. I'll be twenty minutes, Ruby. Don't move from there, OK? OK. Ruby closed the call and opened another. The recipient answered on the first ring. She's on her way, she said. The two Chinese whores had willingly slipped into the back seat of Henry Sapphire. He'd driven very carefully to the farm using his sat-nav, ignoring them as they'd giggled, using their limited vocabulary to be as lewd as possible throughout the journey. Once Henry had offered the girls a second joint, they'd gone quiet and needed to be carried to the stable block. Henry stripped the two girls, gagged them and shackled their hands to the wall bars in the stable. This was easily achieved, as the powerful sedative he'd administered to both would last over twelve hours. Henry considered taking his pleasure with one of the girls as she lay semi-conscious, but girl three in the next stable was making a real racket, kicking at the adjoining wall, and her muffled screams would only have been a distraction. Besides, he had other far more pressing matters to attend to. He locked the stable and stepped into his car. Happy his day was progressing as planned, Henry drove steadily to Pitt's funeral parlour, where the company's black transit awaited him. The van would be an essential piece of his equipment for the task he had in mind. He sat in the van's driver's seat, checked his hair in the rearview mirror, and then breathed into his cupped hand, snipping his palm to check his breath. All seemed okay. Time to collect Lucy. Maureen Simon scrolled her phone using the hands-free system in her car and called Stryker. Uh, "'Just a courtesy call, boss,' she said over the revving engine. 
just to let you know that Ruby Ward has been on and wants to have a chat with me. I told you to take the day off, growled Stryker. I think it may be about Scarface. The phone was silent for a moment. Where are you meeting her? The cafe on Lancaster Road. She sounded sober, so you never know your look. I'll bell you as soon as I know anything. Anyway, how's your day going? She heard Stryker's sigh. It was a long, pained sound. Only another 186 registered Ford owners to go, he said. And Bob? I sent him home just after three. He worked very late last night. He was with the taxi people until death o'clock, so whilst you're at it, you might want to ask Ruby why she didn't mention her trip into Longton the night she received her package. I'll do just that. Okay, Simon. But no burning the midnight oil, either. I need everyone fresh for tomorrow. Maureen killed the call and accelerated towards the A6 and town. It took just fifteen minutes of relatively clear Sunday roads to reach a parking space just a few yards from the cafe. Maureen stepped inside the greasy spoon and was instantly overwhelmed by the smell of cigarettes. She felt her stomach cramp and her brain scream for nicotine. Scanning each table, she looked for telltale signs of the premises breaking the law, but found none. Then quickly realized that the back door was ajar, where a rather large woman in chef's whites was chuffing away without the slightest concern that her smoke simply blew back into her workspace. However, it appeared the chef was sufficiently spatially aware to realize that a cop had walked into her premises. She flicked her stub out into the rear yard, turned and eyed Maureen suspiciously. "'What can I get you, officer?' she asked, wiping her hands on a rather grubby pinafore. "'Not what, love? More like who?' offered Maureen, the irritation in her voice as obvious as the cigarette smoke lingering in the café. There was a look of realisation on the woman's face. "'Oh, are you, Maureen? One and the same. And you're looking for Ruby. Well, give the girl a teddy bear.' The chef took on a disgruntled look. "'Sorry, love,' said Maureen repentantly. "'Just it's me first day off in an age, and I'm only here as Ruby said it was important.' The woman blew out her cheeks. "'No offence taken, sweetheart. I know what you mean. But Ruby, she had a call, she said it was urgent. Well, she did say for you to go to her place and meet her there.' Maureen nodded, resigned to the fact that she would have to park her own car close to Ruby's flat, and that new paintwork could be a possible cost of doing so. "'Thanks,' she said to the chef. "'I suppose I'll have to do that, then.' Ruby lived on the second floor of a long row of Maisonette-style properties, just off Avonham Lane. Just like Miguel Jimenez's home on Callan Estate, Avonham had been given similar treatment— and each flat boasted new plastic windows and doors, together with a fresh lick of paint. Maureen still wasn't keen on leaving her near new Nissan outside, but beggars couldn't be choosers. Two flights of concrete stairs later, a push past a grubby mattress and a step over a dog deposit, she stood at Ruby's door. The woman answered at the first knock. Maureen could see that at some point between the first call and now, Ruby had discovered a bottle of gin. "'Come in,' said Ruby with a hint of a slur. The flat was overly warm. Despite the humidity and soaring daily temperatures, Ruby had not deemed it necessary to open any windows. "'Have a seat,' she said, pointing to a floral sofa. Maureen didn't know why, but she felt uncomfortable. She'd interviewed hundreds of women and men in their homes, some as rough and ready as they came, but something wasn't right. There was a look in Ruby's eyes she didn't like. She stayed standing. Are you okay, Ruby? Uh huh. She managed, finding the gin bottle on the sideboard and pouring a measure that would choke a horse. Other than the fact you ain't found my baby's body yet. Maureen scanned the living room. There was nothing out of place other than the closed windows. She chastised herself for being overly cautious and dropped her bag on the sofa. "'We're doing all we can, Ruby, you know that. Is that what you wanted to see me about?' Ruby steadied herself with one hand. 
No, I want to see you about Will and Garrett, she said a little too loudly. Detective Will Garrett. Maureen had never heard the name. What about him? Ruby snorted into her glass. You've no fucking idea, have you? You old lot are as much use as a one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest. Again, the lack of nicotine, the disturbance of her solitary day off and her concern for her near new car, all combined to ensure Maureen had just about had enough. If you brought me here to slag off the force, Ruby, you picked the wrong gal. Maureen grabbed her bag and turned for the door. Hold it right there, said a voice. A man's voice. A voice with cruelty running right through it. Maureen felt her spine tingle and pushed her hand into her handbag where her force regulation ASP was hiding in the bottom. As she wrapped her fingers around the tentile steel weapon, she realised that in all her service she had never used it. She turned to see the man who could only be Scarface. He held a silver pistol in his right hand. It pointed directly at Maureen's chest. Ruby caught Maureen's eye and smiled. See, I told you, Detective Will Garrett. Actually, I'm retired, sneered Garrett. Maureen's head spun. Are you going to shoot me? Is that it? If I have to. He waved the gun to one side. Sit, he spat. Maureen did as she was told. Her mind worked overtime. There are other officers. Don't, snapped Garrett. Don't insult my intelligence. There is no one coming to rescue you. That idiot striker thinks you're sitting in the cafe on Lancaster Road having a cosy cuppa. No one will miss you for quite some time. But either way, Detective Simons, this won't take long. Maureen steeled herself. She'd always known her job could be dangerous. Indeed, there had been several times when she had been genuinely scared for her life. But none like this. She swallowed hard. Did you kill Melissa and Megan? Did you make those awful films? No, he didn't, said Ruby, traces of anger and disdain welling up into her voice. He loved Mel like a daughter, like he loves me. Despite her fear, her dread of what may be coming, Maureen couldn't hide her incredulity. It was all she could do to stop herself from laughing. Oh, come on, Ruby. He was fucking Melissa when she was thirteen years old and selling her to his paedophile mates so he could line his filthy pockets. You call that love? Simon's locked eyes with Garrett. His were cold as ice, shark-like. She forced herself not to blink. You may as well have murdered Ruby's daughter, Garrett, and Megan, and those to come if you don't let us do our job. Garrett bared his teeth. I'll deal with this mess, detective. I'll deal with it my way. Justice will be served. Oh, yeah, snorted Maureen. And what about justice for you, Garrett? You and your friends in high places? The ones who pay you to have sex with the children you groom. Garrett sneered. The cream always gets away, Simons. Come on, you know that. How long have you been a cop? The IPCC tried to investigate me. They failed. I've lost count of the amount of goody-two-shoes cops who have had a go over the years. And here I am, still earning, still in control. Maureen shook her head. But you're not, are you? You're not in control. Whoever is killing your old girls and making those films, that's who's in control. Garrett screwed up his face. It's taken me less than a day to find out that boy's name, you know. The one in the rubber mask. And what have you got to show, eh? Nothing. You're so busy chasing me that you can't see your hand in front of your face. Maureen thought she may faint. The heat of the room, the pressure of the situation, the overwhelming fear. Look, Garrett, maybe we could do some kind of deal. He threw back his head and guffawed. Yeah, you can kiss my ass. Garrett turned to Ruby and nodded. Ruby's eyes briefly caught Maureen's. 
As she did so, she went very pale. She glanced back to Garrett. Yeah, you, you are sure, aren't you, Will? She stammered. And I always looked after you, Ruby, darling. Yeah, yeah, of course you have, nodded Ruby, slugging another mouthful of gin. Then you know it's right. What I tell you, this way we can be together, together forever. Just like I said. Maureen saw Ruby swallow hard as she walked to the kitchen. Moments later, she returned holding a large carving knife. Maureen's whole body began to shake. Come on, Ruby. What's this all about, eh? What are you thinking? Ruby stepped gingerly forward, holding the blade out in front of her. I- I'm sorry, Maureen, she said. Well, it's just how it is. I just can't do without Will. And if your lot keep on like this, well, he'll end up going down for life, see? I don't think I could stand that. Maureen shuffled herself to the edge of her seat. Garrett noticed instantly and cocked his pistol. The sound filled Maureen with crushing terror, freezing her like a lamp on a hair. Ruby was close now, almost touching distance. The tip of the knife wobbled as her hand shook. Come on, Ruby, whispered Simons. Can't you see what he's doing? How are you going to be together when you're banged up for the rest of your days for killing a cop? Ruby gave a manic smile. Ah, uh, but I won't see. Will knows all the right people. Lawyers, judges, all them kind of folks. They'll say I'm unstable, you know, because of what happened to my Melissa. They'll say it was a moment of madness. A moment of... Ruby plunged the knife into Maureen Simon's chest. The detective gripped the handle with both hands, eyes wide, mouth open, and a silent plea for mercy. Tears formed, yet she still made no sound. Ruby leaned in, using her weight to push the blade in ever further. A moment of madness, see? Eh? That's all it is. Chapter 27 Unbeknownst to her parents, 14-year-old Lucy Stevenson had a boyfriend. His name was Kirk Lees. He was 16, as handsome as any boy could possibly be, and played football for Preston North End. Lucy loved him so much it hurt. She dreamed of the time when they could share their relationship with the world. She striding along the catwalk as a famous model and... Kirk, a big star on the field. They would have so much money they wouldn't be able to spend it all. No more keeping secrets from Mum and Dad. She snuggled up to Kirk on his sofa. He shared a flat with three other boys, all of who played for the club, all of who were out in town enjoying a pizza. You're going to have to go now, Lucy, said Kirk sleepily. I've got pre-season training starting in the morning. Lucy checked the screen on her phone and pouted. It's only nine. I don't have to be home for another hour at least. Kirk would have been far keener for Lucy to stay, if sex had been on the cards. When he'd met her, he'd been sure she was at least sixteen. It was only after a couple of dates, after she'd spurned all his advances in that department, that she'd revealed the truth. Kirk was losing patience with his girl. As pretty as she was, he was a red-blooded young man with needs, and Lucy was not for giving him what he wanted. It was time to move on. I'm sorry, Lucy, he said, but this isn't working. Lucy sat up and turned. She felt a terrible churning in her stomach. Oh, don't say that, Kirk. Please don't say that. I love you so much. Kirk felt bad about the whole thing. He really liked Lucy. She was funny and they got on well, but... You're just too young for me, he offered. Lucy creased her forehead. You mean I'm too young to go to bed with you? That's what you really mean? It's not just that. Lucy felt her hurt turning to anger. Well, what do you mean? I mean that we both want different things right now. 
Oh, yeah? Like what? Like you want to have sex with me and I won't let you? Oh, come on, Lucy, don't talk that way. It doesn't suit you. So what does suit me? Playing on the park? Swinging on the swings? Now you're being childish. That's because I'm still a child, Kirk. Kirk stood. And that's why I'm finishing with you. Lucy sat stock still for a moment, her mouth open in shock. She felt tears run down her face. She thought she may be sick. Grabbing her bag from the floor, she wiped her eyes with the back of her hand and strode from the room, her heart breaking with each step. I hear you, she shouted, stepping into the night. Lucy didn't think that one human being could cry so hard for so long and stay upright. The walk from Kirk's flat to her house was less than a mile, and she'd gone through a full pack of tissues before she'd reached halfway. She hadn't noticed the black van crawling along behind her. Henry was elated. He'd been pretty sure most teenagers would be out on this Sunday evening. The schools had just broken up for the summer and the night was warm and dry. But to run into Lucy so easily was such a bonus. Not only that, she was so scantily clad. A tiny pink skirt and white cropped top revealed her tanned thighs, taut stomach and slender shoulders. Her beautiful blonde hair fell down her back and the summer breeze caught it as she strode along the pavement. It took Henry a minute or two to realise that Lucy was crying. He cocked his head curiously as she reached into her bag for tissues every few yards, wiping her eyes. Someone had upset his girl, and that would never do. He blipped the throttle on the van and pulled alongside her. Lucy turned to notice him for the first time. She dipped her head slightly to get a better look. Henry wound down the window. Hi, Lucy. You okay? It took her a moment to recognise Henry. Oh, hello, it's you, the boy from the swimming pool, she sniffed. Yeah, that's me, Henry. Lucy managed a brief smile. She was far too upset about Kirk to be bothered to enter into a conversation with a guy who had seemed so weird on their first meeting. After all, the letter asking for her parents' permission to model for his friend had never materialised. She began to walk on. I'm fine, Henry, I'm on my way home now. Henry slipped the clutch and followed. Why don't I give you a lift? Lucy felt a touch of unease. No, thank you. I'll be fine. It isn't far. Henry accelerated ten yards ahead and jumped from the van. He wore a tight white T-shirt that accentuated his muscular frame. His jet black hair was slicked back behind his ears. His piercing yet soulless eyes darted left and right, taking in his position. He smiled and cricked his neck. I know it isn't far. You gave me your address, remember? Lucy stopped walking. She looked over her shoulder to see if anyone was behind. To her disappointment, the pavement was empty. She began to feel real fear, wrapping her arms around herself as if suddenly aware of how little she was wearing. Have... have you been following me? She asked, a tremble in her voice. Henry held out his arms by his side. Me? No, I was just driving along and saw you walking towards your house. And you you know what? I thought, there's that pretty girl from the pool, Lucy. Henry stepped even closer. Lucy shot a look across the road. Some boys played football under the floodlights but seemed too busy to notice her. She pushed her hand inside her bag and rooted for her phone. What are you doing? asked Henry, a sinister edge to his tone. Lucy shook her head. Nothing. I was just going to check my phone to see if my boyfriend... Henry was upon her in an instant. He grabbed her wrist, tearing her hand from her bag. It hurt. He was immensely strong. Boyfriend? His eyes were wild. You haven't got a boyfriend. You can't have a boyfriend. And you know why. Lucy was crying again. Please, let go. You're hurting me. Henry's eyes grew ever wilder. Lucy thought he looked completely mad. The devil himself couldn't have scared her more. I ask you a question, he bellowed in her face. Lucy thought her legs may buckle. 
She did her best to remember what Henry had said. Her breathing was fast and shallow. Her head spun. Um, I... I... Um, uh, okay, okay. Why can't I have a boyfriend? Henry somehow smiled. He stroked Lucy's hair with his free hand. Because... I'm your boyfriend, my darling. And... I'm the only boyfriend you will ever have. He scooped Lucy up with a powerful arm, lifting her off her feet. She began to scream instantly. The boys across the way suddenly stopped their game and began to take an interest in the proceedings. She heard one of them shout, Hey, what you up to, mister? And another, Fucking let her go, pal. We're calling the coppers. But it was no use. Henry threw her onto the floor of the van and slammed the door shut. She was a prisoner. As the van sped away, Lucy looked out of the back window to see her bag lying in the gutter. "'You won't need your phone any more,' shouted Henry from the front compartment. "'You have me now.' Stryker stood on the footpath outside Ruby Ward's flat. The area was taped off and dozens of police vehicles lined the road. The circus was in full swing. He turned and looked up to the first doorway to see Maureen Simon's body being wheeled out on a gurney. She was encased in a black plastic body bag and flanked by two forensic officers. This is shocking. Stryker turned towards the voice and saw DCS Errol Graham standing by his side. She said I was bad luck, said Stryker, his voice full of sorrow. She was right, huh? Graham shook his head. Don't beat yourself up there, Ewan. Who could have predicted that someone like Ruby Ward would do something like this? We sure she was the perp? Graham hunched his shoulders. She made the call, said she'd just killed a cop. Seems pretty straightforward to me. Stryker turned down the corners of his mouth. Nothing is ever that straightforward, sir. Where's Ward now? Being assessed by the medical people. Looks like she had some kind of breakdown. Not surprising, really. I reckon if I'd been carrying that level of guilt about one of my kids, I'd have fallen off the perch, too. Stryker curled his lip. What? And lured a cop to her death? Of course not. I was just saying that she suffered a massive trauma. That's all. Detective Constable Maureen Simon's body had made the pavement. The forensics team were loading her into the back of a Ministry estate car. Stryker walked over. Hang on there, son, he said to the first man. The white-suited guy gave DCS Graham a questioning look. The senior detective responded with a nod. Stryker unzipped the bag to reveal Maureen's face. He stood motionless for a moment and then rested his hand gently on her forehead. The forensics guys were about to interfere, but Graham held up a hand and they stood back. Stryker closed his eyes. To any onlooker... A man in prayer. He allowed the millions of electrical impulses to take over his brain. White hot shards of imagery, distorted by billions more pieces of code, tore up his spine, bursting into one solitary image in his mind. Stryker opened his eyes and straightened himself. He took one last look at Maureen before zipping the bag. He turned to Graham. Was there a gun found in the flat? Graham shook his head. Not so far. Stryker's eyes flashed. I need to speak to Ruby Ward now. That's not going to be possible, Ewan, and you know it. She's with the mental health professionals at the Avondale unit as we speak. The lawyer has already intimated that she will not be answering any questions. Stryker snorted down his nose. Ha! <laughs> and who is her lawyer? He was quick off the mark. Not he, corrected Graham. She... Ruby's lawyer is Jennifer Widows. Stryker raised his eyebrows at that one. Jennifer Widows, daughter of Archibald Widows, QC. The very same. And since when has the lovely Jennifer started pro bono work? The Widows' partnership certainly doesn't entertain legal aid clients. Graham caught Stryker's eye. That's true. Look... I know you don't drink, Ewan, but I certainly need one right now, and I need to talk to you. Privately. The two men sat in a booth in the beer garden of the Wellington Inn. 
Striker nursed a fresh orange, Errol Graham opting for a pint of hobgoblin. Graham wiped the foam from his mouth and leaned over the table. You're not going to like this, Ewan, and neither do I for that matter, but I'm pulling your team from this investigation. Graham thought Stryker was about to punch him. What? he hissed, fists bald, face contorted in anger. Calm down, Ewan. It isn't my decision. It's come right from the top, from the chief himself. Well, fuck the chief. Wasn't it his idea to set up this little unit, to keep everything under wraps? It was, but... But what? But Ruby Ward has already given the outline of her daughter's murder to a brief, and our darling Jennifer Widows has intimated that she will be making the details public knowledge in order to, and I quote, protect her client's mitigation. She's requested full disclosure as soon as Ruby is out of hospital and in custody. So? So, the moment Melissa's murder and the circumstances surrounding it go public, any chance of finding our dirty cop will go straight out the window. There is no way on God's green earth that the Chief can continue to run this investigation with just four detectives once the press gets hold of it. Three detectives, Stryker corrected. Remember? Maureen Simons has already given her life to this inquiry. The DCS took a long drink of his pint. My hands are tied, you, and I'm sorry. Stryker's mind was in turmoil. Look, boss, don't ask me how I know, but I'm sure Ruby was put up to this by the guy who's top of both our lists. I think he's on the back foot and he deliberately targeted Maureen to stop the team in its tracks. If you take this action now, you will play straight into his arms. Now, I'm not suggesting that this scar-faced guy is our filmmaker, but he's the key to all this. He's running scared, and he's as good as killed one of his own to save his skin. Come on, sir, think about it. Where has the cash come from to get the widow's defense team out at this time on a Sunday night? I bet my next month's salary that Archibald Widow's QC is in Melissa Ward's diary somewhere. He's connected to Scarface, and Scarface is responsible for grooming young kids and selling them to dozens of other pedophiles, probably including the learned Mr. Widow's. You mark my words. Graham shook his head. I know this is hard for you, Ewan, but we can't risk the press getting hold of this and be seen to be holding information back from the whole force. Stryker tapped the table. Look, Ruby will be in the Avondale unit for, what, 24 hours? That means Jennifer Widow's hands are tight until she's been officially assessed, yes? True. And if our murderers run true to form, they won't kill the third girl until Tuesday evening or Wednesday morning. I don't like the sound of this, Ewan. Come on, boss. Give me twenty-four hours. I can't do it. It's just... Stryker's eyes were wide, pleading. Yes, you can, sir. You can still begin to form a murder squad just like the Chief Kong wants. Decide on who will lead, where you'll take the jacks from, all that. With the best will in the world, that won't be easy. You already have Miguel Jimenez's death ongoing, and even though Ruby will probably confess to Maureen's killing, we'll still need a full team to investigate and put a file together in case she changes her plea. To all intents and purposes, the chief will see you doing exactly as he's asked. Just leave Bob, Fliss, and me to our own devices for one day. Just twenty-four hours, boss. Please... And I promise, we will deliver Melissa and Megan's killers, and your dirty cop. Will Garrett smiled as he drove slowly along St. Mary's Street. Ruby had played a blinder, and the minute he'd called Archie Widows to give him the heads up, he knew the suits would shit their pants. With the press baying for blood, they'd have to open the investigation into Melissa's death to the divisional CID. Of course, that meant only one thing, that the new inquiry would be headed by none other than DCI Alan Blunt. He felt much better. Now all that was left to do was find this Henry fucker and deal with the pricks who were trying to ruin his business. As he rolled past the church, he was greeted by a familiar sight. All the regular girls were plying their trade. There were none that he liked the look of, they were all a bit too old and tired-looking. 
But for once, this visit was not just about sex. It was about information, about Henry. His father had always said, if you want a job doing well, do it yourself. And that had been the case most of his life. Garrett couldn't trust anyone. Not in this game. He edged his car close to the curb and stopped at two street girls. He dropped the window. One girl, a skinny bottle redhead, leaned in. You looking for business, mister? Thirty quid all in. How much for the blow? He counted. With or without, love? Without, of course. Twenty? Garrett's eyes bore into the girl. He'd seen her dozens of times on the strip. He'd fucked her on more than one occasion, too. Not that she'd remember. He leaned towards her and, with snake-like reactions, reached out and grabbed her by the hair. The girl cried out in pain. "'Fucking let go of me, you bastard!' she shouted. "'I'll have my pimp on you, I will. Miguel will cut you up good!' Garrett's voice was low, chilling. "'You see, the trouble with skankles like you is the crack. He addled your fucking brain.' He twisted in his seat and gave the girl a fierce slap to her cheek. "'Your pimp is fucking dead, you stupid bitch!' She cried out again, but this time kept her threats to herself. "'Get in the fucking car when you're told,' spat Garrett. The girl looked up and down the street, desperately hoping for some form of support, but none was forthcoming. Girls like Tracy never got any help, unless it came in a pipe." She gingerly opened the door and sat inside. Garrett immediately drove off, turned right into New Hall Lane, sped through the lights and parked behind some empty retail units. He unbuckled his trousers and slid them down to his knees. "'Come on, stupid,' he sneered. "'Get on it.' The girl twisted in her seat. "'I, I, I want my money first, she said shakily. "'Do I look like your daddy?' said Garrett. The girl shook her head. "'Well, I am,' he hissed. "'I'm your daddy, and what I say fucking goes.' He pulled his revolver from his jacket and touched the barrel to the girl's head. "'Understand, shit for brains.' Tracy shook with fear. She pulled up her grubby T-shirt to reveal small, acne-scarred breasts. "'Sorry, daddy,' she said. "'Sorry, I'll suck you good now, I promise.' Garrett snorted a smug laugh. Oh, I fucking know you will, and you'll swallow the fucking lot too. But first, I want you to tell me something. Tracy nodded furiously, unable to keep her eyes from the gun in Garrett's hand. Of course, yeah, anything, Daddy. You ever had a guy called Henry? Strange fucker, a bit crazy, all muscles. It was all Tracy could do to remember what day it was. But she remembered Henry. She'd been even more scared of him than Garrett and his gun. Yeah, I remember him. He paid double to take me to his house. A real weird fucker he is, all right. Met me dress up in his dead mum's clothes to fuck me. Garrett almost smiled. It takes all sorts, eh? You remember where he lives? Tracy swallowed hard. Yeah, he lives a couple of streets from me. I'm on Bullfinch, he's on Linnet. You know the number? Tracy shook her head. But you could take me there. S suppose, oh yeah. Garrett pursed his lips, put the gun back in his jacket and took hold of Tracy's hair. He pulled her head towards his crotch. Sort this out first, girl, he said. Then we'll go for the drive. Chapter 28 a striker walked to his car, wondering if he'd bitten up more than he could chew. Talk is cheap, son, his dad would say. You've got to be able to walk the walk, too. He was right, of course. Striker knew that only too well. But first it was his duty to tell the team about Maureen. His first port of call was Bob Higgins' house. He gave the seasoned detective the news about their dead colleague on his doorstep. Bob reinforced Striker's theory in an instant. This is Scarface protecting his assets, isn't it? He said, shaking his head and looking pale. Jeez, it's poor Mo. We need to get this bastard, boss. We do, 
said Stryker. Trouble is, we've only got a day to do it in. They're pulling the plug. Stryker didn't answer. I wondered how long it would be, said Bob quietly. Stryker rested his hands on Bob's powerful shoulder. We ain't done yet, pal, he said. Fliss Abbott was sitting on the floor in her flat. Once again she was surrounded by piles of papers. He thought for a moment that Fliss might cry at the news of Maureen's demise, but she did not. Instead she stood, wrapped her arms around his neck, and on her tiptoes kissed him deeply. This isn't your doing, Ewan, she said quietly. Don't let anyone tell you different. They both sat on the carpet, and Stryker told Fliss about the episode he'd experienced whilst touching Maureen's body. "'And you definitely saw a gun?' asked Fliss. "'It was overwhelming. A silver pistol with a black grip. And you took that to mean what? "'That someone was there with Ruby and Maureen, controlling the scene. I mean, come on, I know Mo wasn't the most athletic, but do you really think she would have just sat on the sofa whilst a drunken, staggering Ruby War pushed a knife into her chest? They found her sitting on the sofa. Stryker nodded. Fliss looked into his face. You look all in, Ewan. Want to stay here tonight? Stryker stood and managed a smile. Thanks for the offer, Detective, but I think I need some sleep. We've only got tomorrow. After that, the team will be disbanded, and who knows what or who will replace us, eh? Stryker lay on his bed, the heat of his shower still prickling his skin. He could smell Fliss Abbott on his sheets, and wondered for a moment if he'd made the right decision in coming home alone. Alone. That's how it had been for, well, for far too long. He closed his eyes, but sleep wouldn't come. Finally, he gave up and walked to his study. The room was, in effect, a computer suite. Massive servers winked away in the half-light. Ethical hacking had become his main source of income whilst away from policing. However, Stryker didn't think he would need too much power for what he had in mind this morning. He hit Google Images, typed in Revolver, and began to scroll, not really knowing what he thought he may discover. Ten fruitless minutes later, his phone buzzed on the desk. It was Errol Graham. Stryker, are you awake? Would you have rung if I wasn't? Very funny. Listen, we have a report of a girl being abducted in Ribbleton just after nine o'clock last night. Stryker checked his Amiga. It was almost three in the morning. Who's on it? Uniform and a couple of the Section CID guys who could be spared from Maureen Simon's murder. What do we know? The girl is Lucy Stevenson, fourteen years. Looks older. Very pretty. Long blonde hair. Witnesses say she was bundled into the back of a black van with small gold-coloured lettering on the doors. And get this. The perp is described as white male between 25 and 30. Muscular build with an unusual rolling gait. Stryker thought his head may explode. Gimp mask guy. Sounds like him. Definitely a black van, not a black saloon car. 100% a van. I'm on my way. Henry had been close to tears. He'd known he'd have to take Lucy to the farm. After all, where else could he teach her the meaning of his love and keep her all to himself? He knew the doctor would be angry, for sure, but he would have to deal with that particular problem as and when he had to. Right now, in the early hours of the morning, he had a far more pressing issue. The inbuilt satellite navigation unit in the transit had stopped working. He'd tried all the usual things. He'd entered the postcode into the unit as normal, but the screen just displayed the same message over and over. GPS signal lost. He sat in a lay-by, staring at a map that didn't make any sense to him. Lucy, despite her chilling ordeal, looked through the mesh bulkhead as Henry mumbled to himself. "'Why not take me home, Henry?' she said quietly. "'My mum and dad will be worried sick. I can direct you there if you like.' Henry's head shot around in an instant, his eyes cruel. "'Why don't you shut the fuck up, bitch?' he hissed. Lucy sat back, putting distance between her and her captor. Despite the bulkhead between them, 
he still terrified her. Then Henry had an idea. He'd seen people with electronic maps just like his own portable sat-nav, but on their phone. The doctor had always ensured that he was unable to access Facebook or any social media site. It was for his own good, apparently. But what if he could open the map on his phone? After all, he knew the farm's postcode by heart. It took him three attempts, but just as the first light of dawn was brightening the sky, he was on his way. Henry felt instantly better, and a broad smile grew across his face. Yes, this was going to be the best day ever. Stryker had spent a little under three hours searching the county's road camera systems. Dozens of gantry cams, ANPR modules, together with community cameras, gave him a fighting chance that the vehicle used to abduct Lucy Stevenson would have been recorded. It may have, but the pictures around the abduction site were not good enough. All he had gleaned for certain was that several dark-coloured transit vans had travelled on the roads close to the incident within the allotted time frame. As his search grew ever wider, away from the city, out into the suburbs and into the countryside, his eyes began to blur. Karen Jones was the officer in charge of the monitoring station. She dropped a black coffee in front of Stryker and rested her hand on his arm. "'I can take it from here, sir. It's six-thirty. The appeal for witnesses is going out in thirty minutes. Maybe you will be better manning the phones back at the nick?' Stryker picked up the cup, sipped and grimaced. "'I'm not a sir. I'm a sergeant. That's that instant.' "'What do you expect?' said Jones with a wry smile. "'Columbian ground?' "'Thanks, anyway.' said Stryker, pulling on his jacket. I think he may be right there, so I'll get back to the nick now. Jones watched as Stryker walked from the room. Good luck, Sergeant, she said quietly. You'll need it. Fliss Abbott watched as Bob Higgins plugged in a telephone beneath her workstation. What's in the box? he asked, his voice muffled by the confines of the desk. Tom and Felix, she said. Cats. Well guessed, Detective. Bob extracted himself from under the desk and stretched his back. I meant, why do we have cats in the office? They were Maureen's. Ah, nodded Bob, a look of sadness drifting over his face. And you're taking care of them. That's very kind, Fliss. I would have liked that. Fliss shook her head. No pets allowed in my flat, Bob. How about you? My missus is allergic. Maybe Stryker could take them. Take what? Stryker strode into the room and scanned the desktops. We all set with the phones. The TV and radio broadcast is going live in ten. Yes, boss, offered Bob. There was a quiet mewing from under Fliss Abbott's desk. What the feck is that? snapped Stryker. Mo oh, had two cats, explained Bob. Fliss nipped to her house and picked them up on her way in. We thought you might be able to look after them said Fliss, hopefully. Stryker pointed a thick finger at his own chest. Me? No chance. You'll need to call the RSPCA or something. Anyway, come on, get to your desks. The two detectives shuffled their way around the office and sat, a single phone and a notepad in front of them. Stryker turned on the television and selected Sky News. Sitting behind a long table adorned with the Lancashire Constabulary crest were Brian and Linda Stevenson. Linda held young Sam on her knee and was already crying. Brian looked pale, his arm draped around his wife. Sitting alongside Brian was DCS Errol Graham. To Linda's right was a suit striker didn't recognise. "'Jeffrey Parker,' offered Fliss. "'He's the force's chief hostage negotiator. Graham will have brought him in just in case the perp is watching.' "'And what difference would that make?' asked Bob. Fliss ran a hand through her hair. "'It's imperative that the parents be briefed prior to this appeal. "'Gimp boy, if indeed this is our boy, "'needs to see Lucy as a little girl, "'someone's daughter, someone's sister, "'someone worth keeping alive.' Bob screwed up his face. Fliss thought she saw signs that the seasoned detective was struggling. Having two girls of similar age to the victims the loss of Maureen and now the snatching of young Lucy. It all seemed to be taking its toll. 
Well, that's bloody obvious, isn't it? He snapped. To us, yes, placated Fliss. Stryker held up a hand. Listen up, he barked. The team did just that. Dozens of cameras flashed as DCS Errol Graham ran through the timeline of events. Lucy had been to see a friend who lived less than a mile from her home address. She'd begun her walk home just as dusk was falling. Two witnesses reported that a black van with gold lettering on the doors, possibly a Ford, had pulled alongside Lucy, and the driver had engaged her in conversation. One witness suggested that Lucy may have known him. Either way, both boys' attention was drawn back to events when they heard raised voices and saw Lucy being manhandled into the back of the van. Errol Graham described Lucy as a model student and much-loved daughter. A picture of the girl was posted full screen. "'Jesus, Mary and Joseph,' muttered Stryker. "'She's a Barney Wee thing.' It was Lucy's father, Brian, who had been given the job of speaking, not only about his daughter, but to address her captor directly. Fliss Abbott jotted some notes. She knew this script by heart, but even so... Every detail was important. In a shaky voice, Brian told the world what a wonderful girl he and Linda had, what a loving sister she was to little Sam, and how Lucy's grandparents doted on her. He then told her abductor that it wasn't too late to let his daughter go, to set her free unharmed. There was no suggestion of blame, no suggestion of mental illness, no suggestion that any harm may have come to Lucy. Not yet. Finally, DCS Graham described Lucy's abductor and a photo fit was plastered across the screen, together with the number to call that would set the three phones sitting in front of Stryker's team ringing. As the director cut back to the studio, Fliss sat back in her chair. Look, I'm not sure on this one. I mean, OK, the abductor fits the general description of our perp, but that's where it ends. If this is Gimp Maskboy at work here, then this abduction is totally wrong just doesn't fit with the pattern. We've been goaded by this pair. We've already been told how many victims there'll be. We even know when the next killing is planned for. Lucy Stevenson just doesn't fit the victim profile. Bob's face turned dark. And maybe all your degrees, all that university education, all your supposition, all your bright fucking ideas are wrong. Have you thought of that? Fliss stayed calm. Bob... The first two girls were not only prostitutes, but they had both been groomed and sold by the same guy in their past. For all we know, the next four girls have already been chosen, if not taken. Lucy is from a loving home. She goes to school. She's an ordinary kid. The only explanation for this is that our mystery filmmaker has lost control of his boy. I don't believe that Lucy is in his plan at all. I reckon Gimp Boy has gone rogue with this one, working alone, and Lucy is not on the list. Stryker checked his watch. I expected the phones to be ringing off the hook by now. All three detectives looked at the handsets in their respective desks. All three remained stubbornly silent. Edwina Charles scraped the last of her muesli from her bowl, stood stiffly and dropped the dish into the sink. She checked her watch. She had another five minutes before she had to leave for her job at the leisure centre. A TV played silently on the worktop. More bad news, she muttered to herself, reaching for the remote. She was about to hit the off button when the picture of Lucy Stevenson was flashed across the screen. Edwina turned up the volume and listened. The appeal had been first broadcast at seven o'clock, and this was the hourly rerun. She recognised Lucy at once. She was the girl Henry had been talking to outside her office a while back. She remembered how uncomfortable the conversation had made her feel. However, accusing a young man of abduction on the basis of one chat in a suspicious photograph was not Edwina's way. When the appeal for witnesses had ended, she switched off the set, grabbed her car keys and set off for work. The drive was less than ten minutes and it took her past Pitt's funeral home where she knew Henry worked. As Edwina drove by, she slowed and looked for the black van that was always parked outside. A black van with small gold lettering on the doors. The van was missing. 
That was quite enough circumstantial evidence for Edwina. She parked opposite Pitts and dialed the number she'd copied from the TV screen. D.C. Abbott took the call. It lasted less than two minutes. The moment Fliss gave the news, Bob Higgins grabbed two very harassed-looking uniforms from out in the corridor and sat them down to man the phone. Write everything down, he barked. If you think it's important, ring me on this number. All three detectives bundled themselves into Stryker's Aldi, and within moments they were mobile. The early rush-hour traffic slowed them, but just before nine o'clock they pulled up outside the funeral parlour. Standing outside was a frail-looking grey-haired man. He was staring at a very shiny black Ford Sierra Sapphire on his forecourt, scratching his head. Bingo, said Bob Higgins. That's good enough for me. Maybe, said Stryker cautiously. Parked opposite the parlour was a bright red Toyota Ego, with the team's star witness behind the wheel. Abbott skipped over to Edwina Charles's little car. She knelt at the open driver's door and scribbled furiously. Stryker and Bob Higgins sat in the front of the Audi, watching Fliss work. Moments later, she returned. I've arranged for our witness to be collected by uniform. They're en route now. She'll give a full written account to DCS Graham on arrival at the Nick. She's the receptionist at the pool our suspect uses twice a week. He's called Henry Stott. Apparently, he waited for Lucy outside the leisure centre the other day and gave her a tall tale about a modelling job in order to get her to divulge her home address. He also took her picture on his phone. She describes him as of muscular build and definitely on the spectrum at best. She turned and looked into Stryker's eyes. We need the circus here, boss. This is our guy. I'm positive. Stryker raised his brows and stepped from his Audi without comment. He walked over to the elderly man, still staring at the immaculate old Ford parked where his company vehicle should be. Morning, offered Stryker. The man looked up. "'surprised by the company. "'Oh, yes, um, good morning to you, sir. "'Can I help you?' "'Maybe I can help you,' offered Stryker, holding out his ID. "'Are you missing something?' "'The old man took a deep breath. "'No, I'm not so sure that I need the assistance of the police just yet, mister. "'Stryker, Detective Sergeant Stryker. Uh, "'Quite,' said Pitt nervously. "'Well, uh, what I mean is... Yes, our collection vehicle for transit is usually parked here, and this car, this lovely old sapphire, belongs to my assistant, Henry. Now, some evenings and most weekends, Henry uses our van as he takes care of all our out-of-hours business. But I've checked the log and the chillers, and we don't have any new arrivals. So I can't quite understand why... Stryker cut Pitt off. Henry? Henry Start? Um... Yes, that's his name. What's all this about? And Henry is how old? Thirty, I think. Stryker nodded. And have you called Henry to see where he is? Pitt nodded. Of course, but his phone is switched off, and so is his physician's. His doctor? Why would you call his doctor? Is he sick? Pitt clasped his hands together in front of him, as if delivering a short sermon. Stryker could see why he had been an undertaker all his life. We took Henry on as part of a social scheme, Sergeant. Both my wife and I have always been good Christians, you see. Henry has difficulties. He doesn't see the world as you and I. Most of the time he's fine, but on the odd occasion he... Stryker towered over Pitt. Look, sir, I'm sorry, but I haven't time for this. You aren't going to be able to do any business today. Do you understand that? You need to close your doors to the public right now. There'll be a team of forensic officers here shortly, and they will expect your full cooperation, as will I. Pitt was dumbfounded. Forensics? Why? Whatever has Henry done? Stryker ignored the question a second time. Does Henry have his own space here? A locker or such like? He has a locker, yes. He, he likes to swim, you see. He keeps his trunks in there, I think. Stryker nodded to Bob Higgins. This detective will go with you now, Mr. Pitt. Please show him Henry's locker and his personal file. Pitt hopped from foot to foot. Um, don't you chaps require a warrant for such things? Stryker glared at Pitt. 
the veins that ran up the sides of what could laughably be described as his neck bulging with anger. Not if I arrest you on suspicion of conspiracy, Mr. Pitt. On the other hand, you could just remember that Christian duty you are so fond of and help the police do theirs. Now show the detective what I asked. Bob pulled on a pair of latex gloves and walked inside the premises behind a very worried-looking pit. Stryker and Fliss Abbott stood examining the old Sierra Sapphire. Registered to one Arlene Pitt at an address on Linnet Street, just off St. George's Road on Deepdale, offered Fliss. Stryker shook his head scornfully. I'd seen it on our list, but discounted it as a priority, as it was registered to a woman. Fliss shrugged. I'd have done the same, boss. Stryker just grunted and turned on his heels towards the funeral parlour. He stepped into the garage where two immaculate hearses sat side by side and rooted about behind them. Moments later he returned to the car holding a length of blue parcel binding. Abbott eyed the item with suspicion. What's this? When I lived in Belfast, for the kids in our street stealing cars was a national pastime. Old Fords were a firm favourite, as the doors could be unlocked so easily. He took the tape and bent it double, then pushed the folded tip between the pillar and driver's door. Then, by manoeuvring the ends of the tape, he created a loop inside the car, which dropped easily over the button that would release the lock. In less than ten seconds, Stryker was sitting in the driver's seat. Impressive, said Fliss. Sign of a misspent youth. Stryker leaned over, popped open the boot and gave Fliss a look. Please find something interesting, he said. Anything to please, said Fliss, shaking her head and striding around to the rear of the car. She lifted the lid with gloved hands. Sitting in the centre of the perfectly vacuumed boot was a sports hold -all. She took a deep breath and unzipped it. Stryker, she shouted. It's him. It's him. It's Gimp, mask boy. Henry opened the stable doors to thuds and bangs. Girl Three and the Thai sisters were making a great deal of noise, kicking out at the walls and screaming through their gags. No one could hear, of course, but it still made Henry angry. He strode down the long corridor between the stables, slamming his fist into each door as he passed, screaming obscenities. This seemed to quieten the girls for a moment or two. In the temporary silence, Henry could think. He didn't want to keep Lucy in the stables, and he couldn't take her to the dungeon, not with the smell of blood and dead whores filling his nostrils. Lucy was his girlfriend now, and she would be his girlfriend for ever and ever. He wanted to take her into the main house, the part where the doctor sat, drinking the very best wines and spirits from around the world. He wanted to show her how good her life would be with him, rather than messing around with teenage boys. But he needed to prepare... Everything had to be perfect for their first time. Henry went to the cupboard where he kept the drugs the whores liked so much. He was sure if he gave Lucy just a small amount that she would relax and learn to enjoy his company. Henry selected a syringe and filled it from a vial. Not too much, Henry. He felt himself smile as he walked back to the van. As Henry opened the rear doors, Lucy leapt from the back, catching him off guard, knocking him off balance. She did her best to punch him, screaming in his face, Bastard! You bastard! Let me go! But Lucy was too slight to hurt him, and as she swung wildly, she stumbled. Henry spun around and grabbed her by the hair. She screamed at him again, called him bad names. Henry didn't mean to hit her quite so hard. Chapter 29 Stryker stood alongside Fliss Abbott, peering into the open boot of the sapphire. Bob Higgins had heard Fliss's excited cries and joined them. He handed Stryker a slip of paper. From Stott's personal file, boss. Home address, 11 Linnet Street, he said. Same as the car, offered Fliss. Bob was unable to take his eyes from the items on display. There, in the bag, was a rubber mask, fingerless weight-training gloves, an electronic earpiece, and a set of butcher's knives. "'Bag it all, Bob,' said Stryker, "'and get yourself to that address. Take some uniforms with you. 
If he's there, we don't want to lose him. And where are you going? asked Higgins. Somewhere else, said Stryker, walking to the driver's door. Stryker sat in Henry's driving seat, creaked his neck and closed his eyes for a moment before leaning over and popping the glove compartment. He lifted out a sat-nav and plugged it into the car's cigarette lighter. The device lit up and played a short drum pattern. He tapped at the screen. "'Checking out our boys' last destinations?' asked Fliss. "'We may be lucky, Abbott. Maybe somewhere we'll stand out.' Stryker hit the home button first. Although every impulse in his brain told him so, he needed to be certain that the device belonged to Henry Stott, and sure enough, the gadget confirmed just that. Home was indeed 11 Linnet Street. He pressed the screen again, opening a separate page. There were several saved targets. He ran his finger down the list and stopped at one named Farm. He turned the screen to Abbott. What do you think? More importantly, what do you feel? She said. Stryker's face turned dark. I feel we could already be too late, he said. Bob strode over. Uniform are on the way to collect me. Nothing much in his locker, just a sports bag with swimming gear in it and what looks like a spare set of house keys. Handy, said Stryker quietly, his mind elsewhere. Higgins turned down his mouth and snorted. Actually, I was looking forward to taking the fucker's door off its hinges. Bob sat alongside a uniformed sergeant in the front of a marked patrol car. Behind them was a personnel carrier containing six OSU guys, all dressed like Robocop. The operational support unit would make the entry to Henry's house, securing the building and anyone inside. Then Bob would complete a sweep for anything that would help in the search for Lucy Stevenson, before handing the house over to the forensics team currently searching Pitt's funeral parlour. There was little time, but to cock up a vital piece of evidence due to poor practice was not an option. The only thing worse than not finding Henry Stott in time would be watching him walk free from a court on a technicality. Your guys know not to move or touch anything, don't they? The sergeant turned his head slightly and gave Bob a withering look. Do you know how many serious cases my boys deal with every week, detective? Bob shrugged. Just asking. The small convoy pulled their vehicles up half on the pavement, some fifty metres down from the target premises. Deepdale Football Stadium dominated the view at the end of the street. The OSU guys debunked in almost total silence, three making their way around to the rear of the house. Higgins trod the narrow pavement to Henry's front door and checked the lock. It was a single Yale type which seemed to match what he'd found in the suspect's work locker. He waited until the OSU sergeant gave him the nod to say his men were all in position pushed the key into the lock and turned it. As the door swung open, the burly uniforms piled inside. One of the team ran straight to the back door and allowed his colleagues entry. Within ten seconds, the crew announced the main rooms clear of any suspects. Bob Higgins nodded to the OSU sergeant. Cheers for that. Give me five, will you, whilst I have a nosy? We should check the loft space before you start rooting about, really, Bob. Higgins gave the sergeant a dark look. He ain't here. I can feel it in me water. And I need to see if I can find out where he is before he rapes that kid. Or worse. So let's not fuck about, eh? The sergeant gave his men the order to return to their vehicle. I'll just be outside the front door, he offered. You know, just in case your water is a bit on the cloudy side. Higgins gave the man a weary nod. Cheers, he said, turning for the kitchen. But you may as well get off. I'll wait for the white suits to arrive. If you say so, detective, said the sergeant, and was gone. Fliss Abbott was so low down in her seat she could barely see out of the Audi screen. In some ways, she was grateful. Stryker drove like a man possessed. He'd called in the farm's location to division, but Beaconfeld Country Park, where the dwelling nestled, and just one local cop. And he was on leave. Somewhere behind the two detectives was uniformed backup, but two murders and an abduction in such a short time frame had taken its toll and decimated spare capacity. 
Stryker and Abbott were pretty much alone for now. The Audi's engine screamed as Stryker forced it to its limits along the country lanes that led to the farm. Any luck with that Vorder's register check, he shouted over the roar of the car. Fliss held her hand to her throat as the Audi slid sideways into a right-hander. Jesus, Stryker, you're going to kill us both before we get there at this rate. The car righted itself under the burly man's touch. So that's a no, then, is it so? He bawled. Fliss forced herself upward in her seat and scrolled her phone. According to the record, there hasn't been a registered voter in the dwelling for over five years, but the council tax bill is in the name of W.S. Garrett. And, said Stryker impatiently, and, said Fliss, her eyes flashing in his direction, nothing. Stryker shook his head. There'll be time for looking who that is once we find Lucy Stevenson. Bob Higgins walked slowly through Henry's house. It was well-ordered and tidy. The lounge had a comfy-looking sofa and a coffee table, but strangely no television or hi-fi. A pile of magazines was stacked neatly in one corner. Bob picked one up. They were muscle-building periodicals, and all appeared well-thumbed. He walked to the equally spotless kitchen, where, rather than a dining table, Stott had installed a crude gym. Two benches, free weights. Again, nothing out of place. The detective climbed the stairs, his knees complaining bitterly. Once there, he found a small, clean bathroom and two bedrooms. Bob stepped into the rear room first. It was like walking back in time. The bed was fully made, covered with a bedspread straight from the 1970s. He opened a dark wood wardrobe to find it full of women's clothes, the smell of mothballs taking him back to his own childhood when he'd stayed over at his grandmother's house. He picked up a small photograph that had pride of place on the bedside table. It depicted a couple in their twenties, maybe slightly older. Both wore the fashions of the day, both handsome, both smiling. He turned on his heels and walked to the front bedroom. The single bed placed under the window was the only solid item of furniture. A collapsible wardrobe held a few shirts, all on hangers, all buttoned to the collar. Four pairs of jeans and perhaps twice as many white T-shirts were folded neatly on the floor. A desktop computer and printer sat in one corner, and Bob considered the user would have to lie on the floor to use it. Leaning in the opposite corner was a full-length mirror, and as Bob walked closer, he could see that an A4-sized photograph had been placed on the floor at the base. He stood just feet from the mirror and looked down at the image. It was a picture of Lucy Stevenson in her school uniform. She was smiling into the camera, her blonde hair falling over one shoulder. The picture had been stained by something. It took him a moment to understand exactly what he was looking at. Jesus Christ! He spat, pulling his phone from his pocket. Fliss Abbott answered on the second ring. Bob could barely hear her over the engine noise. Well, Stott isn't at home, but you know what this sick fuck has been up to. Go on, shouted Abbott. Bob was almost too embarrassed to talk it through. He swallowed hard. He's blown up a picture of young Lucy and he's... Well, he's been tossing himself off over it. I mean, literally. Is there a mirror involved? asked Fliss. Yeah, full length. It's what is known as a come tribute. It's become popular on the internet, normally using pictures of celebrities, but more and more ordinary women are posting their pictures on site so that men can perform the act and repost the picture after the event, so to speak. Bob was enraged. She's a little fucking kid. She's just fourteen. I realise you're upset, Bob. Look, this is all part of the bigger picture of Henry Stott's offending profile, part of his wider portfolio of criminal behaviour. I don't give a flying fuck about his portfolio. I want the sick bastard in a cell. Bob, we're five minutes from the farm. If he's there, we'll catch him. At that, the signal broke off. Fliss looked at her handset. No bars. She turned to Stryker. We won't be shouting for help using our phones, that's for sure. I hope DCS Graham keeps his promise about backup. Bob looked at the screen of his handset and realised the signal had dropped out. His eyes were then drawn back to the image of Lucy, and he shook his head. 
Finally, he tore himself away from the shot and looked out of the window into the street. Standing across the road was a man taking a long look at Henry's house. He was tall, well over six feet. Or put him in his late forties, maybe early fifties. He was well dressed in a lightweight pale suit and open neck shirt, and he had a scar on his face. A scar that ran from his left eye, across his cheek, to his chin. Bob turned on his heels and started to run. "'Come on, Lucy,' said Henry quietly. "'I know you can hear me.' Except she couldn't, because Henry had punched her to the temple. Lucy was in a deep state of unconsciousness and lay on the gravel drive at the rear of the van, twitching occasionally, blood seeping from her left ear. Henry pulled her face, the face he always used to pull when he didn't get what he wanted, the one when his mother had told him he couldn't have something. He couldn't have sweets because he hadn't tied in his room. He couldn't have a pair of jeans like the other kids in school because they had no money. Henry had always wanted to say that they had no money because his mother had killed his father. But, of course, he didn't. His father had technically died of heart failure. The doctor had told him so in one of the many sessions. And what the doctor said was always true. In a way. Only in a way. Because Henry's mother had given his father that heart attack. Made him ill. She was the root cause. The way she talked to him, belittled him. The way she flaunted herself about the town at the weekend, whilst his father worked nights in the mill. Henry's mother was a whore. Not in the sense of taking money for her services. Just a whore. She would go out each night and return drunk. More often than not, she would bring men back to the house and fuck them in his father's bed. Of course, since Henry had thrown his mother down the stairs, snapping her neck like a twig, he'd got his own back on her. Oh, yes, he had. he kept her room exactly as she'd left it. Same bedding, same curtains. Nothing moved or altered. And each time he'd collected a street whore, he'd had them in that very bed and dressed them in his mother's clothes. Look at me now, mother. Henry knelt by Lucy's immobile body and forced himself to count. To count anything. To stop his temper from taking over. It always happened when he thought of his mother and he really didn't want to kill his new girlfriend before they'd even consummated their love. As the minutes passed, he felt his heart rate return to normal. Finally, he picked up Lucy's limp body and walked to the main house. He lay her on one of the large sofas in the lounge and looked at her. The cropped white top she was wearing had ridden up slightly, revealing the merest hint of lace. The tight pink mini did little to hide her modesty, and Henry was in no mood to pull it downward. Henry licked his lips. He sat beside Lucy and ran his hand along her bare thigh. He could feel the stirring in his jeans. "'Wake up, Lucy!' He said, Come on, we're going to have so much fun. So much fun. The entrance to the farm was a gated opening leading to a long driveway. Stryker expertly manoeuvred the car into the narrow space and hit the gas. Gates open, someone's home, he said. And don't worry about the phones, Abbott, we won't need backup. Fliss shot him another look. Stryker was a massively strong individual, and any man would have been a fool to take him on in a physical contest. A fool. Or mad. And Fliss Abbott knew all about mad. About insane. She also knew just how strong mental illness could make an individual. They accelerated along the drive, the fields either side empty of any livestock. Seconds later, outbuildings came into view. First a stable block, then a barn, and finally a large detached dwelling. Sitting on the drive was a black Ford Transit. Gold lettering on each door announced Pitt's funeral home. Fliss felt her stomach turn over. He's here, she said quietly. Stryker killed the engine and stepped out. The moment his feet touched the gravel drive, he heard the muffled cries from the stables. Come on, let's go, Abbott. 
he said, striding towards the door. As the pair stepped through the heavy wooden opening, they were hit by the stench of human feces. Fliss covered her nose and mouth with her hand. On the right-hand side of the stables were six stalls. Three doors were bolted closed from the outside. At the end of the corridor was a large metal cabinet. The door had been left open as if someone had recently visited the block and forgotten to close it. Stryker unbolted the first door. A girl of around seventeen was sitting naked in one corner. She was gagged and her wrists were shackled. The ancient-looking restraints were secured to a long metal bar embedded in the plaster above her head, allowing her to shuffle sideways to a metal pail that was her toilet. The bare concrete floor was stained with her urine and a recent period. She did her best to focus on Stryker, her body convulsing in a mixture of fear and distress. Fliss stepped from behind him into the stable and knelt beside the girl, who responded by tucking her knees to her chest, her eyes wild. Fliss gently removed her gag. "'My name is Felicity Abbott,' she said quietly. "'You're safe now. I'm a detective. We're here to rescue you. What's your name, honey?' The girl's mouth was dry, her tongue large in her mouth. Tina, she managed. Tina Simpson. Fliss checked the shackles. Tina looked up at them and then into Fliss's face. He has a key, she said. Henry, the guy who brought me here, he has a key. She gestured towards the door. It's out there somewhere. Bob took the stairs two at a time and tore open the front door. The man he'd seen standing up as it was still there, staring, head cocked to one side. The burly detective sprinted towards him. Stop right there, he bawled. Police officer! Will Garrett didn't need the introduction. He knew the second Higgins barreled out of Henry's front door who he was. He also saw he was a big fucker who would take some stopping. Garrett turned and began to run. He bolted down a narrow alley that led onto Falcon Street. From there he sprinted across a car park that served a large pharmacy and vaulted the fence on the opposite side. Bob was twenty paces behind and gaining. He too clambered the fence. As he dropped down to the ground he saw Garrett scrambling over rubble to exit onto Chatham Place. Bob was blowing hard and began to rue listening to his wife when she had persuaded him to forego rugby training. Garrett was widening the gap between them as he exited on the St. Stephen's Road, crossing into the football ground car park. By the time Bob negotiated the same route, Garrett had ducked down between the cars and was out of sight. Higgins stopped, scanned the car park and grabbed his phone. It took control room almost a full minute to answer. He barked at the operator. DC Bob Higgins, I'm in pursuit of a suspect who has gone to ground on Deepdale Football Club car park. I need support, a dog handler and the helicopter in the air ASAP. Stryker walked to the metal cabinet at the end of the corridor. On a hook screwed to the wall above it was a solitary key. He tossed it to Fliss and went about opening the next two stalls. Inside were two girls of Asian origin. Twins, young, fourteen, fifteen maybe. They too were shackled, naked and terrified. Stryker felt his guts churn in anger. Police, he said to each girl in turn. You'll be okay now. This is Detective Abbott. She will release you and take you to our car. Stryker strode forward, eyes flashing, muscles twitching. Where are you going? asked Fliss. The main house, he said. We've had Melissa and Megan. These three here make five girls. That means Lucy is number six, whether she fits your profile or not. Don't do anything crazy, Ewan, she said softly. Me, said Stryker, releasing the tension in his shoulders. I'm a pussycat. The doctor's phone flashed on the sideboard. Every time the miniature CCTV cameras dotted around the stables and main house were activated, it made the same noise and flashed away. Live stills were streamed to the device every few seconds. The doctor had seen Henry arrive with the girl. The wrong girl. The doctor had seen the news, too. All of it bad. Henry was out of control, no doubt, now that the cops had found the farm. It was only a matter of time before Henry was caught. Only a matter of time before they came for the doctor, too. 
Of course, Henry had been briefed for every eventuality. The doctor had spent many hours drilling him. But human nature would eventually take over, and he would talk. Not that they could use any of his testimony. He was, of course, totally insane. And by then, it wouldn't matter. Had all six girls been dealt with in the way the doctor had planned, that would have been perfect. Henry would have been buried next to them, and all that would have been left to do was ensure the living paid their price. But you couldn't have everything. Those that deserved the greatest punishment would still pay before this was all over. The meticulous planning, the hours of work, would all be worth it. The doctor strolled through the long, neat garden, looked up to the sun and pulled on a pair of surgical gloves. It was a good day, after all. Opening the shed that contained the mower and a plethora of other garden implements, the doctor found a small tin that had once contained biscuits. Once the lid was removed, the doctor then rummaged to the bottom of the various screws, nails and hooks, and gently placed Melissa Ward's silver jewellery inside. Megan's meagre collection also included her rotting thumb. The doctor used a separate tin for those. Once back inside the house, a quick search found the laptop that the doctor desired. Its owner had password-protected everything, of course, but was foolishly slack and far too confident simply to memorize random codes. Punching in Garrett 1960, W. Garrett 1960 high case, W. Garrett 1960 low case, ensured that on the third attempt, the screen flickered into life. The doctor then inserted a USB stick into a port and copied the two films depicting Melissa's and Megan's murders onto the machine's hard drive. Finally, the doctor smiled as an empty vial of vecuronium, the drug used to paralyse Miguel Jimenez before he was hung, was dropped into the laptop case. That will do nicely. Bob Higgins could hear the helicopter's rotors before the aircraft came into view. Some uniformed officers had already arrived and were guarding two of the exits from the huge car park. It was a scant presence, but it was all the division could muster. As the chopper hovered overhead, Bob was joined by PC John Mackham and Fritz, his German shepherd. The helicopter could see around the parked vehicles with its thermal imaging camera, even see changes in temperature in the nearby shrubs and bushes, but they couldn't see under the vehicles, which is where Fritz came in. He could smell a human being hiding under a car thirty yards away, maybe more with a fair wind. Bob acknowledged the dog handler with a nod. He smiled as he slipped Fritz's choke chain over his head. Not as quick as he used to be, eh, Bob? he teased. Bob wiped sweat from his brow. I've got two years to do, son. What about you? Twenty-two? The younger man shrugged. What's this bloke done anyway? He's a nonce, spat Bob, a fucking dirty paedophile. Fritz instantly picked up on Bob's aggressive tone and barked. John Mackham struck the dog's head and shushed him. Keep a lid on it, Bob, eh? Fritz gets upset when people shout. Tends to bite first and ask questions later. Bob looked down at the animal. That's just what I was hoping for. Stryker strode towards the main house. He felt as if his head may explode. His gift was working overtime and, rather than helping him, was clouding his senses and, with it, his judgment. That and his temper was up. He walked with his fists already clenched, the muscles in his massive forearms twitching as the adrenaline pumped around his body. As he approached the double front doors, he raised his right leg and slammed his foot into them. There was a tremendous cracking sound as the frame shattered under the huge impact. The left door itself swinging back with such force, it struck an unseen object behind, shattering glass or porcelain somewhere in the lobby. Stryker didn't pause. He simply strode down the hall, slamming feet and fists into each entrance, shattering more timber as he went. As he reached the doorway to the main lounge, he found them. Lucy Stevenson lay apparently unconscious on a large sofa. She was naked, her torn clothing scattered around the room. Henry Stott was on top of her. He was fumbling with the fly on his jeans and muttering to himself. How he had not heard Stryker's approach was mystifying, but Stryker didn't care about that. 
He strode forward, grabbed Henry by the hair, and swung an almighty punch to his face. Henry fell backwards and hit the floor hard, his nose pouring with blood. Strucker couldn't believe he didn't stay down. Instead, Henry rolled to his right and in one swift movement was back on his feet. His peculiar gait did little to slow him as he launched himself at Stryker, head down, screaming like a banshee. Henry's head drove into Stryker's solar plexus, knocking the wind from the big man. Stryker did his best to stay upright, grabbing his opponent's T-shirt, spinning him around, using his huge strength to hurl him across the room. Henry crashed into a formal table, sending plates and glasses smashing. Shards of crockery flew in all directions. Stryker was on him before he could stand. He drew back a massive fist and drove it into Henry's face a second time. Henry howled in pain, but he was still conscious and gripped Stryker's clothing with both hands. His eyes were wild, black as night, demonic. He twisted his body and neck, lifted his torso and sank his teeth into Stryker's arm, snarling like a rabid dog, tearing at the flesh. It was Stryker's turn to cry out. Instinctively, he drove his left knee into Henry's temple, forcing him off, but not before he had torn a mouthful of flesh from Stryker's forearm. The blood from Henry's nose now mixed with the blood that ran down his chin. Stryker's blood. Henry cackled like a witch around a cauldron. "'I'm going to tear you apart,' he said, spitting the last of Stryker's flesh from his mouth. Stryker was bleeding badly, but was far from beaten. He went for Henry again, this time throwing short, sharp, accurate, stinging punches to his head and body. Henry didn't feel a single blow. In fact, he was quite enjoying the whole scenario. He stepped away from Stryker, briefly out of reach. "'You spoiled my party,' he said, wide-eyed. "'She's my girlfriend, you know. Lucy, she wants me. Can't you tell?' "'It's over for you, Starter,' said Stryker, shuffling left, lining up his prey for a massive right cross. Henry saw what was coming. He stepped towards the open fireplace and reached for the poker. Feeling the weight of the tool in his hand, he launched himself forward, bringing down the length of solid steel with all his considerable might. Stryker stepped away, but the poker still caught his shoulder a glancing blow. All his nerve endings screamed at once as the pain flooded down his left arm, rendering it almost useless. Henry produced a manic smile, blood dripping from his teeth. He swung the poker again. This time it was a slashing horizontal sweep aimed at Stryker's chin. It missed, but as Stryker leaned backwards to avoid the blow, he lost his footing and staggered. Henry saw his chance, stepped in and brought down the poker again. It caught Stryker across his shoulder blades and he fell face down on the carpet, rivers of blood flowing through his upper body. Stryker hit the floor hard, fighting for breath. He'd just made it to his knees as Henry came again, swinging the polka wildly. His first sweep missed by inches, giving Stryker a split second to roll away from his foe and get back on his feet. He staggered, still fighting for breath, blood pouring down his right arm and dripping from his knuckles. He was beginning to get feeling back in his left, enough to grab a nearby stool and use it as a shield against Henry's poker. Stryker raised his right blood-soaked fist and held up the stool in his left. He bared his teeth. Come on, you fucker, and let's see what you've got. But Henry had other ideas. He bolted from the room, down the hallway, and ran into the sunshine where Fliss Abbott was putting the last of the three girls into the back of the Audi. She slammed the rear door just as Henry made the drive. Police! she shouted, holding up a hand. Stay right there, Mr. Stotts. You're under arrest. Flitz's head spun. If Henry was outside covered in blood, where was Stryker? She swallowed her fear and stepped forward. A question was answered in the next second. A striker came stumbling out into the open, looking wide eyed and bleeding from a very nasty looking wound to his arm. Get in the car! he bawled at Fliss. Lock the doors! Do it now! Abbott did as she was told. The three girls in the back seat huddled together and began screaming at the sight of Henry. Stott ignored them all and ran to the transit. Tearing at the driver's door, he leapt into the seat. Stryker was after him, locking eyes with the madman. He was just steps away from the van as Henry fired up the engine and slammed the transit into reverse. 
The van skewed backwards on the gravel, crashing into the Audi behind. Stryker leapt onto the front bumper of the van and grabbed at Henry through the open driver's window. Stott batted his hand away and found first gear. The transit lurched forward, causing Stryker to hang on for dear life. Henry turned the wheel hard left and swung the van around, lumbering over grass and smashing garden ornaments as he went. Within seconds, Henry was back on gravel and accelerating hard back towards the open gate. Stryker held firm and began to punch the windscreen with his injured right hand. Henry laughed. Realising the futility of his actions, Stryker reached upward, grabbed the drainage lip on the roof of the van with his right hand and swung his body towards the driver's door. The transit was almost at the gate, and Henry edged it as close to the offside as he dared, hoping to squash the big cop between the vehicle and the gatepost. But Stryker saw it coming and arched his body away from the danger. Henry exited onto the road, turned hard right and stamped on the accelerator. Stryker had to use all his strength to hang on, his feet slipping from the front bumper, his fingers screaming at him to let go. Henry drove like the lunatic he was, swerving from side to side. Stryker knew that if he fell, he would be run over in an instant. With a near Herculean effort, he pivoted his body again so he could reach into the driver's window. Henry fought him with every ounce he had, but Stryker would not give in. He scratched at Henry's face, grabbed at the wheel, the ignition keys, punched at his shoulder and cheek. It was an unrelenting assault. Henry didn't see the tractor. He had his foot to the floor and was far too busy fighting with the man who would not yield. The driver of the tractor had nowhere to go. He slammed on the brakes as the transit, complete with a man hanging onto the front, careered towards him. He hit the horn, prayed to his god, and leapt from his stationary cab. Stryker looked over his shoulder and threw himself left. The van ploughed head on into the farm vehicle. There was an almighty crash. Glass flew in all directions, metal torn from metal, skin torn from bone. Stryker lay on his back, dazed. He was in some bushes that ripped at his skin. He opened his eyes and tried to move. Despite the vicious thorns, he managed to roll to his right and sit up. The transit was embedded in the bucket attached to the front of the tractor. The farmer was peering into the cab of the van. Stryker gingerly pulled himself to his feet and shuffled over. Police! he shouted, reaching into his jeans for his warrant card. The farmer looked into the van again before turning to Stryker. Well, he won't be needing no ambulance, I'll tell you that, lad. Stryker cricked his neck to see inside the cab. Stott could have had ten airbags, and he'd still be in two pieces. He pulled his phone from his pocket and looked at the crack screen. Do you have a phone that works, sir? he asked the farmer. The farmer threw a thumb over his shoulder. Back of the house. The mobiles is no good up here, lad. Stryker was about to answer when he heard the first sirens in the distance. As it happens, I don't think that will be necessary, sir. The farmer looked in the direction of the noise. I hope they don't think that any of this was my fault, he said, a worried expression on his face. I think you just did the taxpayer a massive favor, sir. Just don't quote me there, so. The farmer risked another look at the devastated body of Henry Stott. Baden, then, was he? About as bad as they come. The farm was a hive of activity. Stryker watched as uniformed, plain clothes and forensic officers went about the business of securing the scene, and began the painstaking task of preserving and procuring anything of evidential value. He sat on the crumpled bonnet of his police Audi, whilst the paramedic worked on his arm and other minor cuts and bruises. "'You should come to casualty with this detective,' said the medic as she swabbed the bite. "'You'll need a tetanus jab and a few stitches at least.' "'I'll get there tonight, so,' he said. "'Dispatch me up as best you can there. "'Got a few things to attend to first. "'Fliss Abbott walked over. "'She looked pale, but relieved. "'Look sore,' she said. "'I'll live,' said Stryker, standing. "'How are the girls?' "'The twins are in the best physical condition. "'Terrified, as you might expect, but they seem okay. "'Tina Simpson is in poor shape.' 
She'll recover bodily, but mentally will be a different story. The medics are concerned about Lucy. She still hasn't regained consciousness, but it looks like you were in time to save her the horror of being raped by the bastard. Stryker seemed to mull on that snippet for a moment, then stepped forward. Okay, good. So, look lively there, Abbott. I want to look inside the house before forensics chuck us all out. The pair pulled on overshoes and latex gloves and walked into the hallway where Stryker had begun his trail of destruction. Smashed pottery and glass mixed with splintered wood on the carpet. I like what you did with the place, said Abbott. Busted is the new black, said Stryker, pushing the door open to the devastated lounge where he'd fought Henry. Well, you sure made a statement in here, smiled Fliss. She looked over her shoulder to make sure they were alone. Just a moment, she said, resting her small palm in the centre of Stryker's chest. Stryker looked down at her, his bright blue eyes inquisitive. Fliss reached up and kissed him tenderly. I'm glad you're in one piece, Sergeant. For the briefest moment, she thought she saw Stryker smile. But it was short-lived. Come on now, Abbott. There'll be time for all that when this is all finished there. Now... Where do you think the dungeon is? Fliss shook her head. You take a girl to the nicest places, she said, looking about her. Well, if this were the movies, I'd guess the basement. Sure enough, off to the kitchen, the detectives found an entrance that led down a narrow staircase. At the bottom were two substantial-looking locked doors. Fliss raised her eyebrows. No point stopping your remodelling job now, Stryker. He raised his foot and delivered a mighty blow to the door to his left. The frame splintered and the door swung open. Instantly, they were hit by a shocking stench. Fliss stretched and held her hand to her mouth. If you're going to puke there, Abbott, best you do it outside, said Stryker. The guys in white suits will have your guts if you muck up their scene. Fliss swallowed hard, doing her best to control her body. She shot Stryker a look. Thanks for the info, Sergeant. Nice to see your concern for my welfare. Stryker shrugged. I'm all heart. Abbott stepped inside the dungeon that she was all too familiar with after watching the two sordid films posted to the mothers of Melissa Ward and Megan Farrow. However, there was one section of the room that had always been out of shot. On the right-hand wall was a second door. Someone had left on bright fluorescent lights inside and they shone a narrow pattern on the dungeon floor from the gap beneath. She looked to Stryker. You think we have company? No, I just think Henry wasn't too concerned about the electricity bill. As the pair approached, the smell increased in density. It was overwhelming. Stryker reached forward and pulled on the door, revealing its shocking contents. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, he said. In the centre was a stainless steel pathologist's table. The drains either side, designed to take away blood and bodily fluids as the doctor cut into the cadaver, ran into a plastic tub which was over half full with dark red blood. Oh, my God! He cut them up, didn't he? said Fliss. Looks that way, offered Stryker, peering into the barrel. And the contents of this is all that is left of the poor souls. The pair retraced their steps and stood by the X-shaped table in the centre of the dungeon. Stryker pointed at the cameras fitted around the room. They look like standard security cameras, the sort you see in any supermarket. And I bet the control room is behind the other door at the bottom of the stairs, offered Fliss. But you won't be going in there now, will you? said a voice from behind them. Stryker turned to see a man dressed in a white suit, hands on hips and an angry expression on his face. We were... Stryker began. You were just leaving, Sergeant, said the man. This is our baby now. You can go and get your injuries looked at. You'll have our full findings, as and when. Fliss shrugged. Come on, he's right. Let's get you stitched up and jabbed before you develop something nasty. Bob Higgins had followed the sniffer dog around the huge car park for the best part of an hour. 
He was sweating, tired and frustrated. The helicopter had long since given up the search. What do you reckon, John? He asked the handler. PC Mackham sniffed and scratched his head. Fritz sat wagging his tail, waiting for his next command. I reckon he's gone, pal. Probably managed to get into his car unnoticed. Bob nodded and pulled his phone from his pocket. OK, John. Well, thanks anyway. Bob dialed Stryker and got an unavailable message. When he got the same for Fliss's mobile, he rang DCS Graham. He's being stitched up as we speak, Bob. A nasty bite to his arm and a few other cuts and bruises, but he'll live. Fliss's with three girls that were being held at the farm. They were going to be Stott's next victims. They're pretty shook up, but OK physically. Lucy Stevenson is in the Royal. She's unconscious and being assessed, but she's alive. And this Henry bloke? Henry Stott is dead. He drive head on into a tractor trying to escape. It's over, Bob. Well done. Bob shook his head. No, boss, it isn't over. I've seen Scarface today. He was scoping Henry's house. It's him, for certain. It's him, and he's connected to this, I'm certain. Graham was calm and collected. OK, Bob, but let's just see what we have so far, and we'll worry about your scarf-based man later, eh? But Bob wasn't happy. He knew the team were due to be disbanded. Now they had one of the main culprits in the morgue and the remaining girls in safe hands. What had been the root cause of all the horror... All the death, all the pain, couldn't be brushed under the carpet again. No, he'd seen Scarface and lost him. He'd slipped through the system before. He wasn't going to get away so easily. This wasn't over. Higgins walked to the main entrance of the football ground and spoke to the security guard on the gate. He showed his ID, turned and pointed to the huge lighting towers that lit the car park for evening games. These things have CCTV. The guard nodded. Sure, all of them. No car parks covered. We have ANPR too. Bob grabbed the young guard by the cheeks and gave him a playful shake. You are a fucking beauty, mate. A fucking beauty. The camera room was state of the art and the operator well trained. Bob watched as Scarface ran onto the park and dropped down between the rows of parked cars. The cameras lost him briefly as they automatically skipped between towers. But as Bob watched his own image jog into view, a second camera was focusing on Will Garrett slipping into a large black saloon. I need that registration plate, he said to the operator. The guy punched a few buttons and the plate came up full screen as the car exited the site. Your wish is my command, detective. Bob wrote down the number, thanked the guy and strode out of the room. Bob arrived back at the nick with a spring in his step. He punched the code into the door lock of the team's tiny office and stepped inside. He found Fliss Abbott typing ferociously into the home system. Stryker sat at his desk, looking pale, stroking a small tabby cat. Bob nodded towards his sergeant's bandaged arm. How are you, boss? Better than Henry Stott, said Stryker flatly, the cat purring under his touch. Really? Last I saw of him, he had half of Massey Ferguson stuck to his chest. What a shame. And the girl, Lucy? Fliss stopped typing and looked over her glasses. Awake, thank God. No sign of any sexual assault either. Tina Simpson is sedated and in shock. The Wong twins are with social services. Bob sat at his desk and watched Stryker pet the cat. Uh, where's the other one? Maureen had two, didn't she? He's in the box, said Stryker. Seems a bit reluctant to come out at the minute. Bob shrugged. Not surprising. You still calling out the RSPCA? Fliss smiled. I think the little one here has won the boss over. Bob nodded. Yeah, I can see. Anyway, how do you two feel about nicking Scarface? Stryker put the cat back with its sibling. Just because a guy turns up outside Henry Stott's house with a scar on his face and does a runner when he sees your ugly mug doesn't make him our suspect. He has to be, Bob growled. His house is in Longton, just 200 yards from the Golden Ball, the pub Ruby got picked up from. 
Stryker turned down the corners of his mouth and shrugged. And what would this guy be called then now? Garrett, said Bob. William Garrett. Fliss stopped typing. I know that name. She rummaged through the drawer of her desk and found her notebook. That's it? There, William Garrett's name is on the council tax bill for the farm. She typed his name into Google and began a search. He's a retired cop, served over on the file by the look of the press clippings. Fucking banterites, spat Bob. Chapter 30 Will Garrett pulled onto his drive. The radio had been full of the news. Henry Stott was dead, and four teenage girls had been rescued from captivity from a farmhouse on Beacon Fell. Other than Lucy Stevenson, they hadn't been identified. But he knew the other three would be his girls. The twins and Tina Simpson, another teenage whore from his dim and distant. They would probably be in some specialist care unit being molly-coddled by some goody-two-shoe social workers. And they would spill their guts. Them or their whore mothers. Between them, they would do for him and all the others. The lawyers, the magistrates, the judges. No one was safe now. And it wouldn't take them long to break Ruby Ward, either. Once she'd found out that Will's name was in the frame and her brief's father was under investigation, she'd crack and he'd be the prime suspect for murdering that fat bitch of a detective. He'd often considered that this day may come. He'd often considered what he may do when it did. One thing was for certain. Spending the rest of his days surrounded by other sex offenders in what Nick wasn't high on his list of priorities. But Will Garrett was always prepared. He strolled into his house and climbed the stairs two at a time. In the spare room, hidden under the floorboards, was a small safe. Will swiftly opened it using his combination and emptied the contents. He removed cash, two overseas bank books and two passports and relocked it. He stuffed the documents and cash into a small hold-all along with a few essentials and tripped back down the stairs. As he reached the hallway, the front door opened. It was his wife, Doreen. She looked tired and drawn. I thought you were still up north with your mother, he said. She looked him in the eye, then at the bag in his hand. Going somewhere? she asked. Will was sweating. The last thing he needed was Twenty questions from his useless bitch of a wife. He held out the bag. This, yeah, I'm going on a do with the lads from the rugby club. Staying over. You know what they're like. You can get a bit on the boozy side. Dory nodded resignedly. She was used to her husband doing as he pleased. Will dropped down the last two steps. Anyway, like I said, I wasn't expecting you back so soon. As your old mum picked up a bit then. Doreen cocked her head and looked into his face. In all their years of marriage, she had never cared for her. She had done her best, but it had never been enough. Mum died three days ago, Will. I left a message for you on your phone. Garrett had seen the missed call and the voicemail signal on his phone, but had ignored both. He really hadn't time for grieving relatives. Sorry, he lied. I must have missed it. Deleted it by accident. You know me and technology. Right, said Doreen, seeing straight through him. I'm only here to pick up some clothes. A dress for the funeral, you know. I don't suppose you'll come. Will blew out his cheeks. Oh, come on, Doreen. Your old man hates me. You know he does. It would only cause more upset. I'm best away from it all. Doreen nodded. I suppose you're right. You usually are. Will went to push past his wife, but unusually she stood firm. You seem a little upset, Will. Stressed out. He managed a thin smile. I'm fine, Dor, but I must be off. This time he did push her aside and open the door. Give me best of the family, he said and walked straight into the arms of Detective Sergeant Ewan Stryker.
Will considered struggling, but it would have been pointless. Bob Higgins snapped the cuffs over Garrett's wrists and took his bag. I'm arresting you on suspicion of conspiracy to murder. You were not obliged to say anything, but it may harm your defence. Will didn't hear the rest. He watched as his wife walked casually through the hall and into the lounge. She never even looked back. Bob sat Garrett in the back of a marked car and watched it pull away. He turned to Stryker. You think we can make it stick? he asked. Stryker shrugged. Bob was convinced that Garrett was their missing filmmaker. Stryker was not. However, he was certain that he had been providing underage girls to his paedophile friends, and that would carry a life sentence. And that would do. The girls from the farm are already talking to D.C. Abbott. There are teams en route to two addresses in Blackpool, where he's been whoring young girls out of. He's going nowhere. Bob nodded and pulled on a pair of gloves. Shall we? The front door was still ajar. Stryker pushed it open. Mrs. Garrett, he shouted. In here, came a thin reply. The voice came from the kitchen. Doreen Garrett carried a glass of wine and was sipping it. She seemed amazingly calm as she walked back into the lounge. Please, officer, she said. Please sit. You must think me a terrible host. Stryker perched himself on the edge of a chair and leaned forward. You do realise that your husband has just been arrested? Doreen nodded. She even managed a brief smile. Of course. You can't be married to a policeman for over twenty years and not understand that. Of course, offered Stryker, puzzled. You also realise that we have to search the house and question you also? Doreen leaned over and picked up a toy bear from a stool and almost childlike held it to her breast and stroked it. Ask away, she said. I won't lie for him. Stryker nodded to Bob to start a cursory search. Higgins left him to it and stepped through the kitchen out into the garden. You don't appear overly concerned that your husband has been arrested, Mrs. Garrett. She shook her head. Inspector. I'm not an inspector, ma'am. I'm a sergeant. A sergeant, then? No, I'm concerned, of course I am. But I'm not surprised. Not surprised at all. You were aware of his crimes? I was aware of his promiscuity, his addiction to sex, and his love of whores. I was well aware of those things, Sergeant. I simply thought... Yet you stood by him? We are a good Catholic family, Detective. We don't get divorced where I come from. I need to ask you some questions about your husband's whereabouts the last few days. Doreen shook her head. I'm sorry, officer. William has long since ceased telling me his whereabouts. And, as it happens, I've been in the northeast for over a week. My mother has been very poorly. Unfortunately, she passed. I'm so sorry to hear that. Doreen managed a smile and nodded. It fell from her face as if she had finally assessed her situation. So, why exactly has my husband been arrested, Sergeant? Stryker opened his mouth to speak when Bob Higgins barreled in holding an old biscuit tin. You won't believe this, boss, he said. Chapter 31 Harold Graham's office was cool, air-conditioned. Stryker sat in a swivel chair, usually reserved for civilian dignitaries. Well, said the DCS, pouring himself a large single malt, it looks like you have done exactly what you said you would. He raised his glass. Well done, Stryker. There'll be a promotion in this for you. Stryker guzzled at his bottle of Evian and checked his Amiga. I like being a sergeant, sir. Anyway, we still have our filmmaker to find. This isn't over. Graham snorted and licked his lips. You sure of that, you? I mean, the evidence is overwhelming. The jewellery, the films. I'm sure, said Stryker. 
But I do think Garrett knows our second killer in some way. Let's see what he has to say. The striker dropped his empty water bottle in the wastebasket. You know the search teams have found another body in the same brothel used by the Wong twins? A Syrian woman by the name of Latoya Aslam? Graham blew out his cheeks. Yeah, I heard. Stryker stood. Looks like another of Henry's victims. He shook his head. Makes you wonder how someone like him was ever allowed to be free, huh? Bob Higgins sat beside Stryker, pen in hand, a thick blank notepad under his fist. Garrett was joined by a very dour-looking brief, one Calvin Kershaw. The man came with a reputation for defending high-profile offenders, including serving and retired cops. Garrett himself looked calm and confident, a self-satisfied smirk flashing across his face as the preliminaries began. Once everyone was introduced for the benefit of the tape, Stryker started with the Blackpool brothel. Garrett shrugged. I've never visited that address in Blackpool myself. Well, not as far as I recall, unless it was in an official capacity when I was still serving. He found that smirk again. I used to spend quite some time around brothels in my line of work. Stryker's eyes flashed. So I believe, much to the distress of your lady wife. Strange you say that you've never been there, though. Stryker took a breath. So, by that, I'd understand the name Latoya Aslam doesn't mean anything to you either. You sure you didn't come across her in your dim and distant? Garrett turned down the corners of his mouth and shook his head. Sounds a foreign name to me. What was she? Asian? Arab? African? I was never really fond of niggers. Stryker leaned across the table, getting in Garrett's face. She was Arabic. We believe Syrian. We believe Henry Stott strangled her and abducted the Wong twins at the same time. Aslam's corpse has human skin under her nails. A simple DNA test will confirm our suspicions. Nice of you to preserve her body for us, though. No comment. This Henry, the one who strangled the toyer, is the same Henry Stott who murdered Melissa Ward and Megan Farrell. The same Henry Stott who abducted Tina Simpson. Henry was bad for your business, wasn't he? A real thorn in your side. No comment. Stryker was undeterred. Funny how Mrs. Wong tells us that Latoya worked as your madam and that she hid her body in the freezer on your say-so. Garrett blew a short breath down his nose. Wong? A chink? Oh, okay. How many more reliable witnesses have you got lined up? Maybe a couple of asylum seekers that aren't on the game. Mrs. Wong says that she'd returned from doing some outcalls when she discovered Aslam's body and her daughter's missing. Wong says that she called you first because you look after her and the twins, and that you also pay the rent on the house. What does she mean by look after, exactly? Calvin Kershaw leaned in Garrett's ear. Will nodded his acknowledgment and added, No comment. Bob Higgins lifted his head from his pad and glared menacingly. Stryker moved on. Tell me about Melissa Ward. Garrett looked like he'd tasted something bitter. As I recall, she's a whore. No, actually, she's a dead whore. You just told me. Stryker felt his hackles rise. Oh, you're all heart, Garrett. Was she another girl that you looked after? One of Miguel Jimenez's tarts, as I recall. We understand that you used to visit her and her mother on regular occasions. No comment. We believe that you had a long-term relationship with Ruby Ward and that you groomed her daughter Melissa for sex when she was just thirteen years old. No comment. Stryker remained calm. He'd expected just the responses he was getting. Okay, Garrett, let's talk about Henry Stott, our little film star. Let's talk about him. Garrett let his head fall back. He looked down his nose at Stryker. Never heard of him, and the only films I've ever made were taken on holiday. Bob Higgins stepped in. If you've never heard of him, 
How come you were scoping his house, and how come you ran off like a scolded cat when I came out to challenge you? Garrett assumed his smug persona. It comes to something when a law-abiding man of impeccable character can't go for a walk on a sunny day without a hairy-ass detective charging after him. He pointed at Higgins. With a face like that, anyone would have run away from you, pal. Stryker shook his head. Tell me about how the two snuff movies found their way onto your laptop. Garrett's smirk became a smile. Yeah, right. I read the disclosure file with Calvin here. That was a nice cosy coincidence, wasn't it, Stryker? Just like my name on the rental agreement for the farm. I think you're missing a suspect, don't you? Deep in his gut, Stryker knew Garrett was right on that point. But he curled his lip and pressed on. He had other scores to settle with the ex-cop. Well, go on then, Garrett. Tell me where I'm going wrong. Tell me how innocent you are. Because right now, the connections between you, Melissa Ward, Megan Farrell, Tina Simpson, and the Wong twins just won't go away. Garrett Gifford. Connections don't win trials, Stryker, and you know it. Someone is obviously trying to frame me. I selected those girls because of their relationship to me. He gestured towards Bob Higgins. And before you start scribbling down my confession, detective... That relationship was purely professional. Check my old files. Check my arrest records. You'll find Ruby Ward and Sonia Farrow in there more than once. And Simpson. All of them. They were whores, and it was part of my job to deal with them. I was a cop for over twenty years, Stryker. I worked vice, and you made enemies on vice, if you did your job right. But then again, you wouldn't know about that, would you? Someone has obviously rented that farm in my name and planted that evidence at my house. Come on, what kind of fucking detective are you? It's all too easy. I'm the kind of detective who gets results, Garrett. Well, you won't be adding me to your list. Do you really think I'm the type to leave a vial of poison in me case? Or maybe I like to keep dead horse jewellery and rotting thumbs in me shed? Garrett shook his head. None of this is worth shit, and you know it. Calvin Kershaw tapped the table with his gold Dunhill fountain pen and spoke for the first time. We will, of course, be requesting full disclosure of the forensic evidence linking my client to these items officers allegedly discovered at his home. Fingerprints, DNA, digital time stamps and the like. And I will state now, for the record, that Mr. Garrett strenuously denies any involvement in the making of these dreadful films, or the deaths of Melissa Ward, Megan Farrow, or Mr. Jimenez. Stryker snorted. Garrett snapped. Look, Stryker, it's fucking obvious I'm being set up. Whoever was controlling this Henry Stock guy was clever. Not just clever, but knowledgeable. He knew all about my past arrest record. He's in the swim. He knows the oldest profession in the world. He knows the dark web. Miguel Jimenez was a low-life pimp and dealer. I admit I had dealings with him in the past, and I admit I've visited him at his home on occasion. But injecting people with rare drugs is all a bit James Bond, isn't it? If I had such a big beef with the scumbag, I'd have snapped the fucker's neck and thrown him in the ribble. Anyway... I heard that he was found with a noose around his throat and his dick in his hand. Doesn't sound much like a murder to me. Stryker curled his lip and felt his fists clench. So, all this is a conspiracy against Will Garrett. Well, per you, let me cry in my soup. You're a fool, Stryker, hissed Garrett, just like the rest of the suits in this place. You believe what you want to believe. So let me put it simply so your thick Irish head can understand. If I was behind the camera taking those pictures, making those movies, I would have had to be up at that farm when the filming took place. Agreed? Stryker took a breath and did his best to stop himself from smashing Garrett in the mouth. So, smiled Garrett, check me whereabouts at those times. Wear out some of that shoe leather. Do some old-fashioned police work for a change, rather than using fucking Google and silly little girls that think they're FBI agents. 
Stryker felt the first sparks of cerebral activity clawing at his spinal cord. Only one person could have furnished Garrett with information about the team. I take it by that comment you are referring to our profiler, Detective Abbott. Garrett shrugged complacently. I'm not completely out of the game, Stryker. I hear things. DCI Blunt, a friend of yours, is he? asked Stryker. No comment. Is he the one that Melissa called the chief in her diaries? No comment. How old was Melissa when you first sold her to Alan Blunt? No comment. Kershaw coughed into his hand. I didn't see any evidence disclosed to warrant this line of questioning, detective. Stryker gave the brief a look that could kill it a thousand yards. But before he could berate Kershaw, there was a knock at the interview room door. A red-faced, uniformed constable popped his head inside. Sergeant Stryker, uh, DCS Graham asked me to come get you. The tape was paused, and Stryker stood. Garrett curled his lip. Please don't tell me the good cop is on his way now, Stryker. Not that old chestnut. Stryker didn't answer. He simply followed the constable from the room. Moments later, he was back. Once the legal introductions were completed, Stryker resumed his questioning. He lay his massive palms on the table and gave Calvin Kershaw a cheeky wink. You know what, gentlemen? The first rats have deserted the sinking ship. Ruby Ward's legal representative, Ms. Jennifer Widows, has gone walkabout, and her esteemed father, Archibald Widows, QC, has decided on a long holiday to places unknown. Stryker shot Garrett a look. Good customer was he, Will. Either way, our Ruby is changing her story. Garrett lost a little of his cockiness. The ramblings of a drug-addled alcoholic who... Oh, you think anything she gives you'll see the light of day? The CPS will run away from a testimony farther than the French in a trench. Kershaw didn't look too sure. Stryker was warming to his task. Okay, Garrett. Here's a bit of old-fashioned police work for you. Where were you Sunday evening when Detective Maureen Simons was stabbed to death? Kershaw leaned in again. He whispered in Garrett's ear. Garrett gave a concerned nod. No comment, said Garrett. Stryker pointed. Ruby Ward will testify that it was your idea to murder Maureen Simons. Your idea? Because our inquiry was getting too close to your group of disgusting pedophile friends. She will testify that you were with her in her flat at the time she stabbed D.C. Simons and that you held the detective at gunpoint as she did so. Bullshit. Stryker was struggling to contain himself, struggling to stop the images flooding into his brain. You held her there with your gun cocked, didn't you? Poor Maureen sitting on that flea-bitten sofa, terrified, unable to move. You held her at gunpoint and told Ruby to push the knife into her heart. Stryker was almost over the table. Didn't you, Garrett? No comment. Stryker sat back in his chair, breathing hard. He closed his eyes for a moment before, focusing on his charge. You held a silver revolver with a black grip. It was a very special gun, a Smith & Wesson 500, the most powerful handgun in the world, the kind of gun that a man like you would just have to own. Garrett looked concerned for the first time. "'You're dead in the water,' said Stryker, his voice little more than a whisper. He locked eyes with Garrett. "'We've just recovered a silver and black Smith & Wesson 500 from the glove box of your car, and I'll bet your prints and DNA are all over the weapon and the shells inside.' Stryker felt his nails digging into his palms as he spoke. "'Garrett!' You're a cop killer and a pedophile. You've used little girls for sex and sold their young bodies to the highest bidder. But those friends who paid so well won't help you now. They, just like the poor souls you've groomed, will turn against you. 
and over my dead fucking body will you walk out of this nick. You'll be going on remand. Stryker turned down his mouth. I don't need to tell you what that will be like, do I? A nonce ex-cop. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, you won't last ten minutes. Garrett looked to his brief, the first signs of real fear in his eyes. I can't go on remand, Kershaw. I need you to get me out of here. Today. Understand? The solicitor began to explain his client's position as best he could. Garrett began to break down. He was having none of it. Two burly uniforms piled into the interview room to drag him away from his brief. Garrett screamed all the way to his cell. See you in hell, said Stryker. Felix had eventually decided to join Tom on Stryker's knee. They both purred contentedly. Fliss Abbott sat watching proceedings. They let dogs and cats into hospitals now, you know. Really? Yes, petting animals is very soothing. It lowers stress levels. Mine still feels high. Fliss nodded. Mine too. Something is bothering me. Go on. A. A. Milne. The poem, six. Yes. I mean, it's worried me from the very beginning. Like I've said all along, serial killers don't tell you how many victims there will be. They don't stop. Unless they're caught or die. Yeah, I know. You told me. So, Henry, our serial killer, is dead, but our co-conspirator who doesn't fit the profile is still out there. Unless you believe that Garrett is our filmmaker. Stryker took a deep breath and shook his head. No. He teamed up with Ruby Ward to murder Maureen because we were getting too close to his empire and there is no doubt he has been grooming and selling underage girls for many years. But no, he's not our cameraman. Fliss held her head in her hands. So what kind of person could get into Henry Stott's head and cause him to behave so violently? I mean, he held down a job for over a year at Pitt's funeral home. They took him on as part of a community mental health scheme. He was functioning on some level. Whoever signed that one off needs retraining. Even doctors make mistakes, Stryker. He looked Fliss in the eye. And profilers. Maybe we just need to accept that our filmmaker doesn't fit any profile. Fliss grew ever more irritated. Oh, yes, of course. So we just look for a guy who likes to send children's poems to the cops as clues. A sociopath who just loves Winnie the Pooh. I can see him cuddling the toy bears right now. Stryker went pale. What's the matter? said Fliss. What did I say? Stryker gently lifted the two cats from his knee and placed them in their carrier. Doreen Garrett was holding a toy bear when I interviewed her. Check the voters' register for Garrett's house. Abbott typed away. Seconds later she scratched her head. William J. Garrett and Dr. Doreen Garrett. Doctor? Fliss rapidly typed some more. She scanned the text on the screen, reading aloud. Dr. Doreen Garrett is a fully qualified psychiatrist. She completed a five-year degree in medicine at Manchester, then a two-year foundation programme of general training at Blackburn General, before finishing a six-year specialist training programme in psychiatry at the Avondale Unit. Her specialisms are schizophrenia, depression, alcoholism or drug addiction, eating disorders, learning disabilities, phobias and post-traumatic stress disorder. Fliss was grabbing her bag and car keys as she spoke. She currently works for a charitable organisation who specialise in the placement of adults with mental illness back into the workplace. I'll make some calls on the way, said Stryker. The sun was warm on Doreen's back as she sat in the garden holding poo. She'd always loved the A.A. Milne stories. The simplicity. The naivety. She considered it strange that her husband and Henry coveted the same traits. They craved purity. Pedophiles always did. To try and explain away an adult's sexual lust towards a child had always been difficult for the psychiatric profession. 
The mere mention of paedophilia enrages the meekest souls. They could never understand what could attract a grown man or woman to a child in that way. Yet it existed, and would always be so. Even more baffling were the women that facilitated the crimes. The mothers, the sisters, the wives. Doreen had always known that her husband had been a sexual predator. She had known all about his love of whores. But what she had discovered in the last year was that he'd used those women to get to their children. And for that, he had to pay. They all had to pay. Doreen heard the knock at the door. She had, of course, been expecting it. Maybe not quite so soon, but it was always going to come once things turned out the way they had. She placed Pooh on the sofa, trod the hallway somewhat unsteadily, and opened the door. Sergeant Stryker, she said with a smile. Hello, Mrs. Garrett, or should I call you Dr. Garrett? offered Stryker. Doreen is fine. Stryker gestured to Fliss. This is D.C. Abbott. May we come in? Of course. Doreen opened the door and ushered the detectives inside. Can I get you anything? Tea? Coffee? Something stronger? I realize that you're on duty, but Will always said that detectives like to drink at any time of the day. Fliss looked into Doreen's face. She was a plain woman who didn't feel the need to add to her ordinariness in any way by applying makeup. Her hair was cut short around her ears and was greying at the temples. Yet it was the doctor's eyes that stood out to Fliss. They were pale, sharp, and demanding. They just didn't fit with the rest of the woman. You told Sergeant Stryker that you had been away visiting your sick mother the last couple of weeks, and that she'd passed, said Fliss. Yes, I've been to Tyneside on and off for the last month or so. Fliss nodded, walked into the lounge, and, noticing Pooh Bear, picked up the toy from the sofa. That must have been very difficult for you. Doreen's grey eyes flashed. The mousy, downtrodden housewife disappeared for an instant and a devilishly dark replacement stood in her place. She ignored Fliss's comment. Put him down. Oh, said Fliss, I'm sorry, does the toy have some sentimental value? Doreen snatched back the bear and sat somewhat heavily in her armchair, stroking Pooh lovingly. Pooh doesn't like strangers, she muttered. Fliss gave Stryker a look and then caught Doreen's gaze. Maybe I could... Have a look around the rest of the house. The doctor's eyes still bore all the signs of her anger. If you must. Stryker waited until Abbott had trod the stairs to the bedrooms before he spoke. We have officers en route to your parents' home, Dr. Garrett. They will, of course, confirm for certain, but our initial inquiries tell us that your mother died last year at this time. In fact, it was her year's anniversary this very week. Doreen didn't answer. She simply stroked Pooh, gazing straight ahead. Stryker changed tack. How would you describe your relationship with your husband, Doreen? The doctor snorted her derision. What relationship, Sergeant? We don't have one. I already told you about the whores, didn't I? Stryker nodded. Yeah, you did, but you also told me how you could never divorce him. Doreen looked up from the bear, her eyes glass-like, foreboding. Well, I won't need to now, will I? He'll be in jail. Mm, that's probably true, yeah. Doreen raised her brows. Probably. You mean there is a chance he will be released? His friends in high places pulling the strings, are they? He was investigated last year, but it came to nothing. Too many of his kind in the ranks, you see. I know them all, you know. Their names and what they've done. Stryker moved his questioning again. I believe you work for a company that places people with mental health issues back into the community. Find them jobs, houses, that kind of thing. Doreen was stone-faced. 
It's a charitable organisation, yes. We do great things for people with mental health problems. People like Henry Start. Doreen remained tight-lipped. Come on, Doctor, you must remember Henry. You took a personal interest in him. In fact, Mr. Pitt at the funeral parlor tells me that you insisted that he ring you personally. Should he ever have an issue with Henry? Isn't that so? Doreen gripped Pooh even tighter. I might remember him now? Yes. What were Henry's issues, Doctor? What mental health problems did he suffer from? Doreen sneered. You know I can't divulge that kind of information, detective, patient confidentiality and all that. Stryker nodded. But you would have been aware that Henry had been committed to a secure unit on several occasions before you eventually found him his job? As I said, yes, as you said, patient confidentiality. But we understand that Henry was sectioned, not once, but several times due to his violent behavior and sexual advances towards young girls. Yet you sanctioned his release and placed him back in the community. Everyone deserves a second chance, Sergeant. It was Stryker's turn to allow his anger to rise to the surface. He raped, murdered, and mutilated two teenage girls, Dr. Garrett. But you already know that, don't you? I watch the news, Detective. I'm sure you do, Doreen. Two young lives snuffed out. Tortured, horribly killed. A whole disgusting scenario filmed and sent to their mothers. Come on, Doctor, you're a psychiatrist. Why would someone do such a thing? Why would someone want to hurt a child and her mother so much? The doctor curled her lip. Child? They weren't children. They were whores. They sold their bodies on the street. And for what? Drugs? Booze? They would do anything for money and their whore mothers were no better. They were nothing but diseased scum. Stryker took a beat. He examined the woman opposite him. He allowed the electrical impulses in his head to work their way into his conscious. What was she telling him? You don't have children, do you, Doreen? God deemed not to bless me with children. Was there a problem there, a medical issue, maybe? Doreen stayed quiet. I notice you didn't say we don't have children. Does Will have kids of his own? Doreen waved a dismissive hand. Bah, who knows? He could have an army of them for all I know. Stryker sat back in his chair. So, you do have a medical problem? Those eyes flashed again. There was far more to Doreen Garrett than the downtrodden wife. I didn't have until I married William. Meaning? Doreen almost spat her words. Meaning, he made sure I could never have a child detective. He gave me a disease, you see. A venereal disease. Not one cider. I lost damn count how many. But amongst all the strains, he gave me syphilis twice. And the second bout ensured I could never procreate. I was forced to have a hysterectomy. Doreen cuddled Pooh. It was for my own good. It would save me, they said. She eyed Stryker, her eyes full of hatred. Bah! Save me from what? From more disease, from more humiliation at the clinic. Each time he came home demanding his conjugal rights, I would lay there thinking, What this time? What would it be in the sexually transmitted disease lottery? Herpes? AIDS? I mean, who, who ever heard of a man using a whore in this day and age without protection? Condoms? Oh, no, the great William Garrett. He's a bareback rider. Doreen went quiet. She disappeared somewhere inside her own head. Stryker sat and watched her. He knew he didn't need to ask any more questions. The answers would come. All he had to do was sit and wait. You are right, said Doreen moments later. I lied. My mother died this time last year. And you know what? Will didn't even know. He hardly knew I'd been away. 
I was up and down the motorway for months. My dad was beside himself struggling to care for her. Dementia is a horrible way to go, Sergeant. I stayed for a full week after the funeral. Doreen stared into space. I think that was it. The catalyst. I mean, he'd never hidden his love of the common prostitute. She snorted. Jesus, he was obsessed. But despite everything, I somehow managed to ignore his disgusting behavior. I managed my life without a husband. Without children. Then, after the funeral, I arrived home late one Friday night. I still have no idea why, but as I drove towards the house and saw the bedroom lights blazing, I parked a little further down the lane. A fleeting, wry smile washed over Doreen's face. I climbed the stairs so quietly. I needn't have bothered. The noise coming from our bedroom was so loud that a herd of elephants could have been running up to the landing. She looked Stryker in the eye. He was fucking a child, detective. And that child, as you called her, was Melissa Ward. She was maybe thirteen or so. She sat astride him on our bed, riding him like a donkey on Blackpool Beach. I stood there for over ten minutes watching them, and you know what? Once he'd spent himself, he kissed her and told her that he loved her. He loved her. And then she kissed him back and said the same. I love you, Will, she said. How fucked up is that? Doreen reached for her glass of wine and found it empty. She waved it at Stryker. You think I might have another? After what I have to tell you, I don't think I'll be having any more for a while. Chapter 32 Stryker sat across from DCS Graham. They were both dressed in dark suits, white shirts, black ties. Maureen Simons was to be buried that afternoon. Funny, isn't it, Stryker? We spend the best part of a week digging up those two poor girls. Now here we are about to put one of our own in the ground. Stryker wasn't sure which event was more disturbing. It's a sad day for the force, sir, was all he could think to say. And you'll finish up the interviews with Doreen Garrett tomorrow. That's the plan. I still can't believe that she managed to keep her husband under surveillance for that length of time without him noticing. She's a very astute woman. Totally barking, but shrewd, perceptive, judicious. You put a name to it. I think the strangest part is how controlling she could be to all but her own husband. She tolerated his shocking behavior for all those years and was treated like a doormat. Yet she had a tremendous hold on her patients. She lost control of Henry Stott. Stryker nodded. If she hadn't, I think we may have been looking at all six victims rather than just the two. Her planning and cunning would have made our job almost impossible. She'd calculated everything down to the last detail. After the six were dead, Henry would have been poisoned and Garrett would have been dropped in the frame as the filmmaker. But why did she kill Miguel Jimenez? because she couldn't risk him dropping Garrett in the frame as Melissa's pimp before her plan was completed. Graham shook his head ruefully. What do you think drove a middle-class successful psychiatrist to conceive such a shocking plan? You're probably better asking D.C. Abbott that question, boss. All I can say is, after she witnessed her husband having sex with Melissa Ward, she began to look at his life in microscopic detail. She discovered how he groomed the kids through their mothers and, after taking his own pleasure from the youngsters, sold them on to his friends. She already had a deep-seated hatred of Ruby and the other adult prostitutes. She blamed them for infecting her with syphilis, leading to her being childless. But it was when she witnessed Will having sex with Melissa that caused her to begin what she calls her crusade. 
Her aim was to take her revenge on everyone and everything she blamed for her dismal existence. Her husband, the mothers, their children, and, of course, us, the police, who she considered to be, at best, toothless, hence the taunting poem. And how many men is she identified from malicious diaries now? Eleven. Graham rubbed the top of his head. My God, Ewan, I can't believe that Alan Blunt was part of all this. I mean, I've known him for years, and his poor wife. There are some big hitters on that list, that's for sure. I believe Blunt has offered to name more of the group, too. I suppose he's looking for a deal. Graham rested his hands across his substantial belly. He and Garrett both strike her, but neither will get any leniency. They'll never see the outside of a prison in our lifetimes. The reception area of the Nick was always busy during the morning. A striker stepped past the queue, bound for the exit and the church service. He heard a quiet voice call his name. He turned to see Lucy Stevenson sitting between her parents, Brian and Linda. Hello, Lucy, he said. How are you? Brian nodded to his daughter. Go on then, Lucy. The officer won't bite. The girl stood, stepped over to Stryker and held out her hand. He took it in his massive palm and they shook. I, I came to say thank you, she said. I was just doing my job, Lucy, said Stryker. Lucy shook her head. You saved my life. That man, well, he would have killed me. Stryker didn't know what to say. He did his best to smile. Well, you're all safe now. How's your arm? asked Lucy. Oh, all good. I'm a quick healer, so, said Stryker, feeling ever so slightly embarrassed. Brian Stevenson stood and joined his daughter. We can't thank you enough, sir, he said. I'm not a sir, I'm a sergeant, said Stryker. Well, whatever you are, you deserve a promotion in my book. You brought our daughter back to us, and she's a fine girl, so, said Stryker. Brian noticed Stryker's black tie. You'll wear to the funeral, then. Stryker nodded. Aye. Shocking business you're in. Stryker turned. You are right there, sir. Shocking indeed. Fliss Abbott draped her arm around Stryker's shoulders and rested her head against him. They sat on a metal bench looking out to sea. It's beautiful here, she said. It is. I can't believe the week is almost over. Back to the grind then, so. It's good that Graham is keeping our little team together, though, don't you think? I do. And you don't think that us being, well, being together like this will be a problem? Stryker turned his head and stroked Fliss's cheek with the back of his hand, his eyes wide. I'm easy to work with there, Abbott. I'm a real pussycat. End You've been listening to Six by Robert White. 
narrated by Nicholas Cam. Published by Whole Story Quest Audiobooks, an imprint of W.F. Howes Limited. This work is copyrighted 2017, Robert White. This recording is copyrighted 2018, W.F. Howes Limited. <laughs>